All right. Uh, let's see. Yeah. I see us. I see us. So, hello, hello world. We can get started. So, very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are joining us from. Welcome to Code It Life. If you are new to the channel, um, huge welcome and huge hugs. Um, if you have been with us before, as you know, we do a bunch of things on this channel throughout the week, but uh, today is a very special day because today is our quarantined coding day, which means you're going to see us coding pretty much all day. So every like three to four weeks, we tend to um, forget how much work this is and we're like, yeah, sign us up. <laughs> <laughs> and so here we are. But today's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we have some amazing guests and uh, a fun topic to dive into. So uh, looking forward to all of that. And uh, let's start with a round of introductions. And Alyssa, why don't you go first? Yeah, Zenonis, uh, I'm not echoing because I am on a mic on my own, and uh, yes, we're good. Sorry about that, chat room. Sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, so all four of us are on this screen today together because of the amazing tech that we have, but sometimes the tech falls flat on its face. No, it's, it's funny. So I'm in Pennsylvania. Uh, Alyssa is in uh, Missouri. Uh, John is in California and Laurent is in um, Switzerland. So four completely different time zones and this is fun. Um, so uh, hopefully the internet does not drop packets or does not echo our voices anymore. Um, but otherwise we should be good to go back. So did we have echoes for all of the intros? Let me see. Uh, we did, yeah. We actually need to redo them. Oh, no. Okay. Well, you could <laughs> not have enough of us, of course. So, <laughs> Alyssa, you go again, please. Sorry about Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm so sorry about the echo. I'm glad we got it fixed. Um, as we were saying before, we went into the fifth dimension. My name is Alyssa Nichol, and I am the Angular Developer Advocate for Kendo UI. And I'm super pumped to talk about um, what you can do with your Silverlight apps as its end of life approaches. So. All right, and John, one more time, please. Uh oh, muted. John, you're muted. Sorry, we have some dog stuff going on in the house, so <laughs> I wanted to keep that quiet. Uh, John Brown here from uh, Mobilize.net, where I'm the technical product manager, or one of them. And uh, I'll be showing some ideas about using automation to move Silverlight to Angular and HTML. So I, we think that's a cool way to go. Awesome. And Laurent, please, one more time. All right. So hello, everyone. My name is Laurent Bunion, based in Switzerland, like uh, Sam was saying. And uh, even though I work for Microsoft now, and actually in the back end, I did most of my career working with client-side development. And a big part of that was with Silverlight. So actually, the reason why I'm on this uh, stream, if I understand, is that I'm old and I remember the days. That's kind of why you invited me, right? <laughs> you know, I was going to say, like, the people that you see on the stream, with the exception of Alyssa, like, the three of us, like, we have clearly lived through our best days years back, and we Don't refuse we refuse to learn anything new. So we're going to spend the all day today how to, uh, like, write the best possible Silverlight app. <laughs> No, we're kidding. We're talking about migration. So uh, let's uh, let's kind of dive in why we are doing this. Uh, so Microsoft announced, well, Silverlight um, has been like kind of maybe slowly ending uh, its life for the last like five to six years. And Microsoft announced that October 12th, 2021 is when support officially ends, right? So that gives us a deadline, a very specific deadline to shoot for. So we have maybe 13 months to go from now on. And um, oh, by the way, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Sam Basu. I'm a dev advocate. I work with Alyssa. Uh, so this, by the way, folks, this uh, stream, um, you'll see me and Alyssa throughout uh, the day. And we work for our progress. We make Telerik and Kendra and all the fun stuff. And John is from Mobilize. And if you talk about upgrading your applications for like code unquote, whatever legacy applications you have, uh, these folks know it best. Uh, Mobilize knows it best. So um, glad to have all of you. Um, so Silverlight 
we had some fun days, but uh, it's end of support next October 2021. And I do want to clarify, like, just because support is ending does not mean things are ending, right? I mean, look at like Windows 7, like how many enterprises run Windows 7 to this day and will continue doing so. So nothing's going to like your Silverlight apps are not going to go up in flames come next October, but you really should start uh, thinking about. Uh, wait, wait, wait. If there's no flames. <laughs> Well, that's the point. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> We're only going to run on one browser version, so that gets pretty narrow right there, right? Yeah. Well, well yeah. Silverlight, like, official, like, so none of the uh, Greenfield browsers, like, the evergreen browsers, like Chrome, Firefox, like, they have stopped supporting it. You can still run it on IE 10 and IE 11. And uh, Alyssa and I will show you, like, there's a hack in which you can run it in Chrome. Uh, it's pretty sweet. But, yes, uh, if you have web-based Silverlight apps, those are getting more limited uh, as to where you can run. So here's the plan for, uh, for the day, folks. Um, you're going to see me and Alyssa and John code pretty much all through the day until you're bored of us. So we uh, have Laurent for just half an hour in the morning. It's actually like 5 p.m. ish, right, for you, uh, Laurent, evening Correct. time. So uh, why don't we start like the first half an hour with uh, you uh, mostly telling us stories about like when did you first get, get introduced to Silverlight? Uh, tell us some stories. How did you start? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. This is um, those are really fun days to remember. And um, so Silverlight was developed as a um, as a, almost a lightweight version, I would say, of WPF. So really, it all starts with WPF in 2006 uh, when it was released. And so WPF is a technology Windows presentation foundation, right? Used to build desktop applications. But and WPF realized... is still fine, and everyone uses yeah, it today. You know, Absolutely. So WPF is still uh, a good technology to build desktop applications. There is another tech to build tech desktop applications called UWP, Universal Windows Platform. Um, and you can choose either one, really. Uh, WPF is a little bit older. Uh, it has, it, it's way bigger. It's also way more powerful, depending what you want to do. Um, but for certain uh, choices, it, it can be a good choice, totally. So it's still supported. Uh, in fact, they are actively supporting it. They are putting it on the .NET Core, which uh, means that the backend at least can run on multiple platforms, Linux, etc. cetera. Um, the the front-end, no, because UI is, is tricky to, to get on multiple platforms. Um, and, and this actually brings us to Silverlight, which uh, one of the big appeals of Silverlight was that it was able to run on multiple platforms uh, because it was hosted on a browser. And uh, that, of course, allowed it to, to, to run via a plugin system, which was a big part of the problem with Silverlight, the plugin system in um, on multiple, uh, multiple um, uh, operating systems. So Windows and Mac OS were supported by uh, Microsoft. And Linux was supported by another uh, open source uh, project called Moonlight. Um, and Did the so, plugin so system just make it too heavy? And you think that was well? Plugins were downfall? back then. Back then were um, something which was pretty standard. But at some point, they kind of fell into um, people stopped really liking them. Um, mostly because it, it was proprietary. So it's something you need to install something proprietary into your browser and, uh, and and really people didn't like that so much anymore and uh, a big part of what happened to flash is actually what happened to silverlight as well flash kind of disappeared these days right you don't see any flash anymore uh, it's a little bit the same movement if you want and so uh, yeah so silverlight was uh, presented to the public if i remember properly in 2007 um, and it was uh, presented as like a lightweight version of wpf able to run everywhere um, and so we started doing uh, quite a lot of work with Silverlight. Uh, the very, very first version of Silverlight, Silverlight 1.0, was running only JavaScript backend. So it was really essentially a gl glorified video player, you could say, because video was always very important with Silverlight. But with Silverlight 2.0, then uh, there was really a uh, like a miniature version of uh, of the CLR, of the .NET runtime. And, uh, and then it was really interesting because you could program very powerful uh, applications running in a web browser, but you could also run them what we called out of the browser. So out of the browser. So uh, basically as a, as a standalone window, if you want to build like uh, like uh, mini Windows applications or mini desktop applications, I should say. 
And uh, yeah, so those were uh, interesting, uh, interesting ideas. And of course, all the uh, or, or most of the of the interesting ideas of WPF, which was the separation of the UI and the backend. Think about uh, you know CSS versus JavaScript versus HTML, for example. Those were all principles that were present in uh, Silverlight, still present in WPF, and that made for a very powerful platform for uh, developers, but also for designers. So there was this whole interaction, developer uh, designer interaction, which was going on. Uh, Silverlight is also probably, well, I don't want to say that, let's say one of the only uh, Microsoft products which has a really cool name, right? So we were talking about that before with John and saying that the um, the name came kind of uh, a pun on Flash because a Flash is a silver light, right? So there was this idea of, uh, of uh, Silverlight being positioned as a competitor to Flash initially. Um, and uh, of course, you could do some really cool things. Like, for example, I mentioned video player um, in Silverlight. Actually, the best video players were built in Silverlight, which explains why Netflix was still built in Silverlight for a, for a very, very long time. For example, they had adaptive streaming, which meant that if your, um, if your desktop, if your network connection was going down for a bit, um, down in the sense that it, were, it was less powerful, less fast for a bit, then they would adapt uh, the image quality dynamically and then go back to the full image when the network connection was restored. So that was pretty cool. And uh, I would say for me, um, my, uh, my, tr my trip in Silverlight started uh, probably around that time. And I was very, uh, very blessed that uh, Sam's uh, asked me to write a book. So that's my <laughs> book. I still have it. It's a big oh, book. Oh, <laughs> shut the front door. That's I awesome. I know, right? And, uh, <laughs> and then after that, because I like pain, apparently, so I wrote one and then I wrote the other one. I wrote the sequel also, which is even bigger. Um, and, and then and then I said, I won't ever write a book anymore ever again. Um, not because Sam's was not good with me. They were absolutely awesome. But because writing a book is a, you know, work of, you know, love and pain, especially pain. So it's uh, it's really a very... Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Tight. You wrote two books. Okay, so yeah. I, I have some stories here just to kind of tie into what Laura sure. is saying. So, uh, Alyssa, you may not know some of the history here that some of us old folks know. So, uh, when uh, Microsoft first released um, WPF, which was the first time we saw like XAML and, and C Sharp, it was all very Windows based. And so, Silverlight was an attempt to take it outside of just Windows make it work everywhere. In fact, uh, fun fact, uh, now that we talk about .NET, modern .NET, it's all open source, it works everywhere, but Silverlight was the first time where .NET code worked outside of Windows. So in fact, when uh, .NET Core 1, uh, or like the first iterations of it came out, it actually borrowed some code from Silverlight code bases. So it yeah. was a fun time. Uh, the dev experience was uh, fantastic for those of us who were into it. Uh, not as much as Laurent who wrote two books on it. Uh, yeah, speaking of like uh, technologies that have kind of left us, uh, I was having a conversation like we have written like books on Windows 8, uh, others have written like lots of books and like uh, we have, I mean, if you have been in this industry long enough, you have seen things sunset, uh, it's just mm. a natural part of it. So in, yeah, 2000, so true, yeah. in 2007, so I want to highlight, um, and start highlighting messages here if I can. So uh, our good friend Didi is on the call, obviously, and uh, she's thanking Apple for a good reason. So in 2007, we were just all happily chugging along and then something fun happened and that's Apple releasing the iPhone. And then yep. the world kind of started changing and we have iPads and everything, we wanted things on the iPad. So mm -hmm. in 2011, I think, uh, Steve Jobs wrote a scathing letter uh let me try to show um another what uh, yeah yeah this was an open letter and this was flash this was aimed at flash because uh people wanted flash applications to run on ipads and flash had some serious yeah. vulnerabilities like security problems so wait are you saying yeah. apple is the sole downfall for this for the plugins model yes the vulnerability so thing was uh, was the excuse right the, the real reason <laughs> why jobs didn't want you know, applications written in Flash or by extension in Silverlight. I, I'm not even sure he knew Silverlight existed, right? But, you know, Flash was the main uh, victim here. But really the real reason is that they couldn't monetize that because those applications were running in the web browser. Yep. And so when he says, um, you know, security issues, that's all, <laughs> you know, wrong, right? That's not the reason. The reason is that they wanted their 30% on every application running. 
uh, it goes even further than that because initially uh, Jobs actually didn't even want applications on the web browser, on the iPhone, right? Initially, the, the plan was to have only uh, some kind of web browser type thing with some kind of applications. Then they say, oh, no, we need an app store. We need native apps. He was not very happy with that, but he said, OK, let's take 30 percent of the of the benefits. And then came Flash and also Silverlight, right, <laughs> by extension, I would say. Uh, which was saying, oh, we can run rich, uh, rich applications in a web browser, and uh, there is no way basically to bypass that. Except that, of course, you know, Apple could say, well, no, we won't allow the um, the plugin to run. Uh, I think the iPhone was one thing. The iPad was definitely a, a, another critical thing because uh, you know, iPads being having a, a big screen and everything, that was really a good platform to run these kind of applications. And so that was a big no-no, um, mostly for financial reason, I, I, I oh. suppose, and I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Whether it was for financial reasons, security reasons, whatever mm. it was, do we all agree, as the comment says from at Larry, that it, we are better off yeah. Yeah. because yeah. of it today, for sure. with where HTML5 um, is and, and yeah, where the I, web I, is? What I would say is if we uh, consider where we are now, like, uh, you know, 13 years after CLI came out, we are probably better. But we also need to consider that back then, the web browsers were absolutely unable to do what Silverlight or Flash were doing, right? So when those issues came up, um, it was a hard time for everybody because there was really literally no way to replace you know, the things like the adaptive, uh, uh, the adaptive video streaming that I was mentioning before, um, there was no solution for that in HTML until long, long, long after, right? Yeah. So, which is again why uh, Netflix, even after Silverlight was uh, not really supported anymore, Netflix continued to use it for their web client because it was just the only way that they could do it. Um, I would say that, okay, in retrospect, I would say that um the the plugin thing yes we are better without them most probably the tech um, well the tech anyway you know flew into um into um you know um, .NET core etc uh, and now we are kind of going back to this idea of of having a rich uh, application engine into the web browser with WebAssembly anyway right so yeah. so there is kind of this circle going on except that of course WebAssembly is not plugin is not proprietary um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, we learn in time, we, we learn as we go. I would say 13 years later, yeah, probably we are better off without plugins. But 13 years ago, it was kind of the only way to solve yeah. this, right? Very true. So, I mean, there are multiple aspects of this. There is performance, which uh, uh, Physiophile is saying. I mean, the iPads just got too warm to run these plugins, essentially. So, mm -hmm. yeah, Steve Jobs wrote that scathing letter, and I don't think he even knew that he was killing off plugins model, but that's the way the web went. And mm -hmm. to Laurent's point, I think, like, we, we were just missing things that we just did not have. Uh, mm -hmm. But now the web has uh, matured enough uh, as a monetization platform, as a platform where we can run those um, mm -hmm. rich client-side applications and things are coming along. Yeah. Uh, no, that's true. And uh, so I see somebody in the chat saying that uh, from a dev skills perspective, Silverlight was a great trend yeah, exactly. from desktop to web. And this is so <laughs> true, right? Like a lot of people were finally able to do web apps. But for me, really, the real strength of Silverlight was not so much into the web apps in the traditional sense, but in the those lightweight applications running outside of the browser. And so we called them SLUB, right? Silverlight, S-L-O-O-B, <laughs> out of the browser. <laughs> Uh, which is a horrible name, um, but uh, those were really cool because they were uh, very easy to update. All right, you didn't need to send an update like a setup or whatever. You just basically restarted the application and then it was updated already. Uh, they were lightweight. They were also cross-platform. Mm -hmm. Even the UI was cross-platform, so that was really cool. I, I, I know we are already running out of time for my segment, but I want to call out the community because this was... Um, I would say starting with Silverlight, but especially uh, starting with WPF and, and Windows um, desktop development, but especially with Silverlight, uh, that's where I made, uh, I would say, the big majority of the friends that I still have today. And uh, that also led me to, uh, you know, years and years later, I accept a position at Microsoft, ironically, in Azure and not in the client development. So I'm, I'm really full into the back end now. But the community around Silverlight was absolutely amazing. And I know, Sam, you, you, you remember that as well, right? So there was a whole yes. um, 
Uh, first of all, the MVPs, right, the most valuable professional at Microsoft. So we had the Silverlight MVP group, which was really very close from the from the developers, and we could really like give our feedback and everything. But even outside of that, the, the people developing Silverlight were really like a, like a small family, and uh, I, I did enjoy so much of that. So I, I went into pictures and I, I dug out some old pictures when we were starting to talk about that. And I see so many faces that, um, you know, people who, uh, who years later, I still count as my friends. So, um, yeah, this is really a good, um, a, a good energy, like Sarah is saying in the chat. Um, the energy around the Civilite community was absolutely amazing. So this is a, a good example of, of when technology can bring people together. I, I really wanted to call that out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, those of us who have kind of seen the whole journey with Silverlight, it, it has been great. I mean, again, technologies come and go. It's the people, it's the communities that stay with you. Um, so uh, now one thing I do want to call out, like Laurent is actually the author uh, of MVVM Lite, a framework that a lot of us have used all throughout our careers uh, that helps us build nicely structured enterprise applications. And uh, so Laurent, thank you for bringing MVVM Lite and bringing all of your experience and knowledge to Silverlight devs. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the call out. Uh, for those of you wondering about MVVM Lite, uh, it's, uh, it's slightly going to sunset as well. But yesterday, in fact, there was a uh, the, the first conference talking about the, uh, the next days. And uh, the cool thing is that there is a Windows toolkit, um, which is uh, full stock with tools and utilities. And this is a project, an open source project which is led by Microsoft, but which is uh, really led by the community before all. So there is a project manager, a Microsoft person, but this is a total open source uh, project and MVVM Lite is flowing into that and is uh, going essentially to uh, to become, uh, I would say the, the Windows Toolkit is becoming kind of the next generation of uh, MVVM Lite. So it's cool to see that there is still interest about, around that and there are some people who are uh, willing to take it and to maintain it, which, which makes me really happy. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you, you have folks in the chat room, Laurent, who are appreciating you for MVVM Lite. For many of us, like that was kind of your first framework you picked up when you started doing professional MVVM style, like design pattern uh, development. So thank you for that. And I see uh, lots of stuff about Blazor and all of the tech. We will talk about all of that stuff. So mm -hmm. we're just setting up the stage here. Uh, so uh, before we let you go, Laurent, I know it's late evening for you. Um, what was your like fondest memory of Silverlight? Something like that was super fun in the community, or something you did by yourself? Well, I mean, the, I mean, obviously the books were a uh, you know a pretty amazing moment, right? Uh, especially the, this moment where you where you get the book in your own hands, and uh, it's funny because I was actually uh, not home when I received the books. Uh, but my daughters got them and they were Aww. really happy. So that was like oh, a couple of years ago, oh. right? Oh. And, uh, uh, apparently, that's uh, cuteness overload. And in, uh, in each of my books, I actually managed to place a picture of both of my daughters. So I was kind of using their picture for uh, some demos. So that was uh, that's always a fun thing to do, especially the first time we went to a bookstore and I showed them, hey, look, you're inside the books that is inside the store, you know, an actual store. Nice. Because back then we were still buying, you know, books in stores, right? <laughs> <laughs> that was long ago, like I said. So so that's uh, definitely one thing which was magical. But um, for me, really, it's uh, again, I go back to the community, right? I mean, I was able for the first time in my life. I'm, I'm, I live in Switzerland. The community here is great, but it's small. And uh, I was able to go in literally any city of the world, like in the U.S., landing in Chicago at noon, sending a message on Twitter and saying, hey, does somebody want to have dinner with me? And I ended up having 10 people coming for dinner with me. Right. And uh, it was absolutely amazing to go everywhere and to be able to talk to people about that and, and to make new friends and all that. And, and some that, you know, you and me, that's how we met as well. Right. So this is really uh, those friendships are uh, long lasting Sarah as well, who who was mentioning it on the chat. So for me, that's really the, that's really that I would say it's uh, this feeling. Uh, the tech was amazing. I think it was really um, in advance for its time. Uh, it has kind of run its course, I would say. So it's good to see that we have some uh, solutions to, to move over. But uh, yeah, it was uh, it was really a, a very fun time to be a developer. Absolutely. 
All right, Laurent, so I know uh, it's late evening for you, so we appreciate you just hopping on and starting off our day with uh, so much of the expertise and so much of what you have seen with Silverlight. And yeah, let's uh, keep this going, Laurent. Thank you for what you do again. Uh, we're going to let you go and kind of dive into some migration strategies. Okay, so thank Absolutely. you once again, Laurent. All right. No, thank you so much for having me. It was my pleasure. All right, so Lisa and John, stay on here, and I'm going to switch to a mode where we can see each other and a visual and let me make sure there are no echoes one more second here uh yeah i think i have everything turned off um could you either of you say something please hello 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 yeah testing testing chat room let me know if there are echoes uh should not anymore i don't hear any echo okay perfect perfect okay let's talk about what are your options right so there, there is a um, there's and a do lot. Do you think though, Sam, that you're hitting your peak on your you're hitting the red? Oh, whatever that's whatever that's called in a mic. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We move it away a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> Let's talk about options because there is a lot of options uh, on the table. So first thing is uh, for me, if you look at what Silverlight apps were built in. Uh, primarily C Sharp and XAML. There were plugins that kind of um, uh, hosted the app inside of a, a web shell in a browser or maybe even uh, outside the browser. But come October of next year, if you are telling us that all of your app assets uh, and your business logic is all tied together in your Silverlight app, you are not going to find a lot of sympathy because this is the time for us to get things going, get it nicely structured. So um, your business logic, like what your app does and um, whatever services that you have in the background, validations, whatever it is that your app is doing, this is the time to have that separation of concern. Uh, get it out of your app, put it in a separate library or whatever you want to do to structure it so that Come time where you absolutely have to jump off Silverlight, you're just dealing with um, the UI part and, and nothing else. Am I right uh, in saying that, John? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, you see a, a graphic here. Essentially, what I'm trying to say is you have a lot of options, but the first thing you should do is get your business logic out of your Silverlight app. Um, yeah, Laurent, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, we are really glad to have you. I will see if my highlighting is working there you go um, so let's talk about uh, some options because there are a lot of options on the table each come with a little bit of pros and cons so what I'm highlighting here is uh, your way forward right so um, the yellow stuff that you see on top um, oh, thank you for the follows by the way um, the yellow uh, boxes here uh, the Xamarin forms and Uno platform those are primarily uh, mobile facing uh, or desktop facing platforms and then I have WPF and UWP Win UI which are fundamentally desktop ish tech and then we have all the web stuff which is in green so you need to choose where you want your applications to run first up and I mean uh, there's a lot of flexibility a lot of these platforms run on multiple um, uh, frameworks multiple uh, operating systems so you need to decide where you want to run and what code you want to write. What do you want to maintain? Now, keep in mind, like Silverlight is fundamentally C Sharp and, and XAML, right? So if you have to reuse most of that UI, then you're looking at XAML type technologies. But if you're open to just a little bit of change, then the web is going to open up uh, to you. I, I saw lots of questions about Blazor. I uh, we will look, jump into Angular. So all of that opens up if you are willing to write a little bit of modern web code, right? And if that's not what you want to do, that's totally fine. Uh, because uh, even if you just want to write XAML and C Sharp, you can go to iOS, Android, uh, web, desktop, uh, different types of Windows devices. So you can go to a lot of different places, but if you're open to writing web stuff, then things open up for you a little bit more. So, Alyssa, John, what are your thoughts? Let me unmute. My wife's making coffee next door. Uh, so <laughs> it's early morning for you, and without coffee, nothing flies. So I, I hope you had your <laughs> cup of coffee. I got my coffee. So. There you go. The um, you know, I think you're absolutely right. It kind of depends on how you want to position the application. So as, as Laura was saying, 
you know, slubs were really a desktop only kind of environment. And I remember my first exposure to a Silverlight application was a slub. And I remember how impressive it was that this thing could just magically install itself on Windows and just run and it had this beautiful, rich user interface, you know, uh, and uh, I thought that was really cool. So those things probably you want to move to um, WPF or, or UWP, depending on, you know, what you want to target. The, the customers that talk to us, typically they use Silverlight to build rich browser-based applications, okay, um, for all the advantages that an application running in a browser can have. And, you know, they wanted to be able, if you think about before HTML5 and some of the, the uh, rich video and visual capabilities that that brought, uh, they wanted to be able to bring that together. So we saw an app from a customer that was way cool. It was a factory floor automation management app. And basically they built visual representations of the whole factory. So I remember it had a brick wall, it had windows, and you could see out the window to the outside and it had all the little valves and the switches and the little um, flow meters on the wall and you could go over and click on them and adjust them. And it was just, you know, it was just super cool. It was very intuitive. And if you think about bringing technology into the real world to people that are not technology focused to have an actual model of the real world that's interactive, it's just a very interesting paradigm, I think, for user experience, right? Uh, but when you try to make that not run on Silverlight, it's like, Okay, that's difficult. So um, what we're seeing a lot of is the desire to move these things to a framework like Angular or something that can run cleanly uh, as a web browser and can actually recreate some of the same technology. So that's some of the things that uh, that we're working on in our company anyways, is making that possible. Absolutely. So uh, I want to get to the web stuff because I know Alyssa is our resident web expert and uh, we'll, we'll take you down that, that path. But I, I do want to maybe um, talk a little bit more about mobile and, and desktop because you can write really um, rich and interactive apps uh, with with desktop technologies. So let's kind of go down um, uh, this path a little bit. Uh, if you do Xamarin Forms, which to me, like Xamarin is a, is a shim, right? So you get to write C Sharp and XAML, so which is pretty much what we don't in Silverlight, uh, maybe a little bit of F Sharp, and then um, you write heads for different platforms. You compile your C Sharp down into your business logic layer uh, that runs on Mono, which is a port of .NET. Uh, that was again, Mono is about 17 years old, as old as .NET Framework itself, um, and that's going to compile, and you're going to run truly native cross-platform apps that run on iOS, Android, uh, Tizen devices, your fridge, your your smartwatches. It runs everywhere. Um, and it also runs on desktop stuff. So um, like WPF, of course, and, and Mac and GDK Linux, it runs everywhere. It does have the potential of running on the web as well. So some of the blue uh, circles that you see, those are newer tech uh, that you see uh, on the horizon. Um, Uno platform is also another good option because Uno actually had their conference just yesterday and they announced uh, support for Ubuntu Linux. So um, with uh, these XAML and C-sharp tech, you can, reuse most of your Silverlight um, XAML. And I say that with caution. You can see me do that with Alyssa and you can all laugh at me. But you can lift and shift uh, most of it uh, if you are careful about namespaces. And then... I love that. Instead of migrating, <laughs> it's a lift and shift. Yeah, yeah just to fancy your <laughs> way of saying it. Uh, but yes, you should not have to throw away all of your UI. Now, keep in mind, I mean, this is different platforms you're targeting. So the namespaces, the way you reach the APIs, it's different, but you can still reuse. You can uh, start moving some of it. I mean, copy out your code and see what breaks, and then we start. Um, so with Uno, you can again run on most desktops, uh, Windows and Mac, uh, and, and Ubuntu now. Um, uh, when it comes to WebAssembly, that's uh, a low level, not quite assembly, but you're talking about something that your modern browsers can execute at runtime natively. So just like JavaScript, so there are no performance uh, hits and you run higher level languages like Rust and C Sharp uh, and C++ compiled down into WebAssembly and running natively on the browser. So that's the promise of WebAssembly and that's pretty exciting. I think Uno does a very good job right now of running uh, C Sharp and XAML, which is what Silverlight was, on uh, on the browser through WebAssembly. 
So that's exciting. And then obviously we have uh, the mobile form factors. If you just know, here's a question, like maybe John, you can chime in. Um, a lot of enterprises that built Silverlight apps, I mean, those are a line of business applications, right? And, and they are probably okay if it's just a rich desktop client, right? John, I don't know if you're mute, uh, but I mean, wh what I was trying to get uh, get to is like WPF and your Windows stack, like Universal Windows uh, platform, which is something that's been around since like Windows 8. It's really Universal runs on every Windows device, like HoloLens and, and Surface Hub, and then we see WinUI, which is again a flavor of XAML that is lifted from the Windows stack, so they can push out updates without having to wait for Windows uh, updates. And that runs on every Windows device that's modern. So these are, uh, this is not like gray uh, battleship uh, Windows desktop applications. These can be very well be modern desktop applications that work with touch. So you're good to go uh, on like uh, kiosks. Um, and what I'm trying to say is like desktop is cool. Desktop is fine because you, you can run your applications in lots of places. Your, um, your deployment stories are better now, so, um, yeah, I think uh, desktop is fine. So, John, what are your thoughts? Well, if you have a um, if you have a Silverlight desktop application that has a rich user interface, and it's not an excessively large application, you know, like two million lines of code, um, then yeah, be converting it to w, WPF or UWP is probably a, a reasonable thing to do. Okay. Uh, what what uh, I think Federico just pointed out that if you have a really large application, this may be an unworkable kind of a migration project. Okay, just because of the scope of it and the amount of time it takes. Uh, I think that's where not to plug our company, but you know that's what they pay me to do. Um, that's where <laughs> automation tools really kind of pay off. And I mean, uh, if you don't want to do it, John, like I, I will give you a plug. When it comes to automated <laughs> migration, you do it best. Yeah. So I mean, but, so how does that work? Is is it actually fully automated, or is there still pieces that's whether it's on your team, John, or on their team that have to step in? Like, are, what's the process like? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. That. So the um, you know, so we've been making automated code migration tools for almost 20 years now, and um, you know, the idea is always to get to a very high level of automation. Uh, but you're never going to get to 100% full automation because code is code. And, you know, it's fascinating because we see all this real world code. We don't, we don't necessarily see the code that professors write on the blackboard or that you see in textbooks about how to write code. You see what real developers do in the real world year after year working on the same application. And frankly, it's not pretty. And so you really never know what you're going to get as an input to an automated tool. Um, you know, what we do is we do a lot of static analysis and we build ASTs and then we try to run pattern analysis on it, stuff like this. But you're always going to wind up with some stuff. It's just like either there's no corollary in the target platform you're trying to get to for the object that was in or the, the method or whatever that was in the source code. Like you think about library matching for a runtime. Um, you know, a good example of that, not to use Silverlight, but use like VB6. There were things that VB6 allowed that .NET just got, you know, we're never going to do that, right? So then, yeah, you do have to rewrite that. So you start probably with a goal of in the 80% automation level, and then you try to get up into the mid-90s. Um, you know, you can potentially get 100%, but that's not going to happen on a large application, okay? So with these rich UI applications like Silverlight, you may have... Um, uh, control that's written in Silverlight that just has no native version in any library, like whether it's uh, the stuff that Progress has or it's anybody else's library. And so now you have to sit down and figure out like, okay, we're going to write, rewrite this either for UWP, right, using some native drawing primitives, or we're going to use something like Canvas or something in HTML to try and rebuild that, or we're just going to rethink how that UX looks, right? Yeah, um, I do want to point out one thing though. If uh, folks are new to this channel, um, we are uh, we are into chickens on this channel, 
uh, we have uh, lots of chicken sounds and we have uh, chicken emojis flying around. So if you're new, like, don't get upset. That's what we are about. I don't know how this started, uh, but we are about chickens and, and donuts, apparently. So, it's the code at live chicken. Come on. Yes, yes, yes. And I mean, we have uh, our friends Didi and Sarah, and I think that's where we started with chickens and stuff like that. So it's Plus, I think the chicken is one of the most noble animals. So... <laughs> <laughs> all right all right i won't uh, debate that um <laughs> yeah so I, I talked a little bit about um desktop and mobile and you're going to actually see us going to go through this list uh i'm going to uh, start off first yeah and uh, folks have um figured out how to have chickens flying around this uh, screen so thank you for that um <laughs> if, if you do uh, too many emotes then we, you're going to fill up our screen with chickens which is not fine now but uh, probably you're going to be a little awkward when we go into code oh uh, i think it's fine i think yeah, it enhances it's... anything really it elevates <laughs> <laughs> Um, so you're going to see us go through this list. I'm going to start off doing some .NET and XAML, kind of trying to do that lift and shift thing uh, for uh, from Silverlight over to like XAML forms and Uno and and UWP and WPF and making it run. But let's talk about the web stack. Because ideally, if you have a Silverlight app today, and if you are set on having a Silverlight based like or a web based app tomorrow, then you are looking at web stuff. So let's talk about uh, Blazor and some of the other like web frameworks. So let me um, have you go, Alyssa, here first. So Alyssa is our Angular expert. Um, do you find like Angular being prescriptive? And I mean, having, uh, I mean, you come into an ecosystem that has guidance for enterprises on how to do stuff. I, I feel like it's the, it's the JavaScript framework for you if you are a backend developer, a .NET developer, someone who is used to structure and more guidance because um, just compared to something like React, which is closer to a library than a framework, um, Angular has a lot of uh, this is the way you do this and very, very guided documentation and uh, it's kind of a, a safer, stricter mode. So. Um, I, I'm looking at this chart, Sam, and in my mind, I'm like, well, why wouldn't, like, as a front-end web dev, I'm like, well, why wouldn't you do it in Angular? Um, I look at each each one of these, and there's a ton of options that offer mobile, desktop, web, like all three of them. So I'm wondering, is there, I don't know, like a, a magic formula, like, for your team, like, to decide which one of these to do if, in fact, there are many branches that provide the same thing in the end? Other than, I guess, what your developers prefer, maybe? Is that is that really what it comes down to? Are you asking me or John? Uh, either one. I'm just curious, like, what what's the, de the defining formula here? How do you decide? That's a really good question, right? Because there's so many options. I don't know. Sam, why don't you take a shot at it? OK, so you're asking, like, why, why Angular over other things when you can go to mobile and desktop with web stuff, right? Yeah, just how do you decide? It seems like, especially like just looking down your chart, there's only a couple of options that don't provide for every platform. Yeah. So yeah. what do you do? Which, which is good. Team? Like as as like as developers, <laughs> we like to have choice until we have too much choice, and then we are crippled because we don't know what to do. So to me, I think like it's it comes down to what does your team and what does your developers have expertise in, and like. It's JavaScript, uh, like ang be it Angular, be it React. Like you learn one, you can switch to another one if, if need be. So I think it comes down to what do you want to write and what do you want to maintain going forward, right? Uh, and each of them will give you about the same benefits. Uh, maybe the code sharing story is a little better. Uh, like if you do Angular and if you wanted to do uh, mobile, then I mean, native script or other things will help you share code. If you did React and then React Native, your your code sharing story is better. So I think the web, uh, as long as you're happy writing JavaScript, just pick anything, pick anything that works for you. Uh, these are all mature frameworks, you, you're gonna be fine. Yeah, and uh, in the chat room, we have Ed Sharpener, who is our resident expert for all things Blazor. So let's talk about Blazor for a second, and, and Ed's here with his dad jokes, obviously. Uh, well, but, well, let, me, let me jump yes. in on that yeah, well, question real quick before you go to Blazor. It's interesting that you would approach it from the sort of the, the developer side, because I would approach it from the user side and say, like, why did you get into Silverlight in the first place? Which of these platforms are more important to you? 
to your users, right? So for example, if you needed an IoT, then that dramatically limits what your options are here. If you only need it to run in a browser on a desktop, for example, and never on a mobile device, that you know tells you, you know, maybe you're gonna wanna go with Angular and JavaScript. So I would look at that way because that's the way our customers drive. It's like, this is what our, our customers go to us, and this is what our users need, right? Yeah, yeah. So basically, John's saying even though they are all on, well, most of them are all on every platform, they're not all equal for the customer. Yeah, yeah. Our customers rarely want something on a, on a mobile device because they have a 1920 screen that's completely covered with controls and it's just <laughs> never going to work as a, a responsive uh, application very well. I can totally yeah. picturize these like 1990s uh, apps that are like so busy. They have like hundred buttons in in them. It's just like an interface that you need to learn for like a few months before you can use it. Those busy applications, yeah, they're not going to make it uh, to mobile. Or if they do, right. you have to kind of completely rethink the UX. Uh, I was going to say my my whole gut instinct is let's rewrite this whole application. Like, but <laughs> yeah, but it's I guess expensive. That's just too... That's just too much. Yeah, yeah. So a like, lot of cases. Yeah, for lots of managers, like uh, I mean, teams that you have that are shipping products. I mean, you have to show ROI, um, and this is where like pain-driven development comes in. So you you don't want to have releases where it's just just paying back uh, technical debt. You you have to show value to your customers, right? So maybe you do this in chunks. Maybe you pick parts of your app and you start migrating over. And uh, yeah, I saw some comments like on, on platform choice. It, it really comes down to what you want to do and, and how you want to code share. Um, I did want to talk about Blazor a little bit because uh, Microsoft, if you go to Microsoft's official guidance on what to do at the end of Silverlight's uh, end of support, they do talk about Blazor. And it's exciting. Blazor is very, very exciting for all the things it can do. It's modern web. It's C Sharp front and back uh, in your browser. And it's exciting. It's exciting uh, the possibilities that it brings because a lot of .NET enterprises, .NET shops uh, in the past, I mean, they, we have had to choose a JavaScript SPA framework uh, because we want to have .NET in the, in the back end as an API. But then the front end, we want it to be really fast and we need JavaScript uh, speed. And that's why you see .NET shops doing Angular and React and, and Vue and other things. But now they have a choice. If they don't want to write JavaScript, then you can do C Sharp. And that's the uh, fun of Blazor bringing in with your WebAssembly just runs on every uh, modern browser. So Blazor is exciting, super exciting, and it, it absolutely runs everywhere on the web. It does have potential to run on desktop through like an electron shell. Uh, it does have potential to run on mobile as well. Uh, we are uh, getting to see uh, the previews of what Xamarin forms, like the whole Xamarin stack evolves into in .NET MAUI, which is coming up uh, later this year in preview form, and then it'll be ready next year. Uh, that does run on the web. So your C Sharp and XAML can get back to the web, just done better this time, not through a plugin that Steve Jobs uh, Ghost is going to shout at, uh, but uh, yeah, your your C Sharp uh, is very very welcome on the web. Um, Blazor is an awesome uh, choice if you want to uh, migrate out of Silverlight and be absolutely want to be on the web. It, it's just like there are some syntactical differences because what you're writing is C Sharp and sort of an XML. Um, and you're writing components, so you, you have to think it through like exactly how you migrate, but it's absolutely possible. What are the what are the downsides of Blazor on the web? Are there any? Right now, no, they're not. But the only thing is, this is very new, so it needs to be like proven out. Uh, the security model, uh, the performance, everything needs to be proven out over time. But otherwise, the tech is here; it's production ready. So I don't, I don't know. Based on the chat, there's a potential ice factor in the community, but I don't know if that's true. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you mean ice factor? Uh... Uh, who was it? It was... Orel just said Blazor seems great and there's a big MS push, but I still feel that the Blazor community is cold. Okay. What does that mean exactly? They're not friendly or what? Yes. No? Yeah. Maybe yeah. it's just it's... new. It's just, yeah, it's upcoming. Um, I mean, there are folks who are very passionate about Blazor, so I'm sure things will just get better, better over time. And uh, this is all very new, like WebAssembly support in your browser came as early or as late as May of this year. So this is still very new tech that you're looking at, but there are plenty of pioneers, there are plenty of folks who love this stuff and they're pushing it forward uh, every day. So it's gonna get better. 
There was a Hydrate Redeemed, okay. darling. Okay, 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 Hydrate. Yeah, we've been talking for a while. <laughs> John, I don't know if you have a drink with you, but it's early morning for you. And uh, yeah, there you go. So on that note, I mean, uh, I know folks wanted us to actually get into code, which is what we want to do. It's just, yeah, we just wanted to set the stage because there is a lot of choice. And we want to go through the list and show you um, the pros and cons of some of this stuff. So John, um, any thoughts from you? Because I think what we want to do is uh, let you go for a little bit. And Alyssa and me are going to try doing some XAML.NET uh, lift and shift. So your thoughts uh, right now with Silverlight and what you see moving forward. Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I, I'm going to go back to a comment Alyssa made earlier, which is I just want to rewrite the application. And um, we, you know, I hear this so much from people who have old legacy things that are out of support or they just, you know, whatever, like whether it's Silverlight or it's Power Builder or it's OBB or it's Delphi or whatever. And um, I know that whenever we look at old code, we go like, oh my God, this is just so awful. I want to just start a clean sheet and build a perfect architecture and build a perfect object model and have everything be clean and use all the modern patterns and everything. And it's, it's, it's the noble goal, right? Um, and as a matter well, of fact, you didn't I, even mention my side of it where I come from, you know, this super altruistic, what does your user need? And uh -huh. surely like 20, 30 years ago, those needs have changed. So maybe we need to break services out. Maybe we need to rewrite the UI and it, you know, with constantly changing, you know, screen sizes, it needs to work on every screen size. What if they want to complete orders on an iPad or a mobile device in the factory or on the print floor or wherever it is. And so for me, uh, you know, it's not even the architecture or the code itself, but it's looking at it from the client side thinking, oh, this is what you have to look at every day. Like there's got to be a way to streamline this flow and to fit your needs of, you know, 2000, you know, 20, what is it, 2012? I have no idea what year it is. Uh, 2019. <laughs> 2020. I, 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 sometimes me and my husband have to remind each other about our birthdays. It's bad. Like, it's, I uh, don't yeah. know dates, but whatever it is, like, so that's, that's where I'm coming from. And so, but I get like you're saying it's a noble goal, and I guess it's what, unrealistic. Well, it's not so much it's unrealistic. I, I was going to say I'm looking out uh, my window here where there used to be a very large deck. And we just started out with this like, OK, the railing needs to be replaced. And then there's some deck boards that are bad. And then as we started getting into it, we realized the foundation was rotten. So it's all gone. So it's a complete rewrite. OK, and it's going to be a massive project. And what I'm hoping is we won't get scope creep. And we won't get mission slip. And, you know, we can nail down the requirements and stick to them. If any of this sounds familiar with respect to software development, now multiply that by a gazillion for, again, for really large applications. You know, if you have all this business logic that's been developed over the years, it's been debugged, but nobody can read it or figure it out because it's this linguini, you know, spread all over the place. Do you really want to try and start from the beginning and, and redo that? And while it's a noble goal, maybe it's not a, as Sam was saying, maybe the, there's not a really good ROI on that. Okay, if the application works and you can rebuild the user interface and then gradually chip away at refactoring individual pieces or, or carve out a chunk and make it a microservice that you can expose and then maybe comment out that code or just you know park it somewhere so you don't break any of the dependencies on that code, but it's no longer actually being used in a real production way. Okay, so, so those are all John, different for those dreamers out there like me, those front end web devs, can yeah. you give us like, without, I don't know, breaking uh, NDAs or anything, can you give us like just an idea of an app that is too large to think about just being like rewrite, throw, you know, throw this out? Like, can, can you give us like a, just an example of like a service that does that, that that way in my head, I can be like for the rest of the stream, like, okay, it's not, cause right now I'm like, I'm still itching to throw it out. <laughs> I know, I know, I know you are. Well, here, think about, think about a, um, a medical, uh, a medical records app. Okay. So um, it's an ISV and they have an application they sell to, let's say ophthalmologists and it handles all of the uh, client billing, it handles all of the client records, it handles all the automation to the testing equipment, okay, to pull results back from uh, test gear uh, to put into the customer record. 
It interfaces with the various hospital systems that the uh, doctors are uh, on staff at. Um, it provides uh, a automated system for customers or other patients to go in and look at their test results. Uh, it provides um, automated announcements like you need to come in and get your glaucoma check. It, it works with the uh, pharmacy systems for- So taking uh, something drugs. like that offline and doing a rewrite would be nightmarish and almost impossible to do at once kind of thing. Yeah, so, like it's just- <laughs> Yeah, imagine there's 400 screens and there's 3 million lines of code, okay? And it took 15 years to write it over time. It started out as an ERP system and then they added this function, this function, this function, this function, and it's all tangled together, right? And so you go to the internal development team and you go like, we wanna build a web version, native web version. And they go like, great, we'll have it for you in 2030, <laughs> right? Uh, because right, it right. took 20 years to make this one. It's actually got code that goes back to DOS, you know? <laughs> uh, hey, we see this, I mean, we really, I, I'm not kidding, we see this, right? I, remember I don't even know what that is. You say DOS, and I'm like, is that a game? Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> yeah, Federico can swear that I'm telling the truth. We were in an office not far from where I'm sitting right now at an ISC, and they said, we actually don't have anybody on staff who understands how this application works anymore. Okay. This was the development team. Like, we, we go in and we like, okay, we want to add a feature. We hope to God we don't we don't break it, and we're going to go I don't understand. carefully. They What's don't that? know how it they don't have anyone on staff who knows how. How do you keep the app going? don't have going? anybody on staff that has the whole concept in their head anymore, right? It's just too big, too old, too complicated. We <sighs> went back to the 1980s. They still had code in the in the kernels that were based on that 1980 DOS code, okay, written in C, okay. They have modules that maybe are in C++. They I'm have so glad stuff you're that giving me this perspective because if there's any other like web devs who are new to the game, like this could this is eye opening. I literally yeah. had no idea. It's so, it's, wow. it's, true, it's true, unfortunately, <laughs> Alyssa. I mean, there, there are legacy systems, and and so here's the thing: like when people talk about legacy systems, like we sometimes don't like that word because if it's running your business, that's not legacy; it's real. But if technologies are I like mean, for me, legacy is Angular JS. So well, okay, you're, you're really cutting it. <laughs> so whenever I hear that, it doesn't carry the weight that yeah. John just that perspective. Yes, that John yes. Just, so I'm like, really if you look at like it's what I call the very large project problem, right? Yeah. The very large application problem, which is which is just a whole different scenario than a typical app, right? So what we tell customers is, if you got a typical app, we write it. You know, if it's a small, contained, understood app. Go ahead and rewrite it from scratch. You know, if it's a manageable project, but at the point where the project isn't manageable, then um, you know you have to look at some alternative, right? And, and there are, and we're not the only alternative by any means. But but you know, we have one solution that works really well for a constrained set of applications. Anyway, so yeah. I'll, I'll drop off, Sam, and you. No, no, that, this is all this is all great. So yeah, yeah I mean, thank you for that, John. Seriously. <laughs> And, and just to kind of tie this all together, I mean, this is the reality for lots of enterprises and I'm, I'm highlighting messages. One of our engineers, Martin Batnov is here and, and he was talking about how like line of business applications, if it's intranet, it's got a different set of restrictions for you to migrate. So think about all of this, uh, think about uh, your possibilities and yeah, let's move it forward. This all comes down to what you want to write and how you want to share code and move it forward. So. John, uh, I want to thank you again. Uh, I know it's early morning for you, so we'll let you go have some breakfast and come back in like in like two hours probably. Okay, great. Un Thanks, until guys. I until I crash and burn. <laughs> All right. Thank Bye. you, John. And uh, yeah, let's switch to desktop. All right. Let's see. Okay. This green screen uh, is brought to you by our good friends at Elgato. No, I'm just I'm just joking. It just needs a reboot so I can share my desktop. So give me a second. It's amazing. I have these camera webcam settings that I use to control my web camera as like for much like exposure and lighting and apparently Skype like kicked those off just now. I'm amazed at like how much control it has. <laughs> Hang on, I'm, I'm going to change my into my coding hat because like one does not code in the same hat that you chat in. Wait, what? <laughs> no, okay. I'm old. I, I I can't have a camera looking down on me. Coding hat. <laughs>
All right. Uh, so that, by the way, is not my car, folks. It's actually Iron Man's car. It's the Audi e-tron GT. It's an all-electric supercar that's coming out next year. Okay. So. Did you uh, just say Iron Man's car? Yeah. Uh, well, in uh, Avengers Endgame, uh, okay. Iron okay. Man was seen I, I driving. Was like, I was like, you know he's not real, right? Like... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. All right, folks. Uh, this is where uh, the rubber meets the road, and we're going to try to do the things that we talked about. So let me pull up this image one more time, and let's let's keep this up so I don't miss anything, okay? We'll, we'll try to show you most of this. All right, so... Let's see, are we good here? Um, sound is good. And Alyssa, I think I... Okay, wait a second. Are we doing giveaways? Uh, I know we are doing some prizes. Uh, so folks in the chat room, uh, Didi and Sarah and Ivana, our good friends, if you want to drop in uh, a link to the form. So folks, we are giving you some prizes. Uh, yeah, it looks like the Nightbot did mm -hmm, up a couple, did, if did, you want to. All right, and I just want to make sure there is no echo on you, which should not be. Uh, let me yeah, I think talk. Hello, yeah. hello, hello. Yeah. All right, so let's uh, start with just the basics we talked about. So like I said, um, if you have a Silverlight app, uh, I really, really hope that you take the time. And this is not just for migration. This is not just for Silverlight uh, apps. This is for true for any apps that gets complex and bloated over time. Separate things out, please, because it's, it's for your own good. And um, it just gives you the uh, sanity check. Uh, and before I go forward, where's my music? It's getting lonely here while I code because you'll have like awkward pauses while I struggle. <laughs> I'm going to grab some more coffee, but I'll be back in two, two right. seconds. <laughs> I'm just waiting here. All right, folks, I think music is good. Let me know if it's too loud for you. All right, chat room, what's going on? Um, yeah, we're talking about prizes. Yeah, all the good stuff. Okay. Why don't I pull up a couple of things um, before Alyssa comes back on? Um, yeah. You back? Oh, you're putting on your headphones. There we go, we're back. Can you hear me still? I can. Hello. All right. Okay, we are doing prizes. Ooh, Amazon gift Who, cards. Who's credited with killing Silverlight? What? Ah, so Ed is making fun of me because I spent um, like three years on Windows Phone and I saw it die slowly. <laughs> <laughs> That's not good. All right. Yeah, you folks uh, do, the, do the form for the prizes. We'll keep on drawing throughout the day. Okay, so Alyssa. You know we are going to have a rocking time when <laughs> we begin our coding from a blog post in October 2008. <laughs> some of you, what is happening? Yes, yeah, so, some of you in the chat room, you may have been going to school or still uh, in your diapers. Maybe, or maybe that's too much. Um, but this is old. Uh, but this is when Silverlight was really kicking. Uh, kicking butt with all the uh, updates and all the love that it was getting. So Simulite came from one, uh, which is its first production thing, to two, three, four very quickly. And then Simulite 5 came, I think, in 2014, 13, right? Something around that time. Um, and, and then it started going down. Um, 
All right, uh, Scott Guthrie, yes. <laughs> this is actually Scott Guthrie's uh, shirt. So if you did not know, um, Alyssa Scott Guthrie is uh, a vice president at Microsoft and he's an absolute uh, super smart uh, individual, runs all of Azure mm -hmm. org right now. And he wrote a lot of these MVC and Silverlight uh, frameworks and, and his teams wrote when it. When she so said that, I was like looking for like <laughs> Scott Guthrie in the chat. like. <laughs> I don't think he's going to stop I, by here I today. Gotcha. He's a little busy. But uh, I'm going to use a couple of things as um, uh, basics for us to uh, lift and shift, okay? So one of these things is uh, an app that was written. This is back when we had a thing called Dig. And um, like you could dig stories. Uh, so this was like movies. And this was like a classic Silverlight look and feel of a Mac uh, application or like a, something running in Safari. Uh, so, uh, folks, if you're following along, like there, there's source code uh, right down here, so you can look up um, this Silverlight source base, uh, this uh, um, uh, code base. Sorry, what am I saying? Source base. What is source base? Okay, so we're gonna take that and uh, try to get that to work. And another thing I want to do is uh, I want to show a little bit of like custom stuff. Like if I go into our stuff, Tidarek, and if I look right down there, Blazor and Silverlight are right next to each other, equal priority. No, I'm kidding. Uh, Silverlight, by the way, folks, we still put out UI for it every release and folks use it all the time. So this is great. Uh, but what I'm going to do here is this is our Silverlight UI. I'm going to try to maybe lift and shift a couple of this UI and see how that works. And here's a trick that you may not know. I'm in Chrome right now. And if I go into demos, it's going to say, eh, can't do that. <laughs> it doesn't run Silverlight apps, but there's a hack. So there is a little extension called IE tab. Oh no, what's a sound? Oh God, that's a really sad sound track. Sorry about what? that. No, you my... have a sad sound? Yeah, the soundtrack is really sad and depressing. Okay. Okay, let's try to get something more upbeat. Hang on, folks. There you go. How about some like techno stuff? Okay, Serenity is a soundtrack called Serenity. Let's try that. Okay. Um, so hang on. If I'm watching it, um, yeah. Okay. So folks, uh, here's a hack. It's a thing called IE Tab, um, and it essentially runs whichever version of IE that you choose, IE like 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 onwards. So uh, Silverlight stopped working in IE 11 forward, right? So you can still run this uh, in Chrome or in any other modern browser. I mean, essentially it's taking that URL and it's just running it inside of a shell, like as if it's rendering it inside of IE and that works. Seriously, uh, this Chrome extension <laughs> was amazing yeah <laughs> i was so excited when you found it and it works so well so yeah yeah good for that <laughs> uh so there are some sample applications these are a little heavy now i mean we're trying to do this in one day so clearly we will not uh, move a gigantic application and migrate that forward but we can take pieces of it and, and try to make it work. So I'll get to this in a bit, but let's start with just the basics of this uh, sample here. So this is uh, an application for uh, looking up a list of things and then uh, maybe highlighting something and doing a little search. Let's start with uh, what this looks like. And I'm gonna pull up uh, and keep this application code base. I do have it open uh, or download it. So let's do VS code and I am going to pull up, uh, see right here in my downloads, there's a thing called dig sample, uh, C sharp. I don't want to see VB because that's going to scare me and a few other folks away. <laughs> VB is visual basic. It's, it's a whole other game, Alyssa. Okay. Uh, can you, why is it scary? Wait, what? Oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. Like that. This is short version because I have no context here. Okay. <laughs> so Visual Basic is where a lot of things started in the Microsoft stack uh, and then .NET came along and .NET is more of a framework. It's a runtime while Visual Basic was a language, but we brought over Visual Basic in modern .NET as well. Um, yeah, Ivana, I will make my code bigger. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm just trying to explain VB and uh, trying to fall apart here. So we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll see how I do that. Um, Was VB on the chart of options? No, 
No, yeah. but uh, VB.NET does run on modern.NET, but it's just like one of those things where there are not a lot of takers, not a lot of devs who do VB. I started with like VB6 back in the days. You could do VB scripts. It's a language. It's a scripting language. It could be a language for making desktop applications, uh, but VB is welcome in um, in modern.NET, just not a lot of people do it. So uh, C Sharp has kind of taken off uh, a whole lot more. Gotcha. Oh, so what is, uh, what are we in right now? You said we're in... Yeah, we're in uh, VS Code and uh, we are looking at a quick sample here. So this is classic Silverlight code base, right? So you are going to not see some of the cruft that Silverlight pulls in to make things work on your browser. So some of that, like if I look into um, like app XAML, uh, and appzaml.cs, like uh, the root visual like starts with a page and then it does a few things behind the scenes that you don't want to get into because Silverlight's runtime is responsible for kind of um, uh, hosting your app inside the shell, inside the plugin and then running it on the web, if that makes sense. So you don't see some of the scruff and you can debug uh, just as easily, but you initialize your application and you start up. Uh, and you start with a page. So this is the page that this application starts off in, and that's just page XAML. So page XAML is the front end, and XAML.cs is what's called the code behind. So it's just- Maybe it kind of looks close to TypeScript, maybe, a little bit. It's, it's similar. This is um, XAML. So uh, essentially, um, it's, it's, it's a version of XML. So here you have like a bunch of styles, and maybe we'll try one of these. Like if you had styles in your- so Oh, like, sorry, uh, I meant the CS file. This definitely yeah, does yeah. not look like TypeScript. <laughs> no, this is this is XAML. The CS file is all C sharp, right? It's it's the code behind. It's the crux of what the app does or what the screen does. Um, yeah, um, listen. If you don't mind watching the chat room a little more closely, because uh, I can I can move forward with code. So let me know if something yeah. uh, needs to be highlighted or talked about. So what we have here is a bunch of styles. And how much time do I have? I have probably an hour and twenty minutes, right? So I want to show you a bunch of different things and. Uh, try um, uh, try stuff here as much as I can. So I have a bunch of styles here. These are kind of global styles. Think of it as like CSS that's applicable to your whole website, right? So you have some styles there. And then page.xaml is like the first page, or in this case, like the only page, or maybe there's another uh, story details view, but this is classic XAML. And this is the kind of XAML that you see in every other XAML framework uh, or platform as well. Same for WPF. Universal Windows Platform, Xamarin Forms, Uno Platform, this is all XAML. Like if you do one, you can do the other ones fairly easily. There are some differences, but you can get around it. So this is XAML. And uh, this is where you can see like uh, some of the text blocks that are showing the stories. Then here's an image and there are buttons and things like that. So let's try to recreate this in a modern um, uh, framework and see where we fall short and what we need to move, okay? VB was essentially Office, uh, yeah. Yeah, VB was very powerful, Martin, um, in the chat room, uh, but uh, it's fallen a little off. Uh, uh, it's not. Favors, it's not but... in the same straits though as like Flash or Silverlight though. No, as no, far no. As, like, no, it's not a plug. It, it was a language, but it had. Uh, things that could run macros, it could it could run scripts for web applications. So the reason that it's not popular is different. Yes, it's just C sharp is a much more well thought out and a more modern language that's object oriented, uh, functional also in a way uh, nowadays. But uh, um, you just said C sharp is modern. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe for us old folks, it is modern. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Anything anything that's not JavaScript is very hard for me to wrap my head around. So I do yeah. appreciate you explaining it, Sam. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> yep. Well, um, it's, uh, I mean, just nowadays, like uh, with C Sharp and with JavaScript, like you can reach just about any platform, right? So just pick what you want to do and just like stick to it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to not slow down too much uh, with Ed and Martin around, who can slow us down. Uh, so let me start coding and uh, try to see how this looks like. Okay, so let me pull up uh, Visual Studio for Mac. I'm on a Mac. Uh, I'm going to do a new project here. 
And I want to show you the flexibility of some of the XAML and C Sharp code uh, that you see in Silverlight apps. So what I'm going to start off with is a multi-platform app. This is Xamarin Forms. This is essentially the shell that runs your app inside of iOS, Android, and a whole bunch of other platforms. And we're going to just say blank forms uh, and just hit next. So let's do Silverlight. DD said that uh, VB is modern compared to punch cards. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy, okay, yes, yes. There are folks who absolutely love VB and want to see it everywhere, and Microsoft is supporting them, uh, maybe a little grudgingly. Uh, but uh, okay, let's uh, start a Xamarin Forms application. And I want to show this like uh, we're going to take some XAML and try to make it work on as many platforms as we can from Silverlight. So this is a Xamarin Forms application, runs on iOS, Android, out of the gate, so that's all good. Next. Yes, next. I don't want to UI test my app because my code is perfect. No, this is a demo. Okay, so this may be uh, new to you, uh, Alyssa, but essentially this is classic Xamarin Forms. So we have platform specific projects. I'm going to pull this up a little bit. Um, so we have platform specific projects for each platform that you want to support. In this case, it's iOS and Android. And then you have what's called a shared project. This is where you want to have your shared code, your assets, your business logic, all of it goes there. And your goal is to write as little platform specific code as you can, because uh, that's what uh, ties you to a platform. You are trying to write abstracted code, if that makes sense. So this is a .NET standard library that can be shared across um, all the projects. All right, so let's start here, and I'm going to switch to iOS as my startup project. Um, and uh, yeah, let's just run this, and uh, let's do a build uh, and, and run. And essentially what you're going to see, I see the emotes floating around. Uh, yeah, what are we boning on, Ed and Ivana? OK. OK, all right, I know it looks like there's a trivia coming up. No, no, patching and talking about coasters. <laughs> I see. I see all the fun that you're having. All right, we're going to wait for this to build. And but also, this... Didi said that when I started at Microsoft in 1991, I launched VB. Is Didi oh. saying she wrote VB? What does that comment mean? I don't know, but she may have been involved in the early days of VB. Shut the front door. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so um, ooh, what is this? Oh, this Talk is. To check, darling. Yeah, uh, this is just like Xamarin Forms starting up to say, "Hey, welcome to Xamarin Forms." Okay, so essentially, what you see here is the iOS simulator. I am on Mac, so it just knows. Uh, so this is a native um, iOS application, just written with XAML and C Sharp, which is exactly what we do in Silverlight, just a different flavor of XAML. Uh, and um, it actually goes off to Xcode, does the build, comes back with the app package, and that's how it loads on the simulator. I can deploy it to a, a physical device as well. So life is good. So uh, let's try to uh, see what this does or how this code works. So first thing is, um, if you look at my app, XAML.cs, which is where um, our processing normally begins, we had a main page. That's the code that you just saw. So this one here is showing you all of There's this stuff. Dumb question in yeah. the chat. Are you prepped to take a dumb question? Yeah, OK, go for it. <laughs> Can Xamarin replace Silverlight in web application? I thought Xamarin only runs within mobile apps, which is more than I knew about Xamarin. OK, yes. So not a dumb question. <laughs> yes, yes. So Xamarin started off life as just a mobile uh, facing framework, but it can run on desktop, which is what I'm going to show you. And it can run on web. Uh, the same code just runs in a lot of places. All right, so uh, let's dive in. And I don't have dig anymore, but what we do have is just any other um, uh, RESTful endpoint. So this is the one that I like pulling up. I've built other apps with this. Uh, this is called JSON Placeholder. It just gives you uh, a, a JSON endpoint that just gives you some things back. Uh, this one has like posts and comments and albums and photos. If I go into posts here, you're going to see that it pulls back probably 100 or so posts. Like think of these like as posts that you see from a website. And this is actually in Latin, so it makes it a little more fun. So let's try to pull back data on uh, from this uh, service endpoint. And we're going to try to copy code from Silverlight and try to make this work. So I am going to copy a little bit of code. Uh, 
that I have made so I'm not writing boilerplate code, right? So bear with me a second here. I'm going to go in here and uh, try to just copy my model so you don't see me doing that. All right, where are my projects? Here you go. Copy in the model. Yeah. Copy in the model. I don't want to write the model. <laughs> All right. Is this so, like a... Let me see your model. I want to see what you're talking about. Yeah, hang on. Let me uh, add uh, uh, folders here. So model is... Uh, this is kind of the MVVM design pattern. Um, so model is what keeps your data and talks to your data store or data source, whatever that is. Uh, and then we'll have something for views. Uh, let's see. Well, I mean, we can keep the views out. Let, let's just bring in a model. So I'm going to do an add a uh, new file. Let's call it posts. And uh, I want it to be just a C-sharp class file. That's it. All right. Is the... Um, Nope, oh, hang on. Do not want to do that? Is the uh, font size big enough? I can make it a little bit bigger. Yeah. Uh, okay. I can read it. Okay. All right. So this is just a C sharp file, and what I want to do here is. Um, copy. This is what you didn't want to write. Yeah, I don't <laughs> want to write that. So hang on. I'm going to open this up. Hang on. Hang on. And I'm going to copy a bunch of things here, so I don't have to write that boring stuff. Okay, first of all, somebody's talking Smoofy. I keep wanting to call Mr. Smoofy Mr. Spoofy, so apologies for that. Uh, said my first application was written in Quick Basic, and and then other people are chiming in about the Quick Basic. Oh boy, is this related to the VB? Because you know they both have a B. <laughs> no, it's slightly different. Different, and I actually. Don't want to talk about it a whole lot because I don't know. Quick Basic was uh, a okay. thing from way, way back. Uh, okay, but I, not I, related to the VB. No, not quite. Uh, it, it was uh, it was a language. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Spoofy is saying it's old. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was more of a language. Uh, subsequently eclipsed by VB. So now we're talking about things before VB. So <laughs> we're going way back. I don't know a lot about Q uh, Basic, uh, uh, but yeah. Basic. Uh, oh, look, you even know the slang. Look at you. Yeah, uh, <laughs> predates VB and was a command line. Okay, now we are going way back. Okay. All right, so uh, back to this. Uh, I am going to add a quick um, uh, NuGet package to my thing, so it knows um, what uh, Newton soft JSON is. I should start using the built-in JSON serialization in .NET, but I'm still used to using Newton soft, which is just a JSON serializer and deserializer okay so can you go away there you go so at this point uh, why is it complaining the squigglies uh, are saying I don't know what that is okay let's do a build oh no you didn't stop JSON okay let's add it to iOS as well you don't know why it's angry yeah it's just a whole bunch of squigglies. And why is it angry? Does it have like an error? Is it going to give us an error? Is it just yelling at us to be oh, yelling oh, at us? Oh, no, no, no. I, I copied like the class inside of it. So it's like, what is this? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, there you go. Well, good thing I added the nugget package to the other ones as well. And All now right. we are on to Basecom, Bascom, B-A-S-C-O-M. Whatever that is. <laughs> I don't know oh, what that command is. line compiler for basic. Interesting. Okay. Did you fix your squiggles? Yes. Yes. I had copied the class name as well. Okay. So what you have here is a representation of uh, an object, a list of things that we want to pull down. Because if you look at that uh, JSON feed I pulled up, it has like user ID, ID, title, and body for each post. So I just have them in one single object so I can deal with it um, easily. Okay. Does that make sense? And then um, in here, I'm going to write another file. Empty file is fine. So let's do posts manager. So um, this is Visual Studio, not Visual Studio Code. 
no, this is Visual Studio. This is VS for Mac. So this has a little more functionality, a little more feature rich than VS Code. Uh, and this is meant just for the Mac. This is not the same. I've code always base. heard about it. I've never actually witnessed before. So I'm excited to also learn. It's, uh, it's about the same. It still crashes probably two or three times a week, but that's. Wait, yours crashes? What are you doing on well, your. Things crash. <laughs> yeah, things crash. Oh. <laughs> I've never crashed VS Code, but I, I write. Angular, so what? I don't know what you're writing. It must be intense. <laughs> no, it, it it just has lots of tie-ins because it, it does things like oh. with the simulators and all uh, and so on. Okay, okay. Uh, so you have to keep things updated. Okay, so let me make this a little bigger so I can actually copy some of this stuff that I don't want to write again. And this is just the code now. If Ed is in the chat room, he's going to be like, "Why are you copying code from the past? You are supposed to write this from scratch." And I'm like, yes, just not this stuff. I want to write the other code. I want to copy Silverlight code. All right, so we did a bunch of things here that it's going to complain about, which we can uh, fix. Let's uh, bring in all our... Yeah, it was that, what's it called? The the lift and... Lift and shift. The lift and shift! So I can easy. write that down. Yeah. Gold. <laughs> okay, so... Here we have uh, just a few lines of code. So I can make a request to that uh, RESTful endpoint and pull back some data. Uh, I don't want to do any of this stuff right now. We're going to go straight to the cloud and try to fetch it. Uh, so yeah, let's keep that. Um, I don't want to do this either. This is like saving it and caching it, which we can do later on. Let's just get the basics to work. And I know exactly what it's complaining about. And it doesn't know the endpoint. So I need to give it. So a... remind us again, what are we doing right now? We're taking an old Silverlight application and migrating, lift and shifting it to, to Xamarin, what? To Xamarin Forms. Xamarin. Xamarin. Yep. Okay. Right. So uh, it's needing a RESTful endpoint. So let's make that first. So we're going to call this constants. So this is just going to give me the um, endpoint so I can go talk to it. All right, I'm just going to take this whole thing. There you go. And come back here. Oh wait, I don't want this whole I don't want this whole thing gone. Okay, there you go. So at this point, what I have here, Alyssa, is um, just one line of code that points to the URL, right? So this is the JSON placeholder posts. This is the same URL that we're trying to hit. Like that's my RESTful service, okay? So I have that, and then I have uh, an object that stands for uh, each post as I'm going to get it back from that source like imagine this being like uh, the dig sample in, in Scott Guthrie's blog uh, where he was pulling down like a list of movies from a site right um, so that's what we're trying to do and then I have this thing also Ed said a whole class called constants that holds only constants for the app yes cringe. yes Ed, <laughs> you can cringe all you want this is where I keep all my stuff all my static stuff <laughs> Every constant, every variable, everything that is class-wide can just stay there called constants. <laughs> All right, I'm old. Uh, so in here, we are newing up what's called an observable collection, which is a C-sharp generic. It's a list of things, but it's a little smart, so it knows when the object collection changes, so we can data bind. And we are newing up an HTTP client, so we can make a client request. And then uh, we are saying, go get the posts, and it's going to go off to that RESTful endpoint. If it is successful, it's going to read that whole thing back as a string, and then it's going to do the JSON convert, so we can deserialize it into an object. All right, what's, what are we looking at chat-wise? Ed said that Ed said I don't always use variables, but when I do, I make them global. And it, it just it got me. It just it got me. Uh, of course. <laughs> Okay, so here we're going to blow away the page that it uh, came with and we're going to make our own. So this is our model and now we're going to maybe make, um, we can make a view folder or we can just, uh, let's just uh, add a new file. Just cut some corners here. Uh, forms and we want it to be a forms content page. Let's uh, call it 
posts. And they're joking, noticed. right? About what? The global variables. That's a joke. Yes. Yes. Okay. Cool. 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 But 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 <laughs> you could. I mean, global variables can be useful. Like global styles. Like Silverlight used to use that quite a bit. So we'll borrow some of it from Silverlight. It's not entirely a joke. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't tell. I was like, oh, are they being for real? Is this legit? Can we actually just use global everything? Because that sounds like a bad idea. Okay, we're yeah. good. We're good. <laughs> okay, so I added a new page and I don't have a main page anymore. So I'm going to make this page my starting page for my app, right? So uh, this is pure XAML forms. It's XAML, just the way you would like it. And I'm going to bring in some Silverlight stuff right now. But this is all XAML forms for now. So we have this, and um, let's do a label uh, just to check if we have it right. Not worked. World. OK. So just to make sure we have not broken anything yet, we're going to run this one more time. Bear with me, folks. I am going to pull over some Silverlight code in just a minute. Okay, so we have hello world. It's way up there. You can't see it, but I mean, that's just spacing. We can fix it. So we are still good. All right. And now I want to uh, bring in a little bit of a UI as well. And again, I don't want to write. So, but this is a little different UI. So let's see. Um, where can I go? <laughs> Hang on. Maybe this project has some UI that I can borrow. Uh, oh, there we go. I had you, written the same are file. Are you stealing UI? I'm stealing my own code. I'm good. <laughs> I'm stealing my own code. <laughs> Where is Sublime? Okay. I got a little confused. I got a little confused earlier because I thought that Xamarin would have like a dot XA or something. So like extension. So it's just all CS files. Well, right. it, it has XAML files and CS files. None of that is Xamarin. It, this is all Xamarin. This is XAML. Mm, wait, so XAML equals equals Xamarin? XAML is the markup language used by Xamarin. So you would not use XAML outside of Xamarin? You could. Uh, well, that's oh, what wait. we're going to look at. You could do WPF. You could do other types of applications where you You're really hurting my brain, man. So, <laughs> Okay, XAML is the markup language that you see here. XAML is right. how we describe the visual tree, and there are multiple platforms that use XAML as the markup language. So things like WPF, which is where it started, things like Silverlight, Universal Windows Platform, Xamarin Forms, Uno Platform, they all use XAML. Slightly different when you say flavors. Platform, do you mean ID? The, the runtime. No, no, just the runtime. These okay. are different frameworks that have their own runtime. Some of them run on .NET, some of them run on .NET Framework, some of them run on Mono. So the runtime is irrelevant. It's just their front-end tech, the visual tree that you're building, is in the markup language that's called XAML. So that's what And doing. Xamarin is still alive and kicking. Oh, absolutely. Xamarin okay. is very much alive and kicking. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. So. What do we do here? So we brought in some code, which um, is meant to give me a list view. So let's uh, let's go back and look at this stuff here. OK, so let's do Xamarin Forms uh, docs, if I can. Uh, maybe here. So this is Xamarin Forms docs. This is where anybody would start if you are trying to write Xamarin Forms stuff. Uh, user interface. Let's go in here, see more. So you're going into docs.microsoft.com and you can see the control reference. So when you are painting your visual tree in Xamarin Forms, uh, and again, we're going to take this to other platforms, but you have different types of um, UI controls. You have pages, which is the container that you see. Every mobile app is a collection of pages, mostly. You have layouts on how you position things inside of the pages. You have views, which are the individual components. You have cells. So you have a lot of things. So when I go into views, this is where you see all of the like 30 or so controls that Xamarin Forms has out of the box. So things like 
box views, expanders, labels, lines, everything, images, and all of these are abstractions. So you write some XAML, which is the markup language, and at runtime, it knows how to render the native um, uh, UI for iOS Can and Android. Can you just swap out runtimes willy-nilly? No, <laughs> for sure not. No, because like it, it needs the crux to have API access for each platform. It does need the runtime. Okay. Yep. Okay, so we are uh, switching to uh, using uh, this particular thing that shows us a list of um, objects. Let's see where that is. Carousal view, collection view, list view, right? So most uh, mobile apps start out being a list of things. So that's what we're using. A list view just shows you a list of things. And we want to show a list of posts. In this case, it has an item template, uh, which describes like how each of the rows of that uh, list view is supposed to look like. And right now, I just want uh, the title to show up. So let's um, write some code here. Um, so we have this. And then we're going to override the on appearing and we will have a private method called uh, let's say draw UI okay and when this happens I'm going to call what did I call it You still here with me? Yeah, okay. Draw UI. Okay, so we want to paint our UI. And when this happens, I want to actually uh, new up the posts manager that we created. Now, what do we call it? Oh, we have a different namespace. This was in. So we're going to say, well, maybe not there. Uh, right down here. So we have some consistency. We're going to say using. Uh, what do we call this app? We called it Silverlight Migration dot Model. So now we have access to um, that manager. Where did my music go? I feel lonely coding without music. It's on just really low on volume. Alyssa, can you still hear me? Or are you frozen? No, you're still good. No, I can still hear you. I'm talking to people about visual designers okay. and keep on talking. I just feel like they got thrown out with the web, but because they were asking if Angular had a visual designer uh -huh. or any other things because they were saying XAML is the markup language for visual presentation, but it doesn't have a visual designer. And it doesn't I mean, like there's not like like isn't really iOS or I mean, iOS like with like the drag and drop interface, that's the only visual designer I've ever seen. I've never seen something like that that's like globally for all web Yeah, the iOS storyboarding thing, that, that is still very powerful. Xamarin has things like Previewer, so you can still build your visual tree a little bit uh, with, a, with a designer, but you, like most professional devs, don't use that too much because right. it's, it's a little limiting. Yeah. All right, so let's create uh, a posts manager all right we're gonna new that up smoothie saying that Microsoft blend for Visual Studio is a user interface design tool developed and sold by Microsoft for creating graphical interfaces for uh, the web. that's another blast that's from the past you and all of you are gonna take us way back <laughs> into the Wait, days. are you saying like people don't use this anymore? Microsoft they, Blend? They do, but it's not quite the same as before. So Blend used to be a tool that Microsoft came up with. This was very popular with WPF in early days of XAML. So your designers and your developers can work very closely together. So I can work on a visual tree and I can give you the solution. So you open up the same file in Blend, which is more of a design tool, and you write all the animations and all the transitions of what your visual tree goes through during the course of the app. And um, then you give me the file back or we can work on it together. So it's not um, out there as a standalone app anymore, but there's a there's a plugin. You can still use um, Blend with Visual Studio, just okay. not as popular as it used to be back I, in the days. Yeah. Hydrate was redeemed, darling. Okay, me too, me too. 
All right, uh, it's 45 minutes in. We got to get stuff done. So, um, what are we doing? So we need to have, um, we do have a list feed, don't we? Yes, and uh, we call it my posts list. Okay, so we're gonna do this. By this, I mean this particular page. Dot. Nope, not that. What is it called? This dot. My posts. Okay, why can it not recognize what my posts is? Hang on. So I got that. Okay, it does not like this at all. Okay. <laughs> So let's see what I did wrong. Um, draw UI, I got that. It doesn't like my um, lift and shift list view, <laughs> which we can dig into why it doesn't like that. Oh, I love that so much. <laughs> okay, let's look at some examples. Maybe I don't need the content. All right. I could do a stack layout if it helps, but I doubt that's the case. But do you want to? Okay, so God, stack layout. Let's add a stack layout inside this, and we're going to put this inside a stack layout. Okay, I'm gonna write this and then hopefully Visual Studio compiles. <laughs> no, not that, not that. Post list. So all I'm trying to do is bring in this source. Todd, what is it called? Fetch or get <laughs> posts. What's funny? Uh, we're just trying to come up with languages that Ed doesn't have experience with, and Sarah threw out COBOL and Fortran. Uh oh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I did two years of COBOL. No, one year you of did? COBOL. Yes. What? That's one of the things that John was talking about. Like enterprises have these apps that have been running for ages, and just people have moved on, and the apps have not. And you just don't know. You don't, don't want to touch anything because you don't know what you're going to break. But oh, those mainframe right. apps, those uh, VB apps are still very much there. And some of them are gigantic. Was it fun? Do you miss it? Did you love COBOL? I wouldn't say I loved COBOL. It was okay because it was very English-like. It was like reading code was almost like reading a poem. It was really? very, very verbose. Which oh, is, that's so cool. Yeah, which is actually something that XAML gets a lot of um, um, uh, bad uh reputation about it it is a little verbose like this stuff like if you can imagine this being like a thousand lines long this gets a little verbose to kind of get into and figure out what is what <laughs> uh people are, someone said a real programmer can write fortran in any language and then someone else said that COBOL is definitely not cool so there's you know <laughs> oh, cracking me up okay All right, seriously, you know what an item source is. There you go. Okay, now, oh, this is not an await. All right. Async. No, I should not do uh, an async void, but it's okay for now. Okay, are you happy now, Visual Studio? Okay. So, um, at this point, we have a UI that's a list view and um, it has a template and it's meant when this thing comes up we are supposed to go fire this off which we'll call this get posts method and this one's job is to go off to that cloud endpoint bring back a set of posts and try to render it so let's see what the what this does if this at all works we'll hit debug here why not 
Folks, hang in for a little bit. I'm just trying to get the basics of uh, an app working so I can take it uh, to iOS and to Android and to WPF and Mac and web. All right, so what did we do? I'm going to uh, step over this. Oh, we got some data back. Oh, I never actually got to hit the breakpoint and see what this thing was. But do you see what we did here, Alyssa? We have uh, a list view that shows you a list of posts, right? This is like straight up JSON coming from that web source that we're just showing in a list view. With me so far? I'm just confused because you're running this on an iPhone. It is an iPhone, it's a native iOS app. But I'm writing XAML and C Sharp to it. This yeah, is, this see, is that's whole, where I'm confused. <laughs> this is the whole draw of uh, Xamarin Forms because you get to write XAML and C Sharp and it runs on iOS and it runs so on it's Android. Like, it's like native script? Sort of. It's actually very similar to native script. Native script is a platform, it's actually open source, uh, that uh, we, we uh, maintain and, and we started off. But the whole idea is you're going to write JavaScript and TypeScript to write truly native cross-platform apps. So when you write things in XAML in the visual layer that native script provides, at runtime, those get translated to native iOS or Android apps. That's exactly what Xamarin Forms does, except instead of writing JavaScript, you're writing C Sharp and XAML. Right. So is it web or no, not web. This is not web yet. This is pure C sharp and XAML running in iOS. So it will when you go to web, it will if you wanted it to. Yes. Okay. So in here, like all of this is XAML. Now take a look at this list view as compared to the Silverlight list view. So here is the list box. Uh, now take a look at how similar this thing is. This is a stack panel which translates one on one. Stack panel is just like stacking things in your visual tree. Then we had an image source, we have a text block. Uh, what else did we have? This was a list box. So that's different, uh, but it's not that different. In here, like this is a grid. So this is kind of one of those layout controls. We can do a grid, we can do a stack layout. It's all the same. It's how you want to structure things. So this is as close as you will get to being able to reuse like this whole stack panel. Uh, this one has like text blocks inside of it. We have the same text block. Right, uh, we have labels instead of text blocks because this is Xamarin Forms, so slightly different version of XAML. But um, yeah, this thing is XAML, just pure XAML from one version to another. So, are you with me so far? Yeah, we have a couple comments I'd sure, like you to address by Larry and Terry. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, a, right. that's a fun name. Uh, uh, so Larry said that's cool, but would like to see how Sam replaces a Silverlight in web without the app. But with just browser, do you know what that means? Yes. I don't know what that means. Yes. What does we, that mean? We're getting to it. Just give me a give me a few more minutes, okay? Give okay. Me a, give me a few more minutes, and uh, to answer the question, like what's happening, what's being transpired? Okay. So this is being like when we write this code, like you, this is literally XAML as a visual tree, and this is literally C sharp. So this gets compiled into Microsoft Intermediate Language, and then it gets compiled down into native. ARM binaries for Android and uh, what's the the dot app for for uh, for iOS? So it gets compiled as native bits on each platform. That's why you have platform specific projects. And when you do a build for iOS, it compiles it down to a native iOS binary. Essentially, um, does that answer things? Maui, yes, Maui is coming. Maui is the next iteration of this, and I'll I'll show you that in a bit. Okay, how? Is Maui the next iteration of this? Maui is the evolution of Xamarin Forms. So Xamarin Forms right now goes to iOS, Android, and it goes to Mac in a way. Uh, but Maui is uh, making taking that to a next level, making it much more baked in with .NET, the rest of the .NET ecosystem, because Xamarin is still a little bit an offshoot. Uh, you write things in Visual Studio, you write C Sharp and XAML, but they want to make it more easier. Uh, and so more comfortable for if folks. If you were like, yes, Maui is for me, would you have to do this step, this Xamarin step to get to Maui, or can you just go straight to Maui? Maui is going to be pretty much what you see here. So if you have a Xamarin Forms application at the end of this year or going into next year, you can upgrade that to Maui just with a few clicks. So you just do have to go to Xamarin first. You can't yeah. just be like... Or, I mean, you can start from scratch with Maui. You're not going to do things any differently. It's the same exact XAML and C Sharp markup or C Sharp code and XAML markup. But what Maui does, it, it just opens the funnel a little bit more. So folks like you... Maui who, the runtime? 
Maui is the framework that is going to use .NET as a runtime. Uh, so it's going to open it up so you can bring in some web stuff. This is all very MVVM. In Maui, you can do things like MVU pattern, which is a model view update pattern, very uh, popular with like Elixir and other programming languages. And you can do stuff like that. And you can bring in things that are much more closer to React um, and, and do things uh, that are native and cross-platform. I gotcha. Okay. Right. Well, yeah, it looks like you answered Terry and Larry's questions. So. Okay. So <laughs> what we have so far is just pure XAML forms. And now I want to show you a little bit of the flexibility. So this is literally XAML, right? So lift and shift, whatever list views you have, you are going to have to change the namespaces from Silverlight days because this is not going to make sense if you just bring it over from a Silverlight app. Uh, but change up the namespaces, like start with Xamarin Forms and see what the namespaces are, and then just bring in one UI bit at a time, like make sure labels are, like text blocks are called labels, uh, list views are called list boxes. So you will have to know those differences, but otherwise it is XAML uh, that you're bringing in. So now let's do a little bit more fun stuff, because again, as Silverlight was purely a web-based play and it ran on desktop, like, why am I even starting with Xamarin Fonts? Because it can go places, right? So here's where I'm going to do some fun stuff. And just to make sure I'm not skipping anything, let me look up uh, their docs. Uh, just to make sure I don't miss anything. So Xamarin Forms uh, can run on a Mac very easily. So let me show you that. So what essentially we're doing is writing what's called renderers, right? So for each list view, for each button, for each label, there is a piece of code that's called a renderer that sits there and says, oh, I'm running on iOS. Oh, I'm running on Android. I got to render the corresponding native UI elements for that platform. So that's where it's open source and that's where the community has stepped up and Microsoft takes in pull requests. So let's add more stuff to this. Uh, so I'm going to do an add new, oh, not a folder. I want to go up to the solution level and add a new project. All right, so here you can see like I have iOS and Android, which I already covered, but let's do an app, a Mac application, a Cocoa Pods application, and here I'm going to hit next, All right? So just by convention, I'm just going to give it a name that kind of matches the rest of the OS. So we called it xamarinforms.ios instead of this one would be dot Mac, right? And runs on Mac OS Catalina, that's fine. Next, no uh, unit tests, of course. <laughs> but we now have a Mac application, right? So let's change this up, make that my startup project. And I'm gonna do a few things here, which are documented, but I know exactly what they want you to do. So there is this NS main storyboard file. This is coming from app kit. We want to get rid of that and we want Xamarin Forms to do the painting of the UI. So I'm going to delete that row entirely. Gone. Okay. And now let's make sure I'm not missing steps. Um, okay. References to Xamarin Forms. Yes, of course. And back to the project itself. So manage NuGet packages. I'm going to go over to NuGet.org and I am going to bring in Xamarin.Forms. So this is where you see, like, uh, Alyssa, this is literally the framework <laughs> you're bringing in. Okay, what's funny? What's funny? You have to go click on the link Ivana just made. She said, this is Sam explaining Samuel Xamarin and just generally being on the stream today. And she made this, this, um... I, I see, yeah, I see the chat. Image. <laughs> It's beautiful, and it does. Sometimes you are just way over my head, at least. So that that oh, image just brought it home. But it's <laughs> just different mindsets we are bringing to the table. And when you do Angular stuff, you're way over my head. But again, that's the reality. I mean, choose a stack that works for you. Choose something that works. Okay, so um, stay with me here. I'm bringing in Xamarin Forms into a Mac project. Okay. And then we're going to go into our references and we want to add a reference. Look at this. This is a project. So I'm going to add a reference to that .NET standard library that we have, which has all of our code. We don't have anything platform specific here. Hit OK. So we have a reference to the .NET standard library, which is sitting down here. Now this app delegate file is what Mac uses to spin up its thing. And this is where we have to say, 
don't do your thing do what sam informs needs you to do and this is where we're going to go in what's funny keep on reading comments you're you're cracking me up no no mac don't do your thing <laughs> yeah don't do your thing i want you to do my thing okay so main.cs uh this is where we're going to go in and say please do the use the app delegate and what i'm asking you to do here inside the app delegate uh, let's see register app delegate that should be there already yep and then this is uh, well first up we're going to change this class so don't do the app, ns application delegate class do this class which is the xamarin forms class and now it's going to get all confused because it doesn't have xamarin forms so bring in these two namespaces so we are asking AppKit not to do its thing so we can paint the ui with xamarin forms right so we have an app delegate and it's still confused and complaining so this piece of code here is where is this supposed to go app delegate right so what this is doing is creating an ns window which is exactly what mac uses to create a desktop application and we are saying create the window but let us do your own thing uh, so, oh, so you're being compared to Bob Ross. You are the yes, yes, Bob I, Ross of XAML and Xamarin. I, I, I accept. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, so Xamarin forms on a Mac. That's good. Why is it not liking my window? Oh, I never created the window. Okay, so it's an NS window. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. So there's my window. And now this is my window. Now this is like where your, um, this is the X and the Y of where the window starts out. This is the desktop application. And this is the size of the window. So we can control this, so we can change it if we need to. Um, and then these two lines of code is what we need in here. So we can new up Xamarin Forms. So forms.init, this is what we use to new up the Xamarin Forms runtime and the framework. Oh, hey, we got to stop here for a second because you know what's coming in. No, wait a second. Is that a raid? I think it's a raid. From who? I mean, there's a lot of emotes if it's not a raid. <laughs> wait a second. I'm, I'm not watching the stream. I, I want to see you. And now people are saying, ah, no dark mode. Yeah, it was a raid from C Sharp Fritz in oh, the house. Oh, 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 okay. Hang on, hang on. We gotta do stuff. Thank you, darling. Thank you. Thank you, thank Welcome, you, folks. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our Silverlight stream of the Sun day. Sunsetting where... Silverlight stream. So, yeah. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fritz. Thank you, thank you. So, what we're doing here is migrating Silverlight apps uh, and trying to look into our options here. And thank you for the follows. Uh, we appreciate all of you. Thank you. So um, at this point, let's see where we are. So we have this one here, which is initializing our um, Xamarin forms, and we want to load up the, this application, and that's it. So uh, let's look at the docs and see what we missed. Uh, Everyone's so upset with your light mode, but I'm such a, a light mode fan. I, I know, like, sp especially on I streams. Like I, I am all light mode on streams. Like. Like when you're doing like presentations, I can see like dark mode is much better, but I don't know. I, I like uh, light mode. Okay, so uh, let's see. Did we confuse it all? Let's do a build. Oh, I see subs. Thank you, thank you. Oh, one error. Why are you complaining? Okay, so we got main CS. Thank you for all the follows and all the emotes. I appreciate you. So let's see what did we miss. Uh, we have a Mac app that we added. Then we added a reference to our .NET standard uh, library. And then we have an app delegate. Uh, app delegate. Why is it complaining? It does not into any. Shall we do a full build? If you think it'll help, <laughs> but I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's always a good place to start, right? Like, let's yes. just restart all the things. 
It's thinking. So um, while it's thinking, yeah. can you give us a brief recap just for the people who joined yes, us? Yes, yes. So we are talking about sunsetting Silverlight. Later yeah. on today, I'll be on with my good friend John, and we'll be talking about how you can migrate um, from Silverlight to Angular and the web stack. Yes, your chart. Awesome. My chart. Um, but can you talk about what you are currently in right now and yeah. what you're doing? So if you have a Silverlight app today, what we talked about when we started the day was abstract things out, move it out of the app. Um, have some business logic that you have that's moved out of the UI. So you are only left um, moving and lifting and shifting the UI. Have some cloud services, whatever you want. So these are some of the options that we have. If you want to use a lot of your XAML, which is the UI stack for, um, for Silverlight, your options are all of these things like Xamarin Forms or .NET MAUI, Uno Platform, you have WPF, you have UWP, you have WinUI. All of this is going to let you reuse your um, XAML. Oh, thank you, thank you for all the subs. Uh, and then we have Blazor and all of the Angular and React and all of those things which are web technologies and that's what you use to maybe rewrite a little bit of your app, uh, the UI stack, and then you have it running on the web. But all of the XAML stuff can also run in a way on the web. Does it make sense? So we are right now uh, at the very beginning of this, uh, well, sort of, like Xamarin Forms. I'm trying to get this to work everywhere. And then we're going to look at Uno and WPF and other things. Okay. Yeet. Short recap. Uh, so it does not like my app delegate at all. Let's see, what uh, is it complaining about? It is not implementing me. Oh, I see, I see. I missed something. It needs this main window. Sure. I get you. Okay, are you happy now? Yes, we are happy. Okay, so if you notice here, Alyssa, I did not write any Mac specific code other than just these lines of code. The uh, um, the alerts are going nonstop in my ear. So thank you, everybody. We love you. <laughs> Well, hang on, if you're giving us so much love... Hang on, I got a robotic love voice. Here we go. <laughs> we love you all. We love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, we did not write anything Mac specific, but in our XAML, which is for Xamarin Forms, we did have some UI, which was rendering a list view. So, will this just magically work on a Mac? Because now you're talking desktop versus the web. So, fingers crossed. Let's see. Start. It's thinking. It's building. Uh, I am in VS uh, for Mac here, folks. Um, and we are trying to build out this app that hopefully runs everywhere. Okay, where is it? Is it running? Oh, it stopped somewhere. Okay. Oh, I'm using uh, Newtonsoft JSON for my JSON serialization. I never gave it the NuGet package, so it's like I don't know how to serialize I, JSON. I, how did you How did you figure that out? Or well, did hit, you see it? Yeah, I hit debug and it stopped right here. So yeah, I'll, I'll hit it again. So it stopped right there and says I don't know what this thing is. So I don't know how to uh, serialize JSON anymore. So that's an easy fix. All we have to do oh. is go into NuGet packages and bring in our beloved Newtonsoft JSON. Now, I know folks are going to say, this is built into C Sharp. We don't have to do this anymore. I get it. But I, I don't know how many times I have to say this, but I'm old. I'm really old. And I'm You're not. <laughs> I'm You're like two years older than me. I'm Why do you keep saying I'm that? I'm stuck to my ways. Okay. All right. Let's try this again. Okay. Uh, hopefully, we don't have Also, uh, if you all have not, uh, we are going at least three, four more hours today. And there is a survey floating around. Yes, Nightbot yes. will share it with you. Um, we're giving away prizes. Prizes! So please, Yay. fill out the survey, win some prizes. Check back in later if you can't stay for the whole day. But um, yeah, we love you all. We love you all. Okay. Do you see what I have here? This is a native Mac desktop application, right? Same exact list view. It looks a little different, um, but I can, I can scroll through. So this is the power of XAML. This is the portability of XAML. So I can take uh, XAML markup that was meant for 
pure mobile, iOS and Android, and I can make it run on desktop stuff. Like this is a Mac application. It behaves like a Mac application. You can, you, you see it in your, in your, um, uh, what's the thing called? Like the, uh, wherever you have it at the bottom for all the Mac apps, it is just like a Mac app and it'll behave like a Mac application. So do you, are you with me, Lisa? You see what I'm doing here? So we are literally just uh, porting Silverlight code. I do, but I'm a little confused on, so all the only issue we had um, was that one bug, like after you didn't have to do any other magic? No, or... it was just missing like this reference here. Like I brought in, uh, I'm doing some JSON serialization. I just did not know how to do that. So I just brought in that one thing. So again, uh, folks who are just, if you're just joining us, we are taking a, a sample Silverlight app, which is this dig sample from Scott Guthrie way back in the days in 2008. And we're trying to move this to as many platforms as we can. So right now we have iOS, we have Android covered because we moved some of the UI to uh, some of the Silverlight UI to being in Xamarin forms. And now we also have Mac. So we have a little bit of desktop, right? Alyssa, are you with me so far? And if you wanted to like play around with some Silverlight code, this is great. I'm, I'm going to post this here uh, so maybe folks can see. I'm, you're going to see me pull up Twitch. And if I can, there you go. So that's what we are using um, to uh, port. Very, very nice. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, I'll look at some custom UI as well and see how we port that. How are we doing on time? Oh, uh, about an we hour. have about 15 40, minutes. 50 minutes left. Yeah. All right. And then we have lunch uh, with some fun folks, and then you can see some Angular and some .NET. Angular. Yes, we You're going to want to stick around. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is the uh, dummy um, uh, JSON uh, placeholder place we went in to get some restful endpoint. Uh, now I'm going to do something more fun here. So this is all very Mac and iOS specific. This is all Apple stuff, right? Oh, what's funny? I got to look. Uh... You said more fun. <laughs> like there could be more fun than XAML. <laughs> How else can you have any more fun? Wait, uh... I'm old. I'm old. I'm telling you. <laughs> okay, tell us the more fun part. I'm excited. <laughs> Let's close this and we're going to take this same exact project over to the Windows family. Okay, so I'm going to close this, right? And to do this, I'm going to do something that Alyssa, I know you absolutely love, and that is what? Your, that is running Windows in a VM. <laughs> don't do it, Sam. I'm, I'm going to do don't, it. Don't do it. <laughs> it's fine. It's parallels. It's going to make my fans just okay. go explode. Hang but on, it's hang on, hang on, hang on. You fun. told me. <laughs> first that we were going to have more fun and now you're opening a windows, windows. vm on your mac <laughs> yes i think we need That'll to redefine <laughs> all of my things. version of fun okay <laughs> windows 10 on my mac it runs all day and the fans just go nuts but it works <laughs> turtle guy just redeemed hide an egg in your code good luck <laughs> good luck <laughs> okay i'll try let me just come up Yay, beautiful sunset, which is appropriate because we are sunsetting silver light. Also, I'm really scared. I'm like... Okay, my, my Mac is not going to explode. It's fine. It's it's just... Look at this. Like, look how cool it is. I have all of my Mac dock right here, and then I have all my Windows 10 stuff right here. Again, cool? <laughs> okay, how, <laughs> how, how about this? Like, when I run this stuff on my ultra-wide monitor, I have a 37-inch curved ultra-wide, it has a picture-in-picture -picture mode. So I can split the monitor, and I can look at Mac on half of it and Windows on another half of it. I, I'm going this... to start a hyperbole <laughs> if you keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, like, so much stress. Like, yes. I, I feel like I okay, if the stream goes down... You all know it's because Sam was insane and thought he could do this. That's all. That's I'm just putting that out there. All right. I hear you. We'll be fine. Okay, check this out. So I'm on a VM, so I have full access to my host OS, which is my Mac. So I'm going to go to projects and bring in the thing that we just did. Silverlight migration with Xamarin Forms, right? And the only reason I'm doing this, I, I should not really have to, but I'm just a little cautious that Windows, if you pull up a code base that's sitting on a network drive, like some of the builds get a little confused. 
Uh, so I'm just bringing it to be a local uh, thing on Windows, okay? So I'm gonna go in here, which is where most of my apps or my projects live, and I'm just gonna do a paste. So this is copying our Xamarin forms and our Mac application from my Mac and just moving it over into C drive in Windows, just so I have it local. I totally can do it remote, but I have seen like builds get a little confused sometimes. So we'll give it a second and it's done. So now, let's say you're gonna see me do the same exact thing. See that solution file? This is the beauty of Mac and Windows portability. I can double click and guess who opens it? Visual Studio 2019. It's the exact same solution file, exact same uh, CSproj files, uh, user settings. It's all carried over. It doesn't matter what OS you use anymore. So I can be on Windows, you can be on Mac, we can work on projects together, which is fun. Or you can be on your <laughs> whack. <laughs> All right, Get it? Um, Windows, Mac, whack. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I hear you. Okay, so it complained about a few things. That's fine. Incompatible? Come on, it's not incompatible. Okay, it's trying to decide. Yeah, I don't want to update Visual Studio right now. Go away. Oh, what is Edge telling me here? Oh, migration reported. Tried some migrations and failed. Okay, I'm not trying to migrate anything here. Just stay also, with me. Also, I need you all to know that I drink a gallon of water before <laughs> 2 p.m. every day, and I'm like, You really have a there. gallon of, jug of water? No, I, I like legit drink a gallon of water before 2 every day. So if you all are hanging out and you're like, mm, man, I haven't had a sip of water in the last couple hours, that's on you, Bob. That's on you. So. <laughs> Please hydrate. <laughs> all right. So let's see if we can make this work. So we're taking the same project and mm, Shall I do .NET Framework? I think it's .NET Framework. So now we are doing WPF, which is pure Windows, pure desktop. Uh, now before I hit OK, I'm going to look this up as well, just so I don't miss anything. So if I do Xamarin Forms on WPF. All right, so this is the doc. Um, yep, yeah, it shows .NET Framework. So next. And now we can do SL migration is what we call it through Xamarin Forms. Oops. Xamarin Forms dot WPF. So we are literally adding heads to our Xamarin Forms solution. And this one runs on full.net framework 4.7. That's fine. Create. All right. So you have a bunch of things coming up, which I know can be scary, but we'll get rid of it. We don't want the designer, we want XAML, okay? So we'll stay here and we'll do a few things here first. Um, let's look up docs. We need to bring in some NuGet packages. We need the renderers that know how to do stuff for, for WPF, okay? And that's called xamarinforms.platform.wpf, okay? So we're gonna make this our startup project and we are going to do NuGet packages again. And we're gonna to go to NuGet source and search for, not the installed ones, let me just browse. So I'm gonna do xamarin.forms.platform. And where is it? This one here, WPF. So what this does, Alyssa, is it just gives you the renderers so it can take the same XAML that we had in Xamarin Forms and just render them now, not on a Mac, not on iOS, but on WPF. Yes, accept the licenses, please. And it added a bunch you of things. You have 10 minutes, darling. What happened? Oh, I just saying you have 10 minutes. 10 minutes for what? Until mm, our lunch break, I think, question oh. mark? No, no, we got 40 minutes. Lunch is at 2 p.m. Eastern. Dude time zones are you sure i have no idea yep i'm in eastern we're good <laughs> okay okay <laughs> okay did i scare you at least <laughs> no i got a bunch of more things to do don't scare me 
Okay, I don't know if it added, but uh, let's look at our references. Yeah, I think that's all I need. Xamarin Forms platform. Yeah, that's all I need. Okay, now let's see what am I missing. Uh, we got that, and... Uh, oh, Xamarin Forms. Did we not include Xamarin Forms? Okay, let's do that. Uh, no, manage doing the packages. Oh, Xamarin Forms is right here. So let's go ahead and install that. Oh yeah, it already exists. Okay, thank you. So then, don't complain. Now, the other thing I will do is, um, right in here in the WPF project, we're going to add, no wait, we're going to add this as a reference. We need to add the .NET standard library. Add a reference, and we're going to go into projects and add this .NET standard library back in, okay? All right, is that all? And we added the service project and that's it. So now um, we have to deal with uh, this stuff. So right now this is, uh, this is looking very small, I bet. So let me make this bigger. Okay, so now this is a different flavor of XAML. Now you're looking at WPF XAML, which is by a lot of folks, like this is the purest XAML. This is where XAML started. <laughs> The purest. The purest. <laughs> yes. No. So this is the oldest flavor of XAML. So it's the most feature-rich XAML, and um, folks who do WPF get upset with the Xamarin Forms XAML because it's it's kind of morphed. It's different. Uh, but this is kind of classic XAML, classic Windows XAML. All right. So in here, we're going to copy a few things here just so we can make it work on um, on WPF. So first up is that assembly. So let's go in here and let's add, these are XML namespaces. All they do is know which names are which assemblies to bring in. And instead of Windows, we are going to say WPF forms application page. So take out that and do a WPF forms application page. Notice how I'm closing the tag, right? Yep, and the grid can stay. And then in the main XAML view here, Instead of a window, we're going to do uh, a forms window. So let's bring in Xamarin Forms, right? And and let's see, forms application page. Let's change that. Instead of a window, let's do a forms application page. And what else? In the initialize component, add forms.ini. So this is exactly the code we wrote for a Mac, um, except we are just going to do it for WPF here. Is that it? Uh, oh no, of course, there is no box view clock app. This app is called Silverlight Migration Xamarin Forms app. Yes, you're good. That's it. So they had a different clock application. We have our Silverlight thing. Do you think this is enough? Let's do a build. Ooh, is it scary? Are mm. we are we worried? Will are, it build? We are worried, because Visual Studio <laughs> does fight you like sometimes. like we are for sure worried. <laughs> <laughs> We're worried. Okay, fingers crossed, and let's hit start. Maybe. Oh, it came up and then it went away. <laughs> Newton stuff. It comes to bite me every time. Okay, okay. Sorry, WPF. Jeez. At least you gave me a nice uh, error. So it's missing our beloved Newton soft again. Install. All right, done, done, done. Okay, done. Now will you run? When I hit play or run, like or a .NET run, it, it does the build anyways. Hmm. This is good. Do you see what's happening here? This is, oops. Uh, Visual Studio um, minimize, but this is a native Windows application list at this point, right? This is WPF. This is what you will use if you just wrote straight up Windows desktop stuff, but we did not. We are like as in will only run on a Windows desktop. Yes, except we started from Xamarin Forms. We started from Mac. We started from iOS and Android. And I did not write a single line of Windows specific code. This is the same list view that we're just rendering now on WPF. 
So it makes sense. So this is the portability of XAML code. All we did here was uh, we changed a couple of lines of code. We brought in the references to XAML forms and we brought in the references to the project. And all we said was instead of this is the same with the Mac, like don't do your stuff. Don't paint the WPF window, let Xamarin Forms do it, and that's what these two lines of code do. Forms.init initializes Xamarin Forms, and then uh, we are newing up the same app. Make sense? So, going back to uh, our flowchart, we have covered Xamarin Forms or MAUI, which is going to be exactly the same when MAUI hits. You can write code that's SAML and C sharp, but you do have an MVU pattern, so you have some choice in how you re render the visual tree. And that's going to run on iOS, Android, Tizen, um, wearables like gear watches. It runs everywhere, Apple watches, um, and obviously uh, other things uh, like UWP and WPF, which is what we are seeing here. It runs on Mac, runs on GTK Linux. So this is all fun. So we are seeing the portability that it runs across desktop and mobile, but we have not hit web yet, right? So let's talk about the web stuff here. I'm going to close Visual Studio here and uh, pull this up one more time. And I'm going to give a shout out here because this is a community um, open source project. So go to Uno platform. This is a nice solution, actually, if you are looking to, again, shift and move and shift some of Silverlight stuff. So this is multi-platform UI that's in C Sharp and XAML. And this uses, at least this has got to be confusing because this is confusing for us having done dotnet or be in the ecosystem for like yeah, there needs to be another word 15 years a step above confusing <laughs> baffling here we go okay so these are all different dialects of xaml it is xaml as a visual tree that you are writing a markup language but each of them have their own twists they just call things differently and it's just a little frustrating at times but a label is called a text block sometimes. Um, so they're just minor differences. But WinUI or Windows XAML is actually just almost the same as WPF XAML. So if you really wanted the Windows XAML, then start with when you, uh, you own a platform. They will take you to Mac, they will take you to iOS, Android, and they will take you some other place. That's interesting. So I'm going to go in here and um, wait, where can We're I still live, right? Yeah, of course. Okay, cool. Well, what happened? <laughs> yeah, we left. I just saw a buffering thing, and I was like, "Did your VM take our stream down, darling?" Yeah, but we I think we're good. I we're just good. saw we're a buff. <laughs> yeah, so, no, we're still good. Okay, so um, open. No, I want to create a new project. Okay. So this is where I have a template that anyone can go and get. This is Uno platform. I do not ooh no 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 just uno all right here we go so uno platform gives you these things called cross platform uno platform projects and do next so let's do silverlight migration uno yeah, you can create the app there create and I'll show you what this does because it opens up like two more runtimes uh, that are quite fun <laughs> use it fun again <laughs> <laughs> You're all quickly yeah. realizing my version of fun is a oh, different. Oh, so realizing, <laughs> so realizing. You know, I thought, I thought state management in uh, in Angular was a hard problem to solve. <laughs> was I wrong? <laughs> okay, so this does a whole bunch of things, and I can minimize some of it and walk you through as to what is happening, and you can see the build taking a slightly longer time here. So you see this one here, this little piece of code here, it's starting up things here. I don't want to click on that. Oh yeah, Android. I can get rid of the Android thing. I don't think I have all of the Android pieces. Yeah, the Android piece is gone. Okay, so it's updating Xcode tools, checking Xcode. Now, connection to SAM MVP. Oh. Um, your face is blocking the thing that I'm trying to show. It's it's, it's in my bottom corner of my screen. <laughs> yeah, no, no, not you, Alyssa. It's just you're in that left corner. That corner. No, this corner. I'll leave. I'll leave. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're fine. Please stay. So what <laughs> it is trying to do is uh, it sees a bunch of things and it wants to do a build. So um, actually, let me make this one my startup project and I'll walk you through what it's trying to do. 
So right up here, it sees that uh, it's got an Android project, an iOS project, a Mac project, which we already saw in Xamarin Forms. So let me get rid of the Android project because I think I don't have all of the bits needed to run Android here on, on, um, on Windows. So what it tries to do is like, it, for it to run an iOS project, it needs to do a build. It needs to talk to Xcode to go get the apps built. And it doesn't have Xcode here, so it actually, uh, this is the nice thing about being on a VM. So Windows knows that there is a Mac OS as a host. So it can actually connect to the host and it can actually send off the bits uh, to Xcode to do the build and come and run it here. So that's how uh, iOS projects run. But this one here is uh, a universal Windows project. And if I look at the shared repo here, take a look at uh, the main page uh, .xaml, which is the markup. Okay, so we'll make this bigger again. Okay, we got 30 minutes. I got to show some Blazor stuff because we had questions about that and we have to keep Ed happy uh, with Blazor. So take a look at this one here. So this is a grid. This is using a text block. So this is where some of the annoying differences in XAML come in. Had this been XAML forms, you will just call it a label. But this one is a text block and it just says hello world. And this is the shared code. There is no platform specific code for iOS, Android or anything else. But this one is a universal Windows platform app. So if I hit run here, hopefully what you're going to see is this running as a UWP application. And again, this is XAML, so you can bring in like a Silverlight um, uh, XAML view and try to run. Now, don't forget the Easter egg, yo. That was a while ago. But... Okay, okay, yeah, hang on. Maybe I'll do it <laughs> when I'm back on my Mac. I'll be oh, right it's... back, darling. <laughs> okay, yep, I'll be right here. All right, folks, it is trying to do a quick build, and all the projects are good to go, so uh, can I run it? Can I run it? Why are you not running it? Okay, I'll do a full build. Rebuild. It's restoring projects and packages. Let me take a quick look at chat while it's doing it. All of you are here. Let me take a quick look. I'm missing some of the chat context here, folks. Sorry, I'm trying to get as much as done as I can. In half an hour, we break for lunch. Okay, what did I do wrong that it does not build? Or maybe it is building. Uh, can you do a build? It is doing a build. Okay. I guess we just have to give it a few minutes because it is talking to Xcode on my Mac and it's trying to do a build. Rebuild all succeeded. Yay. See, if I turn off Alyssa here, you can then see the corner. But I don't want to take her off. Okay, there. Um, and now you can see the corner. Okay. So why don't we wait for Alyssa to come back because I do want to have to uh, have her see the hooray moment of having this run. Yeah, she's coming back. Hello there. I'll, I'll go on record. Hello, hello. I'll go on record, Alyssa, to say something like you're like we all stream, we all do virtual events nowadays, but you, your voice is just so calming. Like when you say "darling," it's gonna be okay. You like you really believe it's gonna be okay. You have such a calming <laughs> influence. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, birthday hats. Okay, so what did I miss? Tell me everything. Did you get it compiled? I did. So it rebuilt and it's thinking, but it's not running. Okay. Stop without debugging. It's doing something, but then it's stopping. No, where is it? Okay. So it doesn't like UWB for some reason, but let's try this one here. I want to make this the startup project. And let's see if this will work. It's thinking, coming along. Do you see what it's doing? 
This is a Posture browser. Posture check was redeemed by Terry Terry. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm, okay. I, I, I said this yesterday. So the bad thing about standing desks is you stand a lot. So I just choose not to stand. I do have a standing desk. Wait, um, what? <laughs> so I have oh, one of those old I school... See. like. You're saying you stand too much? I, I, I used to, but I've just gotten lazy. So I have a very desk, which is like an old school thing. So my desk is a standalone desk that doesn't go up and down, but you I have, have the very desk. desk. Yeah, this used to be a big thing. Like you could put it on top of any desk and then part of it, like it's it comes in layers and then part of it goes up and down. Um, so like, that's what can I can do. spell it? Yeah, it's a V A R I and then desk. I think they have renamed the company, but they still make the same thing. So these are all like portable uh, standing desks. So you can just put it on top of anything, and then part of it just goes up and down. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Now, Alyssa, do you see what what's happening here? This is Hello, Chrome. World. This is Chromium. So now we have Web back, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not writing any HTML to do this. This is pure XAML, pure C sharp. What? That's how can that be Chrome? Me, you're on a. I'm on Windows, but this is uh, this is Edge. This is Microsoft Edge. It runs on Chromium. Same okay, exact. Okay, so yeah. Don't engine. try to fool us <laughs> by saying we're on Chrome but when in fact we're on Edge. Some similar things. The same engine, same uh, JavaScript engine. Okay, it's different, but the, the crux of it is the same. So this is a browser app now, right? Uh, so this hello world is literally coming from our um, our XAML here, right? So XAML is very much welcome back on the web, but just done right this time without any plugins. So anything that you see that's a XAML forms, uh, and, and in fact XAML forms also has renderers for the web. This is the Uno renderer. So anything that you see doesn't edge you chakra instead of V8. Not anymore. No, uh, they have switched uh, to all in on on uh, on Chromium, and I think they have replaced their JavaScript engine as well. I may be wrong. Don't quote me, but I think they have. So what I'm trying to say is, all of your um, Xamarin Forms UI. I got 20 minutes left. No. So you got all, this. I got this. Yeah. So all of this stuff, everything that we saw here. Uh, in in terms of views all of this stuff no this stuff this stuff yeah all of this stuff can be rendered on the web because there are renderers for it from xamarin forms and from uno so all of this is pure xaml move your uh, silverlight assets over make them friendlier uh, change the, the namespaces and they will start working on the web is it automatic no it's going to be a painful manual process but it's it's there for you to work does that make sense, Alyssa? So I showed off, uh, what did we do? We did Xamarin Forms, we did Uno, WPF, you saw that running straight up. You can do straight up WPF, nothing's stopping you, but then you're gonna be stuck just to Windows Desktop. But then if you did Xamarin Forms, it automatically works on, on WPF. So why would oh, you do that? Okay. And UWP, that's just Windows UI. It works with Uno platform. You can again do it straight up, just UWP, or you can do Xamarin Forms and then it'll render on UWP. Make sense? So quite a few things going, and I want to spend the last 20 minutes doing a little more, more of the web stuff, okay? So before you dive into web, we have redeemed highlight message, and it's from Sarah, and I think it should be accompanied by perhaps a bit of a ditty. Okay. Uh, once you find it and you highlight it. Okay, well, what am I doing? Uh, highlighting you... what? I'm, I'm uh, looking in the, the chat. But maybe we not are highlighting it. the message from Sarah that says, oh, it's oh. this Rose's birthday. Oh, hey. Happy, happy, happy birthday, darling. And thank you so much for being such a wonderful presence and an awesome team member. We love having you, and I hope that you have an incredible day. <laughs> Absolutely. Confetti for you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. You're incredible. We love you. You know that. So thank you for being around our stream so much uh thank you for everything that you do okay so on that note let me get out of my vm so i'm not hurting your eyes anymore See, we all I'm... thank you the world <laughs> thanks you it, goodbye so, whack <laughs> windows wants to update now which is just wonderful just goodbye okay. whack <laughs> we've loved having you on the stream <laughs> we'll, let, we'll let it do that okay 
Now, let me show you uh, one more thing, and that is Blazor. And how would you do stuff in Blazor? So let me pull up um, Telerik.com. I want to show you just a snippet of some custom UI and how easy it is to port and where some of the differences lie. So I'm going to go to Silverlight, and our demos will obviously not load up here, but we have IE tab, so it loads up inside of a shell. Come on. You can do it. There you go. You can do things like um, uh, like the loading up of the application could also be animated. You had a lot of flexibility and power in Silverlight. So we have some sample apps that are, those are big. What, what I want to do is maybe just choose like uh, a small section of it. And I know it's too small. So let's make this a little bigger. There you go. Okay, so let's start with like, the first one, autocomplete box. So this is a pure Silverlight uh, app that you're looking at. And um, when I do a movie, I'm guessing like, oh, there you go, Matrix. This, Matrix this is the favorite movie for everybody. It has to be, right? <laughs> But this is just like one control. Like if you had like Silverlight UI that was built by Telerik or somebody else, I'm sure there can be ways to bring it over and make it work. Uh, as long as there, there are corresponding UI elements that are custom for each platform, like WPF, like UWP or Xamarin Forms. So if you had to lift and shift this one, the nice thing is like we also give you the code as to how we are rendering this. And this, if you look at um, Alyssa, it's going to look a little busy, but this is again just C Sharp and XAML. So this is the XAML markup, and somewhere in here, you are going to notice that we have, um, somewhere right here, is the autocomplete box, right? And this has like a watermark, it has a search mode, uh, item source that it's bound to, so it knows exactly what uh, items to bind against and show and so on. So this is pure XAML. And then I think like we have a movie collection. So we are filling up all the collection here. There's a data.cs, which is just adding a whole bunch of songs and music, which we don't have to go to. But I'm just showing you just like one piece of UI from straight up from Silverlight. And how would you recreate that in other modern apps like Blazor? So let's go to Blazor. And um, Let's pull up Terminal. Now, this is more friendly territory for you, Alyssa, right? Let me show you modern .NET. It doesn't need to be the .NET from like 15 years back. This is modern and this is all good. So I'm going to go into uh, one of my folders where I like to keep stuff. So if I do a .NET new, so this is pure command line tools. What it pulls up is a bunch of templates that .NET can be. So these are your WPF applications. It can also be started with like uh, terminal. It can be uh, unit tests. It can be MVC. It can be ASP.NET Core, and it can be Blazor. So I think I do have Blazor. Where is my Blazor stuff? Blazor. So Blazor server app and Blazor web assembly app. So Blazor Wasm is the command line to create a Blazor application. So let's do that. Uh, let me make a directory first. So make directory, let's call it Silverlight migration to Blazor. Redeemed highlight my message, darling. Uh oh. Okay. Which also, one? you said Wasm like it was a. Wasm is the short for web assembly. Mm. Which one? Your movie references? No, no. Uh, oh. Mr. Schmoofy redeemed. Highlight my message. Ah, I see. Where is Mr. Schmoofy? Which one? I don't see you. Uh, it's like the second to last one that says "Happy Birthday, Miss Rose." Ah, sorry about that. There you go. There you go. Well, it's just redeemed. You're totally fine. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure you saw it. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we're going to create a Blazor migration thing, and we are going to go inside of that. All right, and now we're going to do .NET new, and what was it called? Blazor Wasm. This is in Ed's territory here, but we're going to go in, and it's going to spit out the project. It's a template, just like the same as using file new project. And it's done. So we're going to do a .NET restore. And it's done. So now we're going to do a .NET run. Oh, you can't see the top of my terminal because... We can't? Uh, no, oh, this is... Do you uh, mean the bottom of the terminal? At the bottom of the terminal. I'm sorry. There you go. 
<laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so what it's doing, uh, so what I did was I did .NET new Blazor Wasm, and then I did a .NET restore, and I did a .NET run. So this is like a modern .NET list, it doesn't need to be Visual Studio and coming in with so much of craft and cer ceremony, it can all be just terminal. So it's saying I'm running on my localhost 5000. So let's go to localhost 5000. And what you see here is a Blazor application. Again, folks who are doing .NET, folks who do Blazor know this inside out. This is the standard uh, Blazor application. And if I if I even know the shortcut, what's the thing to pull up DevTools? Command Shift I. Oh, there you go. Yep. So this is a counter. And if I do a refresh, you can see what we're pulling down. We're just pulling down um, uh, some JS files and just the runtime. And some of it is already cached. So as I keep hitting this. You're going to make your DevTools uh, font a little bit larger. How do I do that? Well, I mean, I I'm not uh, showing anything else more than like what it's pulling down. It's just WebAssembly JS and just, just that. .NET JS and, and just the runtime. So what I'm trying to show is like when I keep hitting that click me button, we never come back to the server. So this is purely running client side, C sharp, right? With me? I so this, yeah. this is Blazor, this is Blazor, but can you just move uh, a, a Silverlight app onto Blazor? The answer is yes and no, but you need to know exactly where the differences lie, right? So I'm gonna stop this and go back to terminal mm, stop that and I do have VS code in my path so let me close the VS code that we had running and let's just do code dot so now it pulls up my application which is the Silverlight Brazor migration and it has a bunch of stuff here uh, but uh, it's all, this is all very like react ish so if I look at the pages here, the, these are components. So this is the counter component that we're looking at. So we have a button that when you click on it, the code that runs when you um, clicked on that button, this is all C-sharp and it's all running in browser. So this is all fine. This is just straight up Blazor out of the box, but what can Silverlight do with this? So let's bring in a little bit of love. And to do that, I'm gonna do, well, now let's go back to my solution here. I am going to drop a NuGet package here just so I can get our bits um, inside of it. So I'm going to copy this uh, from another project if I can find it. Uh, where was it? No, it's in CLI here. So let's do uh, this and I'm going to copy this NuGet file which essentially just points to our NuGet server so I can pull in uh, a package. And where is the Silverlight Migration Blazor app? This one here. I'm going to just drop it here. So that way I have a NuGet config. And now, let me pull up uh, documentation here just so I'm not missing stuff. So let's go to our Blazor docs and we talk about what we have to do. We got 12 minutes before lunchtime, okay? So we'll try to do this in 12 minutes. What are you doing for lunch, Sam? I don't know. Frozen? <laughs> You don't know? I don't know. I have things planned been... out for like five days in advance. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> okay, so this is how you do this in Visual Studio, which, uh, okay, so we have to bring in that NuGet feed first. Okay, let's do that. Um, so if we go in here, uh, where is our CS proj? Here are our project references. And we're going to do a package reference include equals and here's what I'm going to type Telerik come on Telerik dot UI dot four dot blazer okay and I do know the latest version is 2.16 I think okay I think that's it. Um, so now let's do a .NET restore. So it brings in, oh no, you get confused not valid path. Huh, ah, uh, ah, uh, okay. All right. So <laughs> you are gonna see me pull up 
uh, something I was hoping not to pull up. So the, CL, the CLI tools don't like your password to be encoded. So it is, I think, in clear text. So let me see what did I do wrong. So I'm here in Blazor. I'm going to open this up one time. In maybe Sublime. Sublime? You still have that downloaded? What? I do. None of that looks different. I still have it. Yeah, it's, it's my like quick <laughs> notepad edits. Okay, well, what is it not liking? Uh, that is the right position. Can I begin with a question mark? Hmm. Okay, can I uh, turn off my desktop for one second? Because I do want to do open it, it up. Because it, it, does, it, it, it does actually have my uh, clear text password. So, yeah. bear with me. One second. I'm not doing anything voodoo, just opening up that file so I can look at it. Hang on, hang on, hang on. So while he's hunting for that, uh, we've got a lot of chat about movies that are better than The Matrix. So far we have Goodfellas, uh, Freaky Friday, and what was the other one? Something about a pelican. Pelican brief? I haven't seen two out of three of those, so I, I gotta catch up. Uh, we're also talking about season two of some show. And Terry's making fun of me for eating carrots for lunch. So, there's that. Okay. Oh, Ed thinks Ragnarok's better than The Matrix. Ragnarok's is funny, and it's, it's got a lot of puns. Wait, okay. funny? I thought it was like a... It, it is... Chop, chop. It, it is, but it, it's, got a lot of, funny? <laughs> it's got a lot of puns. Oh, okay. okay, so, darling, since we have eight minutes, I'm going to switch, okay? Because I do not know what is wrong with that particular Nougat file. It's not able to pull down uh, the thing that I wanted it to. So, I'm going to close this and go to a project that I know I have it right, okay? So, close folder. And You've done, like... 12 demos today if only one of them doesn't work i'm no, like no, i'm trying it's like a win that's a win <laughs> all right i'm gonna go to this one here mm, yeah let's open up this one see i did this one has the ui full blazer 2.16 that should be right okay hang on one second let's make this bigger and if I can go into CLI, and this one here is the Blazor Wasm Hello World. So what now, is wrong with you, Ed? Sorry, you keep going. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's try it up and restore here. See if that works. Okay, it's completely about something, but maybe it. Uh, hmm. It is looking at the right nuget config file, but it's complaining about a character that I don't have. <laughs> okay, does it run actually? Let me see. No. Build failed. Ah. Okay, what is it about the nuget config that it's not liking? Because here's what I'm trying to do here, okay? So if I get the nuget file right, I'm going to make this a little bigger. The next step is to um, pull in these things that uh, a Blazor application needs, and that is make sure you're using static files so we can pull in the, uh, the Telerik Blazor JS file that has whatever little JavaScript we need to do and, and, and the uh, interrupt to JavaScript. Then we Someone's pull in... asking if NuGet 3.1 is too old. No, this is, this is just the command line tools. This is using the standard .NET restore tools. Um, so it's something about the NuGet config that it's not liking. Uh, Listen, it was closer. It was more debugging than I could have given you. So. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, it's, it's something about yeah that that it's just not liking for some reason. Yeah, and it won't let me run. Um, but let's let's just talk through this. It's, it, that's fine. So we essentially put in one JavaScript file, one CSS file, and then we add uh, the Telerik Blazor 
um, as uh, a middleware so we know how to paint our stuff and then we add our using references and then we add our root component beyond that it can be any component that you want to throw in so this one is doing like a button so that button shows up here i do wish i could just show it it's just pulling in that one nougat feed i don't know why it's failing on me because uh, it does go to nougat.org.telaric and let me try one one last time okay uh where am i one last time we got five minutes we good also i want everyone to know in chat that i am this is the last of the gallon <laughs> so again if you have not been drinking water Please that's do. a gallon in like under three hours so good for you. that <laughs> good for you okay that's my is it complaining about this question mark at the end can't be Okay, maybe. No, it is not liking my nougat file, so it can bring it in. Okay, all right, I, I give up on this one, um, but let's talk through, okay? So once you do all of this stuff, you are going to see all of the components just light up uh, because now you have all of the bits necessary. And let's look at where the differences are and or how easy this is to bring in. So if I look at the autocomplete here, so we had an autocomplete box here in Silverlight and you see the code for it. It's just rad autocomplete box. And then we set the item source to a list of something that we can match against so we can provide the uh, suggestions. And um, then you have, uh, I can pull up our demos, right? Real quick, uh, the Blazor demos. And then I can show you what the autocomplete looks like for, for Blazor. And where is it, where is it, where is it? Uh, autocomplete. So this one is like state, okay? So uh, <laughs> the Chrome is coming in the way of uh, showing stuff. Yeah, Chrome is everywhere. Uh, so you, you can see, like, it's just a drop down of things. Uh, is there another demo that I can show, which is not? Um... I only have three more minutes, so I yes. think it's okay. Okay, so there you go. Now you see the drop down. So this, these are all the states. So it's tied to a list of things, right? So take a look at the difference in code. So this is Silverlight. So it's generic. This is the namespace. And then you'll say rad autocomplete. If this rad thing surprises you, uh, Alyssa, this is because we were just rad. This was back in the <laughs> days when we started off, everything was rad because it was rapid application development. So all of our components are just, were just used to be called rad this. So rad grid rad autocomplete rad everything and that's how we had it so you had a rad autocomplete box and a bunch of properties that and the important one is the item source that showed you exactly what to bind against then you had item templates that controlled exactly how the rows would look like as compared to now you look at things for blazer and we have the docs here up oh, yep see the, the docs here so take a look at this one this one here is just straight up telaric autocomplete and then you have data and uh, this is add suggestions and the data is coming from this suggestions thing so if you were looking for a drop down that has like what's your role uh, and you you provide a list of suggestions right here that's what you're binding to mm -hmm. so it's not one on one but you compare and you contrast and you pull in and you change exactly the things you need to change so if you were to bring in this autocomplete box this whole one line of code from a silverlight app into a blazer application then take out the Telerik, take out the namespaces, which we don't need, and then take out all of the properties that don't make sense. And instead of saying an item source, now you say data. Instead of saying uh, whatever you're binding it to, uh, like it had some bindings right here. Maybe this one does not have bindings, but we, we do bindings in-, in Oh no, in we just Sarah. had to hide an egg in your code redeemed again. Oh no, <laughs> and I'm out of time. But maybe you can, maybe you, uh, you and John can do this so for Angular. Yes, so uh, Jay Witt, Wit witty wit witty uh i will totally take that egg and hide it and whenever i come back from our lunch break because we are about to go. transition over to ed and carl and yeah. um, they'll do some chatting not coding but i promise i'll do the egg and it'll be there so delicious 
later on. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is it's not a one-on-one -on -one match. Bring it over, Bring copy your Silverlight UI code and see what needs to change. These properties are about the same. Uh, the, the names are about the same, but just change it up, change up the namespaces. And then you have a modern Blazor application that runs on any modern browser has the potential of running on desktop through Electron, has the potential of running on Xamarin Forms, because we do have Blazor bindings on top of Xamarin Forms. So the world is our oyster. So what I was trying to say and do is you have a lot of choice. And let me move this over a little bit so it's not blocked by your camera here. We went through Xamarin Forms. We went through Uno platform. We saw WPF, we saw um, UWP, and we saw Blazor. All of these are very good potential solutions. It all comes down to what does your team want to do and where do you want to see your app run? And yes, it's going to be a little manual until we have automated tools coming and that can migrate several apps, but it's never going to be like a silver bullet that just does everything magically. So you need to know what you're doing copy over your UI, all of your business logic, all of your services should already be abstracted out. That's like the thing you want to do now. And then moving forward, just copy over your UI, see what breaks and just translate that to the UI for whichever platform you're running it. I love that. See what breaks. Yeah, see what breaks. <laughs> exactly. Oh my goodness. So we uh, need to transition now over to our lunchtime guests. Yeah. But uh, please tune in afterwards in about 30 minutes. I'll be back on with John and we'll be doing Angular and I think what else there's other things well, other we'll, we'll do a ASP.NET web API backend with an Angular app uh, just taken taken from a Silverlight app and we're going to try to make it work with modern web stuff and then uh, the last like half an hour I think you me and John come back on and we'll talk about this flowchart again we'll talk yeah, about what we'll did we learn over, we'll yeah. kind of recap all of the options um, have some fun chatting and I think maybe do some giveaways so yeah absolutely all right <laughs> folks so uh, Thank you for sticking around with me and Alyssa throughout the morning. Um, and let's uh, take a quick break of like 30 minutes where we'll talk about uh, how the web is evolving, maybe some food. Uh, I do not know what I'm having for lunch, but I'll go find out right now in the fridge, Pro perhaps frozen, but something quick. Uh, and then we'll see you on the other side. So um, I will let Ed and Carl take over. So thank you, folks. Awesome. We love awesome. you. We love you. And yeah. we'll see you on the other side. Yeah, bye. Welcome everybody to the Code It Live channel here on Twitch. Uh, it is the Silver Light Sun setting event today. Yeah. We're, we're saying Ooh. goodbye to uh, what may or may not be a good friend of yours. <laughs> depends on what you've been doing over the last, uh, what is it, 10 years or something it's been around? Oh yeah, quite some time now. Yeah, it's... Um, it's not something that I ever got into myself. I've dabbled in it a little bit, but never got into Silverlight Full Steam because I was a Flash developer for a short while, and mm -hmm. I saw kind of what Flash did. And then when Silverlight came along, I was like, oh, that's more of this thing that I already don't like. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, Silverlight for me, that was uh, when I first joined Telerik in 2009. That was... You know the new exciting product right uh, before we came out with the uh, ASP.NET MVC so I was doing a lot of web forms work and when Silverlight came out uh, I, I said yeah hey this looks great this is a new cool technology uh, we're developing UI components for it so I was diving into it quite a lot and ended up doing um, a lot of user group talks around Silverlight and even uh, at a couple of conferences as well although the most confusing uh, conference time was when I did uh, Silverlight talk, and then immediately after, I did a HTML5 and CSS3 talk in the same room, and that was <laughs> quite the uh, quite the mind switch. <laughs> Just uh, ten minutes in between each session, yeah. For, you know, for me, the the things that I always weighed out when I was deciding whether I wanted to get into Silverlight or not were ultimately what caused its demise, and that was uh, I'd weigh the you know just basic web stuff versus uh should i force my users to install a plugin just so they can run something that belongs in the browser yeah right and i could never get over that hurdle myself so i just never really got into that so yeah yeah no as soon as uh as soon as you know the html5 revolution or whatever you want to say came uh, came around that's because i've always been a web developer primarily right any of the sub development i did was I want to say under duress, but it was definitely just something that I did, you know, proof of concepts here and there. 
have to write a couple for for uh, a couple of internal apps. But yeah, it, uh, as soon as that happened, I said, thank you. This is uh, <laughs> allows me to go back to what I truly enjoy doing, which is a pure web development without needing to have any plugins or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> chat room, if you could give me a quick thumbs up to whether or not this stream is actually going live properly, that would be very helpful. Um, oh, maybe it, it just finally updated. My, my stream labs or stream, uh, stream yard is what we're using. It was reporting zero viewers. So I was like, either we lost everyone. Oh no, <laughs> it's my fault at that point. There's a bug and it's, uh, it's not showing our viewers, but there they, it just showed up that we do have viewers. And, uh, uh, let's see, my volume is a little low. Maybe my microphone's a little too far back. So we'll bring that up as well. Um, and if that doesn't make it better, please let us know. And um, I will try to fix my audio so you guys can hear me better. I can also just try to get your blood pressure up, you know, so you just end up screaming at me. Yeah. And, that, you know, that will be. <laughs> yeah, so as silver light sunsets, I'm looking forward to Blazer myself. We've mentioned it a few times here. Uh, it looks like I'm still a little low. Let me bump up my microphone as we chat a little bit here. Um, but I'm actually working on uh, a talk for an a online conference that's coming up called Codepalooza, and I'm going to talk about uh, how we actually need some JavaScript developers to come with us to Blazor and, and help build some things. Ooh. So that should be interesting. Is that going to... Uh, yeah, I'm not aware of the, uh, the format of the event. Is that something that's going to be streamed for everybody, or do we need to sign up ahead of time? Um, yeah, so if you go to codepalooza.com, I'll put a link in the in the notes. And uh, you, you can get the uh, full agenda there and also uh, register for tickets if you need to get those. But I'll be speaking at Codepalooza twice. Uh, but once about uh, JavaScript in the, the uh, Blazor ecosystem. So the gist of the talk is uh, where we need JavaScript developers so that we don't need to write JavaScript. So the idea there is, uh, you know, Blazor helps us build these applications with, um, without the need for writing JavaScript. But under the covers, there's actually some JavaScript taking place to, to make some things happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's still some APIs that aren't directly supported by Blazor itself through C Sharp. So we need some help patching some of those things together. Yeah, uh, makes sense. Yeah, so uh, at least uh, they, they can be behind the scenes uh, cranking out all the JavaScript that, that we need. Uh, so uh, there's not as much uh, needed on the on the front end there for, for Blazor developers. Yeah, and I'm finding with, uh, with that sort of development, there's some interesting things that take place because you start writing some of these APIs to kind of patch things together. And um, it doesn't always pan out exactly how you think it might. Mm -hmm. So uh, you might need to kind of embrace the framework a little bit more and um, those type of things. I'm still trying to figure out why my audio is coming in low. So if you want to uh, just chat with folks here for a second while I try to figure out what exactly is going on. Yeah, of course. Could also be me being so loud. Uh, you know, I, I'm the one <clears throat> sitting in my own office yelling and screaming out loud. So maybe, maybe it could be that too. I have a feeling my levels are low, but uh, there we go. That should boost them up just a little bit there. And then let me see here if I can adjust a little bit louder on this as well and uh let me know folks if this is is helping or hurting anything here i'm trying to see my levels are coming up i think so so let me know if that fixed it um i don't know if it's i don't normally have problems with Streamyard, so it's not hurting all right so that that must have helped things a little bit there um so what, what other things have you been up to lately, Carl? Uh, we've had quite a bit of new updates roll through the Kendo UI space. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of folks that are transitioning off of Silverlight may be going to things like Angular or React. We talked yeah. a little bit about Blazor as well. 
but uh, just because we're .NET developers doesn't mean that we can't get into some JavaScript development too. Of course. Uh, what type of new stuff is coming in the, the Angular space? Yeah, so uh, in the Angular space, first of all, you know, Angular 10 support, right? Angular 10 has been out for a little bit now, but uh, for folks that haven't updated there, that's, of course, a framework jump. Uh, not that big of a jump, but still it is uh, It is something that came out. Working towards 11, of course, is most likely coming out uh, later this year, so we're working towards support for that as well as RCs will be rolling out. Uh, but other than that, we, of course, have the usual goodness of new components, new features, and everything like that. So uh, there is uh, some uh, list view that's uh, coming out that we can look forward to. Uh, also, a couple of uh, dashboard kind of type of applications, like that little nice uh, app bar that you can have at the, the top of your application, right, that might have, um, you know, the, the little hamburger icon for the drawer, uh, maybe a couple action buttons, whatever it might be, right? And essentially just helping out around uh, s setting up uh, these kind of uh, more dashboardy like applications, I guess. So, uh, and, then, and then on top of that, uh, some cool features coming out in the grid and some of the other existing components, of course. So uh, definitely going to be a fun release coming up in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, we, we've really moved along on the Blazor side of things. Uh, we saw quite a bit of new components come out mm -hmm. on our end here. And um, it's really exciting to see that framework move forward. And uh, chat room's talking about it a little bit here. Uh, there's a lot of new stuff in .NET 5 that's coming along Yeah, um, that require less JavaScript to write and uh, a lot of uh, focus on um, kind of interacting with some elements that are outside of the quote uh, uh, blazer app uh, mm -hmm. part of the the logic um, so you can control things like the title bar and stuff like that you know for seo and, and those type of things and I, i'm imagining uh, uh, angular have some stuff for that as well uh, i haven't looked at it in a while so i'm not too familiar but they they all share a similar app model where uh, you know it's a spy application so you have a certain uh, frame within the HTML that's actually rendering out the app. So anything outside of that frame kind of loses uh, context of what's happening in the application. Yeah. Now, the fun part, of course, with JavaScript is that at any point in time, you can uh, kind of eject out, right, and uh, <laughs> do whatever you want to on the, uh, the global window there, right? But yeah, uh, the, there's whatever, whenever I should say that I look at what's coming out in Blazor, the framework, as well as the components that we're working on, it's always, uh, always fun to see uh, what, what is happening in the evolution there. Uh, WebAssembly is a technology that I've always said, yes, this is going to be very interesting going forward for the web and seeing something so mainstream uh, based on that technology is, is uh, super cool to see. Yeah, circling back to the whole Silverlight conversation, I mean, that's the thing yeah. that really uh, solidifies Blazor as part of the, the next generation of tools. And, uh, you know, that's the, the fact that we don't have to install something else, you know, in, in addition, it's, it's a web standard. So we don't need like a yeah. Silverlight app runner or, or to install a Flash plugin or any of those type of things to make the application work as it's intended. So uh, that's always a big plus. Um, in the latest uh, updates I've seen, the, the fr framework as a whole is coming down in size uh, mm -hmm. and coming up in speed. So the next iteration of it should be really slick. Uh, if we kind of look back at different generations of .NET technologies, there's usually that sort of thing happening. If you look at like MVC, even web forms, you can go all the way back to web forms. Uh, the first iteration of web forms was like, uh, not its strongest moment, but the second version, you know, things really picked up and got strong. And that happened with MVC as well. Like MVC2 oh, yeah. was really when that stuff started to pick up. So I think .NET 5 is going to be really exciting because we're going to hit that second stride of uh, innovations with the framework. Yeah, definitely. And now, now you're making me think of all the work I did learning MVC one and then uh, trying to adapt all the changes coming in MVC two. I don't remember specifically the details of what I was struggling with, but I remember it was a struggle to pick up the concept to begin with, especially having done so much web forms. It was just, well, where's the code behind? And you know, how does this actually work? And even just small things like when I was compiling and remembering to select the solution, for example, because at that point, if you're accidentally in the view or the controller or anything like that, 
uh, generally the project wouldn't compile right. So, you know, just small things like that uh, have improved immensely. And uh, yeah, even just the concepts that we introduced in MVC2 was, it took some time getting used to at first. But yeah, here we are now. MVC is still rocking along with uh, Core and, uh, and Blazor. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, we were discussing uh, in the chat along with Sam and Alyssa live earlier about some of the uh, good old days of uh, just programming in general. Uh, so some of the things that I worked on before. Uh, so I was, I've done uh, some VB apps before in VB6. Mm -hmm. um, that was probably the first quote professional things that I had written. Uh, and then ASP.NET Web Forms was like the first web encounter that I had. Um, and then while I was doing that, I was doing some side work with Flash. And, um, and then MVC came along about, about that time I was doing some, uh, Joomla development. Ooh, so I was, okay. I was working with some, uh, some, of, some of the JavaScript things, uh, in regards to that. So yeah. that kind of helped transition me over to MVC a little bit, but I was working with like oddball things that we don't use anymore, like Moo tools. So yeah. <laughs> Moo tools yeah. has tools. like a bad rap for breaking the web. I yeah, if you're aware of that, but uh, I remember they, some controversies around that. Yeah, <laughs> they polluted some of the uh, public prototype namespaces. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's certain function names that couldn't be used and stuff, or they would break like the entire web. Yeah, yeah. yeah so the, those are some of the things that I cut my teeth on, you know, coming through the web ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, the the team likes to joke a little bit because I, I dabble in a little bit of everything. So. I've touched PHP and and uh, you know different content management systems and they were all good experiences, but they were experiences, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That uh, <laughs> that just reminds me. The first time I got paid, at least more than like a couple bucks or you know in a case of beer or whatever it might be for for making uh, something with code, right? Was I was writing helping a company transition from. Microsoft Office 2003 into 2010, and this was in 2009. And they uh, were needed to check all their VBA script. So that was, I was writing VBA to begin with. That was when I was like, yeah, I've made it. I'm writing VBA. And then I, for a teeny bit, I wrote VB script instead of JavaScript in the web uh, as a part of that. But luckily, those days are behind me, and I only wake up in a cold sweat from that, you know, once in a while, not constantly anymore. Believe it or not, in a corporate environment, you still see those things. And yeah, yeah. Probably, uh, I've been with the company almost six years. Right before I left to come to Progress, I was refactoring some VB script for yeah. a uh, production application. So yeah. it was still out there six years ago. I'm sure it's still out oh, there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, we hey, actually have a really good question here from Mark Wales. Uh, he's asking for existing large Angular applications. Do I have any tips or tricks on starting to bring Blazor components without a total rewrite? Now, this is kind of uh, a two-piece question for me because for my first response would be, is this Angular JS or is it Angular, like Angular 2x and above? Um, I would say, here, I'll keep the question up on the screen in case viewers come in, they want to know what I'm talking about. Um, my, my first thing would be, if this is an Angular JS application, you could probably do a different type of migration strategy there because um, Angular, it, Angular JS was a little bit less um, of an overall system. It was more of a view framework than it was you know, a complete soup to nuts development stack. Um, so you might be able to migrate some of those Angular views one at a time over, especially if your backend is already .NET, uh, migrate those to a Blazor application. Um, you might be able to do some kind of mix and match with those, but it's probably not advisable. Um, if you have an Angular 2 or above application, uh, my question would be, what benefits are you going to get bringing Blazor into the mix? Um, Blazor and Angular kind of both serve the same purpose. So I wouldn't want to try to commingle those things in the same application, even if I'm migrating, it's going to be, uh, kind of painful. 
Um, and then you have to kind of weigh like, what, what am I gaining by replacing Angular, like the newer versions of Angular with Blazor? As much as I love Blazor, if you've already chosen Angular and it's working for you, then it's probably a good choice. So I'm not going to try to say that uh, you should change to Blazor just because it's it's better than Angular in some way. It's it's not, unless it's going to really, really improve your development. You know, it's a 2x, uh, Mark's confirming here. So if unless there's some reason you're very unhappy with Angular, I would say stick with it. Um, otherwise, you're going to have to have some sort of total rewrite. Uh, and an easy way to, not an easy way, but a, a palatable way to do that might be to like subdomain uh, parts of the app off, maybe certain features get rewritten and those bump over to another subdomain that um, that acts and looks like it's part of the rest of the application and slowly move pages over to uh, that other application. That would be my advice. Carl, yeah. any, any ideas? Yeah, it depends, of course, on what kind of application you're dealing with, right? And sometimes I see these more like portal-like applications where it's really several applications built into one big one and in that case you might get away with some of the smaller applications being rewritten into another technology like blazer for example right and then that might be a little bit easier because yeah the main app might be in angular but then you have an app here an app there that might be blazer specific if it's one true just one true application and you're trying to either slowly migrate or uh, because you've made up you know, for any number of reasons, right? That Blazor is the way to go and, you, and it needs to be a rewrite eventually. I think that you have to look at uh, maybe a route by route basis, right? What can you do? Are there things, certain pages that might be a little bit more suitable to have a different technology? It doesn't, I'm thinking about this, not just from a Blazor perspective, because yes, there's of course a handoff that might need to be done between Blazor and Angular in some way. And I actually haven't experimented too much with that to see what that would look like. But if there are certain pieces of functionality or certain views that kind of can exist in isolation, I think that those can be some good initial candidates for uh, replacing that with a different technology like Blazor. But once you eventually, you know, what's the main app? What's the sub app at that point, right? Uh, it could be, uh, you might have to hit a critical point where eventually you say, okay, these are the low hanging fruit. This next set of uh, components or views are going to be the ones that might need a little bit more, uh, might need a little bit more work and then eventually hit a critical mass where you say, okay, now Blazor takes over and what's left over is going to be Angular, which it might be a little bit tricky too, but yeah, it's, it takes a little bit of careful planning, I think, if you're going to try to uh, inject Blazor into an existing Angular application like that. Yeah, they're, they're definitely very hard to uh, kind of co-mingle together because of the way uh, Blazor and Angular both handle the state of the view that's in the application. I mm -hmm. try, try not to say the word view state, not confused people. <laughs> that's a, a web forms thing. Yeah. But uh, both Angular and, and Blazor have some sort of... Uh, uh, shadow dom that they use uh, blazer calls there's the uh, render tree um, i'm not familiar with what exactly the terminology is around angular but i know it has something uh, to help minimize dom rewrites um, that that sub uh, sub dom or shadow dom or whatever you want to call it in angular is going to conflict pretty heavily with blazer so they're both going to be trying to track updates on the on the actual browser's dom um, and if you have one set of components trying to write HTML and the other one trying to track where, you know, where those changes were made, things are going to break and get ugly really quick. So you're not going to want to mix those things together in one UI. Uh, at best, you could separate them into different pages. Um, and then yeah. uh, I, I wouldn't want to look at what that project structure looks like. You're going to have like mystery meet file, uh, <laughs> file browser <laughs> in that project yeah definitely yeah i think it's a good point that if it's all rendered on the same page you need to stick with one technology uh so you have to find the pieces where it can be isolated so one isn't trying to override the other for sure yeah just to put it in perspective of how difficult it is um even with the same base you know kind of technology an mvc app and a blazer app can run in the same uh in the same view it's totally doable to use an MVC view to render a Razor component um, in that view. 
and uh, it's pretty effortless too. However, that uh, render tree gets out of whack really easily and just an MVC view with a razor component, uh, there's no communication channel between the uh, server rendered HTML and the Blazor component that's rendering client side. And there's no way to talk between those bits of, of UI. So if you have a, a grid that's rendered in Blazor and something else that was rendered, say a chart that was rendered from the server, those two things cannot communicate in any way, shape or form. <laughs> you have to have a full page refresh for any of those things to update. Yeah, you'd truly be in a stateless uh, world at that point where you, you everything would have to go through the back end and any changes would have to rely on full refreshes, right? Yeah, and that, that kind of defeats the entire purpose of a yeah. spa application. So at that point, you have to ask yourself, what am I really trying to do here? Yeah. Uh, and um, what you end up doing is either just serving Blazor from MVC or just migrating completely to MVC mm -hmm. or Blazor. Sorry, one or the other. <laughs> you pick one or, or uh, <laughs> you just pick one of the view engines, basically. But trying to cross the streams, as we know from Ghostbusters, never works. Yeah, I learned that lesson early thanks to that movie, you know? <laughs> it teaches us so much. 80s movies, uh, I don't know what we'd have without 80s movies. Yeah, I uh, I keep on saying this to everybody. To me, the 80s were the best times, and I just, I like the trend that we're seeing a lot of folks going back to the 80s because, yeah, if I could go back in time, it would be to the 80s. We had so much, yeah, all those great movies we had. I mean, I'm a I'm a metalhead, so you know, we had a lot of good and early thrash and like power metal and uh, and uh, you know speed metal, all that good stuff. Hair metal, right? You had all the glam rock too. The, oh man, if only we could go back. Yeah, we've been trying to have movie nights here with uh, not a lot of um, you know stuff to do, not a lot of places we can go. So we've we've tried to have movie nights with the kids and uh, I was suggesting some 80s movies one night and I was like, we should watch some 80s movies. There's some really good ones back then. Yeah. And uh, my daughter was like, Ugh, I can't stand black and white. <laughs> like, how old do you think I am? Like, yeah, How long ago do you think the 80s were? Jeez. Yeah, so yeah that, that puts it in context. If you're about yeah. 10, 12 years old, you think, you know, those old timey like uh, black and white shows are what your mom and dad used to watch. And yeah. that's I, honestly, no. by the way, those eighties, eighties action movies, we did not evolve into a better kind of movie. The further down we, we go. So action movies nowadays do not hold a candle at all to what we had in the eighties. Uh, I mean, just think about John McClane running around and, and die hard, right? Still, the best Christmas movie ever created. And if you <laughs> if you think about just the whole slew, I mean, you had Jean-Claude Van Damme running around, all Schwarzenegger. I, had, uh, I, I mean, Rocky uh, movies came out. Maybe that's not so much action, right? But it's something. But yeah, those, uh, those movies, they were something. Just to show you how, uh, how great those movies are, we can't come up with new ideas these days. So Top Gun 2 is coming out, Sarah says. Yeah, uh, that's right. December. Yeah. So uh, I don't know how many years that is between sequels, but um, yeah, that I actually saw the preview. It looks pretty good. Uh, but, you know, kind of question like are like in the 80s, like the the whole air dominance thing was like still a thing. Oh, yeah. I don't know if that's so much a uh, public perception anymore. Is that something that that people think about on the regular? I don't I don't think so. But as somebody that, you know, I, I I mean, I can I can tell my my age isn't you know, I didn't live through the 80s. I just existed <laughs> in the 80s. Right. I just respect that time so much. But even me growing up, it was all about uh, which is the better plane, the MIG or the F-14 or 16, right? Like what's what's the uh, what's the best plane? And like, what are the different stats and everything? And I, maybe I was influenced a little bit by my dad who played all the flight sims back in the day. And you know, that's that's some of the first video games I, I ever played. But uh, I think I think Top Gun probably influenced that because I definitely watched Top Gun before, before I started playing those games. But that's when I started getting obsessed with it. So I think that was a big deal. We wanted to dominate the the air, and Top Gun, I think, put that into the zeitgeist even more than, uh, than yeah. anything else. 
Like you'll see, you'll see the news article here in the states, like every once in a while, about like some Russian plane that flew near Alaska, you know, touched our airspace for half a second. Like that yeah. happens from time to time here. Uh, but you know, in the the 70s and 80s, like you know, coming out of like the Vietnam era and stuff, like air superiority was like this big deal. Oh yeah, and, huge. Uh, it was talked about all the time. There was. It was kind of like the the JavaScript fatigue syndrome, like where we had like a new <laughs> JavaScript framework every week. It was like we came out with like a new fighter jet like every week. It was like yeah. this is the new one. This is the this is the F sixteen, the F fourteen. That you know, these things just kept rolling out like in the seventies and eighties. It's like nuts. Um, so with Top Gun two, I'm wondering if it's going to end like with some fever dream of uh, of Tom Cruise's character. It's been that long. I can't remember the character's name. Uh, but he's he's just like playing Battlefield on his computer or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. I wonder. I, I don't know. Tom Cruise, I don't think he goes for uh, for that uh, that kind of ending, you know? Uh, yeah, Maverick. But that was his call name. I'm wondering what was his actual name because all I remember is Maverick and Goose uh, yeah. and Iceman. Uh, Val Kilmer in the 80s too. Uh, you know, that it's... Uh, that movie is great. So I'm, I'm really curious what's going to happen with the second one. Yeah, we've got reference to Total Recall here, too. That was like one of one of my favorites. The yeah, I don't know about the remake. I know they've remade it. I don't think I've seen it, but the I... you can't remake a Schwarzenegger movie. It's no, just, it's just not it, possible. It has that iconic scene at, uh, with with his eyes popping out of his skull, which is, you know, just great practical effects for the day. Uh, I remember being traumatized by that a little bit as a kid. And I was like, yeah, well, you can't go to Mars. Your eyes are going to pop out of your head. That finally helped me realize why space can be dangerous. But uh, yeah, that remake almost has nothing to do with the original. It's uh, crazy. So Sarah is either looking up this information or she is a diehard Top Gun fan. No, great knowing... Her uh, interest in aerospace uh, because of, um, you know, just personal reasons. I'm wondering how hardcore of a Top Gun fan Sarah really is. <laughs> so uh, Sarah's husband is in the, in the aerospace is why I say that. If you, if you didn't catch that. Yeah, maybe that's, uh, you know, monthly, monthly viewings, right? I don't know if uh, <laughs> you have the same thing with, with your family, but there's definitely some movies whenever i'm at my parents place still to this day where if we have nothing else we just put on uh a movie that we watch over and over again and for us it's uh a long kiss good night which is maybe a weird one to have but that's like uh one, one of the go-tos i probably have watched that movie over 100 times at this point just considering that on vhs i can't tell you the amount of times to watch it there now we have it on dvd they also bought it on amazon so Maybe that's what uh, Sarah's doing with uh, with Top Gun. Sarah solidifying her position as the coolest boss ever. <laughs> um, let's see. I, I typed this into chat. I don't know if Alyssa saw it. I'm, I'm kind of wondering if she is ready. If you are, give me a thumbs up. You're ready. Okay, we're going to bring Alyssa back into the stream. Uh, they're getting ready to kick off the rest Hello. of the show. Hey, Hello, Alyssa. darling. Hey. Welcome back. You're hearing us talk about our old-timey movies. I know our, our black and white movies. So we we have that um, tradition or habit uh, in my family as well, where every like uh, fall Halloween time we watch all the Harry Potter movies, and we've made a new tradition this year. We've agreed to a movie schedule where we're going to watch the Lord of the Rings movies during Christmas. So, <laughs> like as an annual thing. So I love it. <laughs> Yeah, the, the kids complained and, and bellyached that we were going to watch these, quote, boring 80s movies. And then I put on Beetlejuice and they loved it. So. <laughs> oh, I actually saw that just the other day. Uh, so, I mean, I've watched Beetlejuice over and over, but it's just funny. It, on Friday, we we were looking for a movie to watch. I was like, you know what I haven't seen in a while? Beetlejuice. You know who I forget is in that? Alec Baldwin. I forget that he is like the husband in that movie. I remember Gina Davis. I remember everybody else in the movie, but for some reason, I just did not register that that's Alec Baldwin. And maybe it's because 
I think of him in Glengarry Glen Ross, and then I think of him in 30 Rock, and anything mm-hmm. in between, I just don't comprehend that he was in movies or shows in between, which, I mean, he's a successful actor, so he has been. He's played Jack Ryan, right? So he definitely has been successful, but for some reason, just blank. That's like a, just a blurry face uh, for, for that actor uh, in that movie. So it's, Yeah, it's, uh, and, and he plays uh, Donald Trump on SNL frequently, too. Oh, yeah. And then you look back at, at Beetlejuice and you're like oh my god he was a baby when he was in this movie like, <laughs> yeah right like he was so young in that movie it's it's just kind of mind-bending to see like him then and now uh they, he looks so different you know especially being able to play that part on SNL and then you yeah. look at him and, and Beetlejuice yeah. you're just like wow that's the same person I know <laughs> you right? start feeling old yourself you're like oh yeah I remember when yeah. I saw this <laughs> Whenever he's uh, dyeing his hair and, you know, in like regular, like, you know, on TV in some capacity, right? He just looks eternally young. Now when he's doing some Zoom stuff, you know, some remote stuff where uh, he uh, he has the gray hair coming in, you know, the gray beard and everything. That's when you're like, oh, Alec Baldwin, you have age. But as soon as he cuts that out, then then he instantly turns like 30 years younger. It's pretty amazing. So let's see. Let's see if I can segue properly. So watching watch him him dye his hair is like watching a silver light app being sunset and migrating <laughs> to uh, <laughs> to something new like Blazer. Oh, you did it, Ed! You did well, it. Back on, topic, back on topic, maybe the lunch hour, but we have a way to make sure that we always <laughs> stay on topic. I love it. Oh my goodness! So what did so, I miss other than you guys talked about movies? Did you have any other fun convos? Uh, we were talking about some Angular. Somebody was looking to migrate their fresh new angular 2 application over to blazer because blazer is just that amazing i there Uh, was a lot of chat earlier about blazer so why why i actually advised against that Uh, i know like if you're good with something uh you really have to justify that cost to migrate uh so that that was kind of my my overall answer there it's uh you have to have a really good reason to um kick something to the curb that's fairly new like uh angular 2 up I mean, that's um, depending on which version in that series you're on, that's pretty bleeding edge or um, not that old. So it's like, how can I justify uh, taking, you know, all that code and rewriting it and spending all that money? Um, unless it's a fairly small app or something, you could do mm. it on a weekend type of thing. But it didn't sound like it from. Uh, I think it's because your... Blazor, you know, is being amped and just now like ready to go. And so it's kind of one of those things of, Oh, but we went in too, you know, like. <laughs> and and maybe, you know, if Blazor had been around when the original decision around Angular was made, that would have been, you know, the framework of choice, right? So maybe now it's more, well, you know, ultimately that is a framework we would love to be on. So it could be something like that. And uh, welcome back, John. John's with us as well. John, hello, Brown's hello. Hey, oh. The uh, beginning of the show today. It's been a, been a long day. <laughs> I'm not sure. Can, can you hear us, John? I don't think he can. Right, we're going to take John offline until yeah. uh, I think he's ready to go. But uh, <laughs> uh, he's coming back. What, what's our schedule like, uh, Alyssa? What are we looking forward to? Well, we are, I think we're, we only have about an hour and a half left of the stream. And uh, John and I are going to be talking about um, a lot of things that Mobilize does, which is they're really, really good at doing these bigger migrations and uh, we'll specifically be delving into an ASP.NET Angular app um, and looking at, John is going to walk us through exactly how you get to that point where you have the migrated Angular app. And then I'm going to walk through a little bit of cleanup and kind of where do you go from here? Because as you can imagine, it's not, it's not a perfect, flawless, ready to go Angular app. So, (laughs) but yeah. Yeah, so excited about that. And then I think we might do prize giveaway, question mark, probably, uh, with our recap. And so, but thank you both so much for doing an awesome lunchtime show. We appreciate you both very, very much. Thank you, Alyssa. Of course, you ready yeah, to take over here? Me. Yes, we will take over. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Carl. And uh, we'll see you later, Alyssa. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Hey, John, can you hear there me? There I am. Yeah. I where I was. Yeah. I couldn't hear you guys before because I was listening to the uh, the Twitch channel. And then when StreamYard came up, all of a sudden I heard two out of phase voices. And it's mm. like, okay, am I on an LSD trip or what's going on? 
but turns out I wasn't. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> welcome back. Welcome back. Thanks. 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 Yeah. Uh, I'm happy to be here. That was a great session you and Sam had. I um, was interested in uh, watching Sam struggle through 14 different ways to convert. <laughs> I know, right? I I too was there there was a lot of different I think he only had one one demo that he couldn't get working, but I was overwhelmed with the the demos that he was able to show off. So it was a really what productive was morning. It was uh was it web assembly or Yeah, it? it was and I think with Blazor and it was he had some issues with uh actually like compiling and running it, but um, but I know he, I know he can do it there. It's, it's one of those, you're live. What bug is it? Situation. Yeah, it was interesting because it's nougat duck fig file had a question mark in visual studios. Like, no, you can't have question marks. And, and I'm like, you know, we, it reminds me of the, remember the trailing slash problem we had with Mauricio. <laughs> uh, and I always get the, uh, in JavaScript, I always get the semicolon out of phase or I get the bracket out of phase or I get the parentheses out of phase. And then I'm like, if you forget the semicolon, you're dead meat, right? You will spend an hour looking for why is this thing not working? Well, like, oh, and usually I find that usually they are, uh, the error messages are more helpful, but sometimes you're like, this, this, this seems like it should be easier than it is. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not really a JavaScript guy, so I use really crappy tools. I got to get better debuggers for JavaScript going set up so I can learn it a little bit better. Oh, so, John, tell us what we are going to be diving into this afternoon. Maybe. Okay, I'm going to push you over to the side. I don't mean that in any kind of emotional sense. Um, so, what I want to talk about today is if you have, remember earlier we were talking about the very, very large application problem, right? So, probably what I'm talking about isn't as uh, relevant to more trivial applications, uh, like if you've got a small game or something like that that you didn't solve, like so wrong from um, getting it to Angular. Maybe you just want to rewrite it in native Angular because we're going to uh, potentially add a little bit of complexity in order to create simplicity. So just a little bit of background. Um, Mobilize.net has been around for a couple of decades, basically working on the problem of how can you migrate or transform source code and I think that's an important distinction because it is a source code solution, not, not a runtime solution. How can you transform source code from one language to another language without sort of the old days of the Google Translate problem where you did like a syntactic one-for-one -one match and you wound up with sort of gobbledygook at the end point, right? Um, because code is much more nuanced than that. And so um, our founding team used some AI concepts to try and do uh, static analysis on code and then create pattern matching and some other stuff. And that's really sort of what we have taken forward over the, you know, iteration after iteration. And we're probably best known for a long time ago being a partner with Microsoft to help people get off VB6 to .NET uh, and move their VB classic language source code to VB.NET. Remember we were talking about VB.NET earlier today, which was the .NET version, the Visual Basic, and it's in many ways similar to C Sharp or Java. It's an object-oriented language that, you know, is, um, allows for more strongly typing and things like that. Um, <clears throat> subsequent to that, we looked at the problem of how do you get those applications from a desktop to the web. And again, there's a problem space that we live in where um, both the large corporations like the enterprise and large ISVs have significantly large investments in application code. Um, you know, and so 500,000 lines for us is not a big app. Wow. Right? <laughs> you know, like three, four, five, six million lines of code, that's a big app. Um, and, and yes, everybody would like to rewrite them and do everything perfectly, but realistically, mm -hmm. it's just, it's probably just not in scope to try and do that. If you're an ISV and somebody comes, you got a desktop app, somebody comes along with a web app, and they start taking your market share and your development team says, well, we can create a nice new web app but using Angular or React or Vue or whatever, you know, the flavor of the month is, um, but it's going to take five years to do it. I mean, what's the payback on that? You'd be out of business. Pay, right? <clears throat> so, you know, we have, I like to think about carpenters in the old days when your great, great grandfather built a house, they used a handsaw. And now when they build houses, they use uh, skill saws, use power saws, right? 
and you still have to build the house, but you can cut that wood a lot faster. You know, you have all these power saving tools like nail guns instead of bang, bang, bang with a hammer. So we're a power tool for these kinds of migration projects. Silverlight's the newest thing. And what I'm gonna show you is how we are, and we're still working on this tool. So what I'm gonna show you is a little bit of a pre-alpha prototype kind of a thing. Love yeah, it, I love exactly. previews. First look, first look <laughs> in public. Um, but we took an app that is a, um, I think it's a Microsoft Silverlight demo app, right? sort of a human resources app, right? And migrated it from uh, C Sharp XAML to Silverlight. And then um, you get to play with it. And I'm gonna be really interested to see what you do because I'm still learning some of the web front end stuff, which is a bottomless pit of learning that's available to you. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but, no, that's but, aptly put. <laughs> yeah. But before we do that, I, I, the conversation that we had earlier with Sam and you about XAML and what's XAML and some of this stuff got me really thinking about like, where did all this come from? And um, so I'm going to use the Wayback Machine because you can tell from my gray hair, I'm a little bit older than you. And if you think back to the 1980s, remember the 1980s? They were just talking about the 1980s of Top Gun. But if you think back to the 1980s, you had basically had PCs. You know, the IBM PC was revolutionary in putting computers on desktops, but it was all command line stuff. You know, it was, DOS was a, a command line interface where you would you type things in the command line and then you'd stream a result and you type things. So it was sort of a, a one dimensional kind of a data stream or UI. And Windows, of course, on PCs, you know, the Mac was there first, but but back in the 80s, Mac OS, nobody used the Mac OS. I mean, it was a very narrowly targeted product. And they had maybe three or 4% market share compared to the IBM PC. And you, you better or worse, but that's the reality. And PCs were on these character um, based uh, monitors and video systems. And, and it was a big breakthrough when they had a graphical uh, system that could actually display you know, pixels instead of just characters, right? And so Windows was the first PC-based operating system that really caught on that was able to take advantage of that. But writing the user interface of Windows is really hard. You use C and you use the Windows API and you define things like objects and forms and windows and child windows and objects on those windows in a very, very painful fashion. So along came Visual Basic. And the reason I bring this up is because one of the things that Visual Basic did was it had, how do I, I got to show my screen. Is it, how do I do that in this thing? Share screen. Um, so okay. at the, yeah, share screen, and then we'll screen add it to easiest with two monitors. the stage. Okay, thank you. And okay, yeah, you either choose the screen or the application that you want to share, we'll share, and then I can add it to the stage once you do. That one. So you, whoa, why is it showing all that stuff? Because you are sharing your Chrome window. I want to share my Chrome window. I want to share a different screen. I thought it was, oh, screen one. Okay, screen one is the one on the right, not the one on the left. So it's <laughs> right to left number and today. Okay, got it. Okay, so Visual Basic had a way to interactively design forms with objects on, windows with objects on for applications. So how did it encode all of that information? Well, look here, here's a Visual Basic form file and you can see that, Might like, for example, the font a here's a button bit. and it has, a top and a width, and it has a height and a left. It has these attributes, these properties of the visual object, right? And so then when Windows forms came along in the .NET world, they basically took that same paradigm and they created these designer files that have, you know, these object definitions like this, okay? Um, and you can see this is pretty clunky. And the way it used it, it had an interactive designer inside of Visual Studio. And then this was all hey, generated John, code. Can you bump your font up a little bit? It's you a little, bet. A little um, tiny. <laughs> yeah, somewhere in. Um, I know it's Command Plus on a Mac. It but might be. And no plus plus. Hang on, there's a zoom on here somewhere. Here it is. Okay, zoom and Control Mouse wheel up. Okay, how's that? It's better. Thank you so better. much. better? Okay. Yeah. So this is all code that was generated by Visual Studio's uh, designer. 
And so the developer isn't supposed to touch this. You're supposed to use this WYSIWYG designer, you know, kind of like, um, you know, Word or something like that. You have this underlying representation, but God help you if you mess with it. So um, that worked great for Windows Forms. And then when WPF came out, you know, um, XML was kind of a new idea. And the idea was, well, let's use XML to define these user interface elements. Um, and so that's when XML started to look for, for XAML because it was an extendable, extensible version of XML. It started to look a lot like H HTML because it's just a markup, right? So you have a thing and then you have a description of that thing in terms of how you want to represent it or any properties that you want to associate with it. So that's kind of how we got here. And um, so when we go to um, uh, XAML, like here, um, let's look at some XAML. I'll show you what this is. So it's not really as alien as it seems. For example, in in um, XAML, now normally there's a designer up here, but it doesn't work very well because we're actually running the application right now. You can see there's the stop debugging thing. And there's a reason I have to run it, and that's for you, right? <laughs> so that you can access it. <laughs> but um, kind of like XML, I mean, kind of like HTML, you start out with some information about the the you know in, a, in HTTP or in, a, in HTML. This would be sort of the the doc schema that you'd have, right? So we have some schema stuff here. And then you get down and like you have stack panels here. This is kind of like a flex box in um, CSS uh, where it can be a stack vertically or a stack horizontally. This is a stack, a horizontal stack. Um, and you have things like margins. Um, and so basically kind of like HTML, you have a, a property and you open it up with some braces, you know, some carrots, and then you have some data and then you close it and you say, that's the end of the information about this thing. So that's kind of what um, what WPF tried to do. And then as Sam was saying, or others, Lauren was saying, um, uh, Silverlight was built on top of WPF to provide a browser way to run these similar rich applications. WPF itself was a way to get past those Windows forms, which themselves were sort of a um, uh, built on top of the, the Visual Basic uh, interactive design forms, drag and drop objects, and set properties on. So that's kind of the, the paleontology of this whole thing. And I think sometimes it's helpful to, to understand how that works. If so, this is the Silverlight app, and um, uh, we'll look at. Let's let's just look at it running. So again, it's browser based, and remember, Silverlight without that IE tab control it has to run an IE. So we're running on a VM in Azure that's uh, an older version of Visual Studio because you can't run, you can't do uh, Silverlight in Visual, current Visual Studio. And so basically this app has a connection to a SQL database that has employee information. And when it starts out, it has a grid control of a list of employees and we can sort the grid by different features. We can look at individual application or individual employees and then we have a um, another stack panel down here where we show uh, stuff on each individual employee. And we have paging controls here um, where you can scroll through the applications thing. And we have a filter query field up here. If I type in a value like 40, uh, it will automatically sort uh, and filter the uh, results in the grid to only employees that have at least 40 hours of vacation time. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's one of those end columns, right? Yeah, that, that shows your vacation hours. Yeah, did I pass it? Where is it? Uh, I don't even see it being an idiot. Huh. There it is, vacation hours. Okay. It's, oh, it's right at the beginning. I didn't expect that. <laughs> I didn't either. Did it change the? It didn't used to sort? be. I. It I didn't know. used to do that, right? Yesterday <laughs> it wasn't doing that. Okay. I don't know. All right. So, um, and then there's a there's a home and an about, and this is sort of a byproduct of the fact that this is really a um, it's really an ASP.NET web application. Okay. 
with this client side stuff sitting on top of it. So if we were to look over here in Visual Studio at the application, um, and for some reason, let me pin Solution Explorer up here. And is that readable over here on the right? This is the part I can't really zoom. Uh, I think so. Okay. Let us know in the chat if you can't, but I think it's okay. Okay. And so what's kind of typical in a Silverlight app is you have two projects in your solution. You have an app and you have an app.web. And so if you think about this is a kind of a classic sort of model view thing where the app here, this is all of the front end code. So this is the UI, this is the client code, this is the stuff that's gonna run um, in this particular world and the, in the, inside the browser. Inside um, and so you can see that you've got models and you've got views um, and you've got controls and things like that. So there's a lot of stuff in here. A lot of it is kind of um, boilerplate for any Silverlight application. Um, you've got things like, for example, you get, um, resource strings. So if you want to have a, if you want to put all of your strings into a ResX files to localize it, this is sort of automatic. Um, and, but basically you get these individual files where you have the good stuff. And then down here, you have your HR web app. So this is all the C-sharp code. And so by de definition, uh, let's see up here. So up in here, for example, back in the front end, for every XAML file, you'll have a XAML.cs file, okay? And this is the code behind, as Sam was talking about earlier. So here you can see where every um, uh, control that's actionable, for example, we have two buttons on this particular form, an OK button and a Cancel button. And both of these have an event handler, okay? Now, the event handler here doesn't do anything, it's basically going to send that event back to the to the back end side of the code, and it's going to go like, well, "What do you want me to do with this?" So typically, what you'll do in that case is you're going to, in these kind of an applications, you're going to take some data that came from the the um, client side, maybe as a JSON message, and you're going to uh, restructure that into a SQL query. Okay. And you'll send a SQL query to the database, and then you'll take whatever gets returned, and you'll restructure that into something that the view can handle, and send it back again as a, as a JSON message. So there's your state management. Too. Um, and so there's a lot of stuff in here. So now, what do we do with that? Okay, so we would take all of this code, um, and we would point a migration tool at it, and the migration tool would analyze the code and basically take everything in the front end here, all of this stuff here, uh, which I can't select. So you can think about everything in, not in the back end code, but all of these models, all of the SAML, um, the, um, the events that are available in the code behind, and then convert that into this Angular lash up that I'll show you in a second. Um, that's what the migration tool does. And then what's cool about it is right now, you don't need to change anything in this project in the back end code. Um, and so that all of that C sharp code will just run. Okay. And now the front end, instead of being XAML stuff, Silverlight stuff in a plugin running on IE, it's going to be pure Angular talking via JSON messages to this back end. Okay. So in order for that to work, we have to continue to run this application but this front end code is no longer necessary. So I could just, I could strip it out of the application if I wanted. Now you are probably gonna wanna go in over time and do some refactoring here because it wasn't designed necessarily for what we're doing. But this is a quick way to take all of this code and imagine that it isn't this big, but it's huge. Take all of this code and get it running in Angular, get it running in something that's, that's truly cross-platform because it'll run on browsers without plugins uh, and all the issues associated with that. Um, and run it with, with uh, out breaking any of the business logic. The user interface is going to be pretty faithful, but it'll leave a little headroom for some cleanup stuff. So what that would look like is, this should work. 
<laughs> it'll work. It'll work. It'll work. It'll work. <laughs> I believe it. Can. Oh, come on. Where's my? Let's see, is your server running? What's it running on? I don't want to stop it because then I'll break what you're going to do, and we're going to have to explain that to people. Um, but let me do something instead. Um, I'm going to let you show the app. Why don't you said, show the app real quick? Dee we said we're praying for you, John. Yeah, no worries. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing. I'll remove you and... You share your screen and let's talk about what the app actually does. And here's a cool thing. You're running on a Mac, right? And the app is C Sharp running a Windows server. So how do we make that work? All right, I am moving windows around so that this looks the best, but I will share in one second. Okay. All right, let's do entire screen. And we're going to pin that and show this. And so this, as John was saying, is the, and I'm gonna try to move this over so we can still see the chat. Um, okay, so here is the application running and it's on my Mac. Um, yeah. Can you see the, you can see the Chrome window, right? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so yeah. yes, uh, here is it running on the Mac. I basically, you've got the home and the about that are empty and then the employee list, which is grabbing our list of employees and I believe the filter. Um, so I think that might be a difference between the apps with the grid doing that because the vacation hours is still where we expected it to ah, be. <laughs> I, yeah, think, so I think I think we're getting yeah. There's a couple of differences with the, the migrated app. So yeah, absolutely. So um, and just to do a shout out to uh, my colleague and uh, rocket scientist Mauricio, who's <laughs> on here is Aurel back. Aurel back. Um, he figured out a way to take the Let's see if I remember this correctly. So we have this thing running in IE on this VM in Azure, mm. right? He exposed he he used this thing called NGROK or NGROK. Yeah, it's in G-R-O-K. R-O-K. Yeah, okay. N-G-R-O-K. And that forwards from a different URL, which you've got there, to this port on the VM, right? So that you can yes. actually run it from your Mac even though you're not, yeah, it's kind of crazy. No, because we were, we were having issues with getting the data into this application. Right. Um, and your solution for it was to run the pre-migrated app at the same time. So you still had your backend giving right. that data easily. But for me on a Mac, I was like, uh, I can't run the Silverlight app. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, so yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. NG Rock is really, really cool. Definitely suggest checking it out. I just showed the uh, URL to that, but yeah. yeah. Cool. So why don't you switch back to me, and I'll walk through the new code, and then yeah, you can start doing some cleanup on it. Sounds good. And so I'm going to share my screen again. I'm going to get better at this, and it's screen one. Okay. All and right. Again over here. And um, here is our code. What's going on? Oh, that's not what I want. What I want is to get out of my VM. There we go. Okay, sometimes I get confused. Am I looking at a VM or am I looking at my desktop? What is reality, right? <laughs> <laughs> where, have you ever done that where you wake up and you're like, where am I? What's yeah, happening? exactly. <laughs> only every day, Alyssa, only every day. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, are you watching the? Are you watching the? The chat. Channel? Yes. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Okay. Yes. Oh, we're inside the matrix. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you, Mauricio. You're right. We are inside the matrix, and it's your matrix, dude. So <laughs> you made it. You made this matrix. Um, so what we've created over here, you know, this is the the output of the migration tool, and I want to make sure, make it clear to people that. Again, we're still building on the tool. Mauricio had to do uh, some handwork here, but the idea was to create uh, a sample application that um, would generate that would show the same code that we're going to generate in the uh, product as we build it. Uh, so when we get done, so we know exactly how it's going to end up 
Uh, it's just that there's a lot of steps to get from here to there. Um, so you can see that we have a number of the, sort of the pieces that are typical in an Angular application, uh, like our packages and our configs and stuff like that. Up here in projects, we have two. We had this HR app, which was the name of our original um, Silverlight application. But we have also this SM components. And I want to just talk about this briefly because this is sort of the the magic here. Do you know what this SM is, stands for? I kept calling it small components in my head, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Well, um, I don't know if that's the namespace that we'll end up with, but our other products that generate these Angular front ends and these ASP.NET back ends uh, use WM for web app. Okay. Um, and so this, I think, is SM for Silverlight Map, Map being an internal abbreviation for a modernization acceleration program, okay, as a way to modernize things. We haven't really worked out the naming on this yet, but for now, let's just say it's SM. And so you can see it's a lot of, um, it's a, basically, it's a library of things that are all on TypeScript. And so this is where we build our layer on top of Angular. So we're letting Angular do the, the lifting and carrying most of the water under the sheets. But we are going to build sort of an abstraction layer on top of that uh, to make the code just a little bit cleaner for the developers that are used to the original application that jump into this thing. And so that's why when we go up to the HR app and we go into our source, and we go into our app, we'll see that we basically have um, folders here, just like we did in the original thing. So we have assets, controls, whoops, assets, controls, the generated code helpers, models, views, and so forth. Um, and then inside of views, we again, where before we had a XAML file and a XAML.cs file, now what we have is an HTML file and a TS file and a component file. So if we look at, for example, the TypeScript file, this is where we're going to uh, create all of our, um, in effect, handling those clicks, those events, right? And then we're gonna use our library of helpers that are in that SM components library to send this event to an Angular uh, event hand, okay? That's gonna do something interesting with it. Um, and that's where you're a lot smarter about this stuff than I am. So over in the HTML, you can see that every, um, this looks almost exactly like the, the XAML. Here's our, um, look, here's our flex box right here. That was our stack column before. Now it's a flex box, right? And it's horizontal or it's a column. So are those um, things that the, uh, like will be automated with the migration tool that your team's building? Or is yeah. that something that you have to go in? No, no, this would all be done by the automated migration tool. Okay. This is kind of the easy stuff because we parse the XAML file and we map it back to. Wait, I just lost you. Your, I just lost you. Your Am sound. I here? Can you hear me? Yeah, no, oh, I'm sorry. Here. I mute sometimes in case, oh, okay. uh, in case the pup makes noise or something. So I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, great question. This would all be automated. Um, this is actually fairly straightforward because the, the XAML description of the uh, all of the objects on the window are really, really, um, you know, you have a rich amount of data and it maps very easily over here to HTML. Like for example, uh, the margin looks exactly like the, the XAML margin uh, data and so forth, right? Um, now, it doesn't mean that it's gonna look perfect because as we know, um, in different browsers, you know, there's different defaults and maybe um, you're gonna wind up with um, something that gets overridden and it gets a little bit broken. But generally, this is all pretty much straightforward. So here's all your HTML. And so you can see that every uh, particular object, like all these input types and things like that, are going to map to these uh, grid control items, OK, back in the grid control. Now, what are we doing for a grid control? We're using Kindo. Great. Woo! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so we started doing this desktop to web automation stuff about six or seven years ago with the very first prototypes that got hacked out. And when we were looking for a control library uh, written in JavaScript, Kendo was a really natural choice because first of all, it was very full, uh, it was well supported, and it had a nice mapping to the, uh, the native Windows controls that the applications that we were working from use. And so we used the Kendo control set. Um, 
And uh, we love you guys because you've been super, you've been a great partner with us. Um, it doesn't mean that somebody couldn't replace Kendo with another competing product whose name I won't mention, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> wait, 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 uh, there's a competing product? <laughs> right, right, right. What, is there such a thing? Could there ever be such a thing? But, but we do want to give customers a certain amount of uh, flexibility. Uh, way back in the day, we had everything hardwired to Angular JS back then and to Kendo. And then when we had to switch from Angular JS to Angular, it was really a pain in the neck to strip it all out. So we redid the whole architecture around basically plugging these things in a little bit. So even today, Angular is sort of plugged in as an import and you could replace it with Vue or something if, if you had to do that. We have a, a very large customer that has their own framework. And so the projects that we do for them, they want to replace Angular with their own internal framework. Um, and so it's not it's not trivial, but it's not impossible by any means to, to do those kind of swap outs. So it's sort of future proof. And then we do have CSS, which you can see there's nothing in there. <laughs> right? Not in this not at this particular level. I think there is a uh, well, there's styles.css. Yeah, right there's the, the styles, right? That one has and, yeah. quite a few uh, yeah. like the I right. guess the global or the default styles that they wanted to have in this app. But yes, that's something that we'll talk about a little bit in a minute whenever yeah. I take exactly. over. So Exactly. So that is basically how the whole thing sort of fits together. Um, and then when you, uh, you know, as you know, this is, you know, pure front end stuff. So you can just make a change to the HTML, to the CSS. You can tweak the TypeScript if you want and then just rebuild it and bada bing, bada boom. It just works. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing because I'm really interested in hearing yeah. um, what you have. But now I have to find. Oh, I already removed you, so you're oh, good. Okay, good. Uh, you you okay. can stop okay, sharing if you want, but I've took I took your screen down, so you are good to go, darling. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, I think we have about 20 minutes until Sam hops back on and we do the wrap up for our show. So um, what I'm planning on talking about is just, okay, so we've migrated from Silverlight to an Angular app um, and using, you know, the mobilized team of incredible wizard developers and the tools they've they've created for this. Um, but now where do I go from here? And of course, every, I think we hit on this earlier, but every migration is going to look different because um, every like starting point is different, right? Um, there's no, I, I really, I feel for the developers who make automation tools like this because um, it sounds really hard to capture all of these different like starting points for where where is this code at? How did you write it? How did you wire things up? Even if it is a really well-defined and understood framework. And so, um, so let me go ahead and share my screen, darlings. Uh, yes, yes, share. And we're going to pop over to the app. So um, what I did, I'm just going to, again, quickly hit on a couple of things, maybe talk about um, some best practices with Angular and styling and what you would do. But if I pull up our code right here, and I'm actually going to quit that so that we can see our chat. Okay. So one of the things, um, and let me, let me make our font a little bit larger. You can let me know if, if I need to go up or down. Because um, I know at a certain point you get so large that you can barely see anything. So um, here we have our HR app as John was walking through. And if I go down to, um, let's see, actually, first off, I'm going to show our app modules. So the first thing that I did um, whenever I, I got my hands on this app uh, <laughs> was I went ahead and created a default path a default route for our employees list because uh, of course right now home and about aren't populated and I don't need them. And so um, I made our default route employees list. So whenever we refresh um, our page, it's going to take us directly to that. Um, and that of course is with our beautiful grid um, that we can toggle through. We can select and see um, more information on that specific employee. And then we can also add an employee. Um, and so this was one of the first things that I wanted to tackle. So this is using a um, Kendo UI. Let's actually use our inspector uh, for our dev tools. Uh, so it is the Kendo dialog. This is the 
uh, title bar, but up here is the just kendo dialogue. And so one of the first things I just kind of wanted to walk through this flow as I headed over to um, our components because um, I am not familiar with all of them. And so I was like, hey, how do I customize the dialogue? So I searched for that and I found the one for, and sorry if it's if my internet is a little slow today, we're all hanging in there. Um, so I went to getting started with our Kendo UI for Angular dialogue. And of course, uh, if we check out view source, uh, this is where I discovered that on the Kendo dialogue, you can add things like min width or width, um, but then you can also do it um, in the, um, sorry, Let's see visibility tile dimensions. You guys have such great documentation. I do. I really do. Fantastic. I really do love our docs. Um, yeah. and they I, I love our new um our new stack blitz. I, I don't know how new it is, but I know we swapped out all of our demos with little stack blitz demos, which is wonderful because you can open it in stack blitz and start customizing it right away, yeah, which awesome. for me at least I'm like, yes, that's what I, <laughs> this is exactly what I was looking for. Um, so let me go ahead. I think I actually, that was what I did was I opened it in stack blitz and was, I started playing around with it because I was like, I need to customize our dialogue. And so um, app component TS, yes. Um, and so let's actually, let's head back over to, I'm going to close that out, pull this back up. Uh, so what I was thinking was uh, a scroll here on a dialogue is no bueno, especially if you're on mobile or like an iPad or of some sort, this would be, this would be awful. And so um, I'm just going to show off. Of course, we do have a ton of styles and styles.cs, but one of the things um, that I wanted to show was opening up uh, this child window model TS uh, that was migrated over and um, inside of here this is where we are actually instantiating our dialogue service instance and this is where we can go ahead and add things like uh, minimum height for instance or minimum width um, and so I'm going to give that 600 and it should be rebuilding because I have it watching now and uh Actually, let me double check my terminal. There it goes. We were waiting on the chunk optimization as you Angular fans know we often are waiting on. <laughs> uh, so now if I click add employee, ah, it's still too stubby. Let me see what I did wrong. All right, Kendo dialogue. So it doesn't have the 600. Let me see if I added it to the wrong thing. Do, do, do. Let's try height. And because I don't see it actually in what we should see is on the element itself. Um, it should go ahead and add that height. Refresh. Add employee. Give it a moment. It's pondering its life. There we go. Yeah, there okay. it is. All right. So yeah. I don't know if it was because of the build if I maybe I tried refreshing before it was actually built or if I need to do height instead of minimum height but if we go over here on our dialogue now you see on the element and style itself you have the height of 600 being added which is as perfect it's beautiful and a lot of different um, kendo components have the ability to add these things when it's being instantiated inside of your typescript to add these different like height width default things that you want like for instance like i said here i want this modal to have this height um and so we don't have a scroll anymore but you also have the option uh, if we go over here um and let me know john if anyone says anything in the chat that i need to be aware of because i am just chugging along um something that uh was driving me crazy ba -ba bonkers and i don't know if this was because of the maybe the conventions with Silverlight applications versus conventions with Angular applications. But all of these, the like the main page TypeScript file, uh, the main page, uh, the CSS, and the HTML, they were all just kind of floating there in, uh, along with like, for instance, you'll see employee lists, 
component and the about component, and they're all at the same level. And so oh, just convention well, wise, Luis Diego is on, on here. So Luis Diego, I hope you're making notes. He's <laughs> <our guy. laughs> well, convention wise, these are usually grouped by component. And so I just threw them quickly into a folder cool. called main page component. And then of course, as you would imagine, um, that means that certain routes, uh, like if I go to our TypeScript file, I had to change um, like the login status and the error window. These routes needed to be updated as well as the main page component route itself. Um, but yeah, so these are just simple things. Um, but as you start if you do choose Angular, you want to start using um, Angular conventions going forward. And so, of course, like we said, uh, there'll be some cleanup and manual uh, to do work. But once you once you get these conventions in place, things will be so much easier. So um, that was the first thing I wanted to show off. Another thing was, I think John had mentioned wanting to have. So we go back over to our application. And we fixed the height on that. Um, so there's so many directions we could go. One is cleaning up these anchors because, well, there's no, a couple of things. There's no active state. And just for um, like on hover, we could like change the, the background, things like that. But one of the things you had mentioned was wanting to have, I think it was, we have a minimum vacation hours filter. And I think you had wanted to have a way of filtering by uh, sick yeah, leave. Sick, sick leave. Yeah, sick sure. leave. Um, so I just wanted to talk about what that would look like to go ahead and add in um, to add in another input field and maybe cleaning that up a little bit. Uh, so if we go and find in our main page component, um, and we only have like five to ten more minutes on this before we do our wrap up show, but I'll show what I can. So let's go to do, do, do. Um, mm -hmm. I'm actually going to, so it's minimum vacation hours. So the way that I, minimum vacation. So I think I'm in the wrong file. Yeah, I found it somewhere now. I don't remember where. Minimum vacation hours. There it is. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, it's an employee list. Pardon, I was in the wrong HTML file. So here we would go ahead and grab, looks like, and like you said, these were uh, flex styles that were generated uh, for our converted app. So I would go ahead and find, I think this div right here is what's wrapping, let's see, Kendo Grid. Um, our label and, oh, I see what's happening. So this label is for the whole thing itself, but this is the div that's wrapping our label and input. So I'm gonna grab this one, that one, yes. Okay, so what I would do is I would go ahead and grab this gorgeousness copy, paste, and we're going to change this to, I think, we said sick leave, so minimum sick leave. Woo. Um, sorry, I think I got rid of my. I got rid of my. There it is. Run. I was trying to figure out <laughs> <laughs> where to uh, go. It's gone. Yeah, it's gone forever. Sick leave hours. Yeah. Um, and let's make that match. Here to filter. Okay, so now um, we need to go ahead and check it out, see what we're looking at. Um, it will refresh in its own good time. Okay, beautiful. This is what I love to see. So I love it when I'm adding new functionality and everything just looks jank. And I'm being completely serious because it means we get to go in and we get to just clean up some styles, which is very cathartic for me. So, <laughs> uh, so the first thing um, that I would do is, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Um, I would give both of these buddies a wrapper. Call it. Boop. Oh, usually I get some auto-completing goodness. There we go. I was like, it's gone. It's gone forever. Um, with a class of. Uh, filters, wrapper, and 
then we need to close our div here and tab that over. And now we're going to go ahead and find our, our CSS file, which is so handy. And like you were saying, we only have position relative, but one of the things that I would do is um, I think again, based on need, a lot of the styles were placed inside of styles.css. So one of the first things that I would do is I would start to choose some of these styles that aren't actually global styles and move them over into our employees list component. But as you build out new things, of course, like your filters wrapper, um, wrapper, and then we're going to say um, display flex, please. Uh, and I would also recommend, um, as you have the time, to go ahead and move things like uh, these inline styles. Um, just move them over into the style sheet. It not only cleans up your markup, but it also can make it, you might notice, hey, we're using display flex with flex direction column uh, often on divs. Maybe we need to create a class and go ahead and use that uh, throughout our components. And so definitely things to work on. I'm going to go ahead and come back here. So now that it's display flex, these are side by side. We're like, yay, we're getting there. However, you'll notice that our employee list is floating in in space floating above the thing where it should be. And so if we go ahead and look in our styles.css file, we have position absolute and position float that are being given to our header textile. Um, but if we take both of those off, and I think actually we might wanna bump up our bottom margin, um, then we can go ahead and leave it inside the flow of the docs, um, inside the flow of the DOM, excuse me, uh, while also um, still having the look that we want to go for. So we're going to go ahead and I think open up our uh, styles, uh, CSS. I think I'm in the wrong one. I think there's a capital styles and a lowercase styles. That's also something to be fixed. Yeah, that's confusing <laughs> right there. Huh? Yeah, it is. I think, um, the lowercase is definitely what is generated by default and what you should stick with with Angular. So I think my first step um, in this app IRL would be deleting capital styles.css, moving everything over to our styles, our smaller global one, and then actually cleaning up. Um, but then at this point, I think it was called header text style. So I would find header text style. I'm gonna go ahead and just comment these out and maybe double, triple, whatever you will on our margin bottom. Um, so we should have those styles that we want persist and then we could even continue. I don't know if 10 was probably not enough question mark. Yeah, a little bit more. Um, and then, you know, I just keep chugging, chugging down this road of we've got these two things inside of our flex container. Um, but we probably could give them a little bit more space and I would bring in, um, I don't know if like this is a Kendo UI input. And so I would definitely want to swap that out. Um, I think it's just a regular one, question mark. Yeah, looking at it, style equals. So um, I'd swap them out for Kendo UI labels and inputs. Um, that would give us a bit of more cleaner default styles. But yeah, I think we might be ready. Let me double check, D -d double check. Uh, I think we might be ready to do our wrap up. Sorry, I didn't have a ton of time there to dive in. But just really as, you know, as with anything, uh, the migration might be a little painful um, on the tail end because you have things to clean up. You've got conventions to follow. You're no longer in Silverlight, right? So things things will change, but it's definitely well worth it um, in the long run. So I think we're ready to welcome Sam onto the stage. Uh, hello, hello. Hi, Sam. Hi, Sam. Hello. <laughs> oh, hello. my goodness. How are you, darling? <laughs> I've been better. I had a super crappy lunch, whatever I could grab. <laughs> <laughs> what do you have? What do you have? I'm super curious. Okay, so you know what egg, <laughs> egg salad is? Like it's just um, yeah, delicious. Mm, it depends. I can make it uh, kind of lighten up a little bit with some like hot sauce, but it's essentially egg yolk, mayo, and just a bunch of stuff. So 
we always, always have that lying around because we have a four and a half year old. So when oh. nothing else is available, you just take two pieces of bread and you just slap it on. That's your lunch. No, I love this. And I actually haven't, I've got a one year old at home. I haven't tried egg salad with him yet. So I'm, I'm going to try that tonight and see if it's a hit. Yeah. Just like, uh, <laughs> like the, the white stuff, just cut it up in smaller pieces and it should be good to go. It's, it's all fairly soft. Oh my goodness. So welcome. Right. Welcome. We, I, I think covered, covered our angular migration pretty well. John, was there anything you wanted to add? I know I was talking a bunch. No, you look, it all looked great. I think um, uh, you hit on some of the things that uh, are key points. You know, the, uh, I'd love to do a session with you where we actually add that, uh, that filter and get it working. That would be mm. kind of a fun, a fun stream to do. Maybe <laughs> yeah. Um, the beauty of it is a lot of it's just, you go and you find the code, you cut it, you paste it, and then you just modify it a little bit and largely it just works. Right. So um, it's just knowing kind of sometimes where to look. Mm. So Luis Diego, you're on there. We need more organization. <laughs> I love having my developers pinned to this chat channel. I yell at them on TV. And uh, Mr. Spoof, you're right. A uh, chicken salad beats egg salad anytime. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was, I, I was like, pr I prefer salad. I, I was ignoring the emote. Yeah, Thanks the chicken, for <laughs> the chicken is important. <laughs> Oh, did you see Yum Yum also said good point on cleanup changes in coding conventions should not be overlooked. So, yeah. but uh, also, again, I do not envy the developers uh, who have to create these automation tools because it sounds like not only like where are you coming from, but where are you going and what conventions do you need? It, it sounds um, intense. <laughs> yeah, yeah okay. the, the intention is to save time, not eliminate time. So, um, you know, right, but, but, right. but it's it's arguably a little more fun, a little easier to do what you were just working on than to get down in the bowels of C-sharp code and try and figure out business logic. So, yeah, yeah, that's why I'm a, uh, yeah, I'm a front end developer, John. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so, so listen, I got to ask something. Oh, yeah. Can I, can I do a five minute detour before we wrap up? You know, I'm all about detours. All right, because I hate uh, failing demos, and I tried a bunch of different things. Ah, you got it! Did you figure it out? Because we did, were talking about that. It was, I was so wondering what... ridiculous. It was just like <laughs> one question mark that was missing in my NuGet config file. That Please did show, not us. Make it show up. Okay, so I'm going to try the risky thing of sharing my screen and see how that goes. All right. All right, let me know when you see my screen. I see yeah, it. Should. Okay, perfect. Oh, do you want to do that? That's just like a matrix sticking you inside with Inception. Okay, but if you see my browser, uh, this is what we're up to. So this is the thing I was trying to show off. So we looked at Silverlight and we looked at controls, uh, UI controls that you can, for the most part, find one-on-one -on -one correspondence to uh, other UI, be it in Xamarin Forms, be it in uh, in WPF, be it in UWP, Uno platform, it's it's all there. It's uh, it's for you to take and then try to modify and see where you can get the closest possible match. Now, if you were doing something something custom, and just to kind of give you a flavor of uh, what Blazor life could look like, because I, I feel bad because I cannot fail on Blazor demos with Ed being around. <laughs> So uh, I'm picking just two very simple custom controls and see if I can port it over. So I'm looking at uh, our Telerik UI for Silverlight tool. And if I click on these demos, it doesn't work in Chrome unless you have um, this particular plugin, which is called IE tab, which we talked about. So I'm going to go in here and uh, just talk about two very basic things. So we have an autocomplete box, which I think uh, spurned the whole conversation about favorite movies. And I stick to it. The Matrix still wins. <laughs> uh, so it's just a drop down, right, of all the things. And then um, so I really don't know how you can ignore all of the Lord of the Rings and all of the Hobbit, but actually, oh, right. Lord of the Rings <laughs> is really, really good. So <laughs> we're going to look at just one line of code in here and see how close that is. And we'll probably look at one more like UI component. So that is the uh, rad autocomplete box that's lighting up the suggestion box. And if you had to take this application, uh, considering that you have all other services and all other aspects of this moved off and you're just wanting to move the UI, what can you do in Blazor? 
So this is uh, Blazor land. So um, again, Microsoft has docs. And if you were to find a corresponding autocomplete uh, drop down thing, we have one in our artillery QI for Blazor. So Ed and all the team uh, out there for Blazor, they have put together docs. And the thing that I was failing on was to get the NuGet package in. So we have uh, a project where this is just a simple Hello World Blazor app. It doesn't have anything else. It's just the .NET new Blazor Wasm. And then I have a package reference here that says, go get me Telerik UI for Blazor. And the thing I was trying to do was uh, to point it to our NuGet source. And I was trying not to show this file because, because of the way .NET command line tools work and the NuGet package references work, this password is meant to be encrypted. Like it's meant to be a hash of your actual password, but it just does not work all the time reliably. So you end up having to just type in this password uh, for whatever Telerik account that you may have. And that's all I needed. And the thing that I was missing was a question mark. Can you believe it? Like this little question mark up on the top was why NuGet package restore was failing. So I put that back and that is my NuGet file with the exception of that password. Um, Alyssa, can you still see my screen? Are we good? Yeah. Okay. We see, yeah, you're we great. see okay. your password, Sam. It's all access. Yes, yes, that is my password. Uh, other than one, two, three, four, Sound, five, yeah. Sounds legit. <laughs> so that's the NuGet file I have. So with that in place, I can go into the folder um, and uh, let's see, where am I looking at? Okay, so I'm actually inside the project where I have, uh, oh, let me bump this up a little bit. There you go. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, okay, so now if I look at, uh, the, this is the project that Blazor gives you and now I can do a .NET restore. So now we are asking the .NET CLI to go get the bits from NuGet, which is our NuGet, and restore the packages. So hopefully this works and it says, yep, yeah, I'm good. And at this point, I can do a .NET run, which means uh, bootstrap the app, start it up, and let me have access to it. So it says I'm up, and I'm up at localhost 5000. So uh, before I go look at that, here's the code that we're looking at. So we have that one package reference, and then in our index HTML, which is kind of like a default uh, in, in our www root, we throw in this file to say, here's where all of the global stuff belongs. So all that we're doing is putting in one CSS and one JavaScript file. So with that, I can do like an import. So I'm pulling in um, Tidaric Blazor components if I wanted to. And in here is my um, index.blazor page, which is just a sample page here. And this comes with some boilerplate stuff, but I added just two things to it. Uh, so let's go look at this in our uh, browser, localhost 5000. So this is a Blazor application. This is completely WebAssembly, uh, completely WASM, nothing server-side going on. This is working purely C-sharp in the browser, just like JavaScript. It's, it's just like two brothers who, who now belong in the browser together. So this is the traditional uh, Blazor uh, template that you get, but on top of the index page, I've just added a couple of things. First up, this is just a button, which again, I mean, our buttons are a little more like functional. They have more features. So uh, adding a button is as simple as just adding a generic button. Now, if you had a button like this in Silverlight, it will look like this almost looks like XAML at this point, right? It's, it's very, very similar. It's it's HTML, but the markup, the razor markup it almost always comes like, back to XAML. Yes, it all comes back. <laughs> XAML is beautiful. You cannot escape XAML. Yes. Now take a look at this one here. This is the other user input, and this is uh, straight out of our docs. So enter the role in which uh, you work, and in here is this suggestions list, which is just like hard coded right now to all of the different uh, roles you might have in the software industry. Obviously, this list could include just the matrix because that's the only thing you want. But uh, when I come down here for user input um, for the type of role you have. And as I start typing, you see that list come up, right? This is Blazor again, uh, but it is client-side Blazor. And take a look at uh, this code. It's just one line, Telerik autocomplete instead of data binding, instead of item source, we just say data and then add suggestions. And compare this to what we had, uh, for example, in here. It's just a little more verbose, but we're doing the same exact thing. We are choosing selection mode. We are choosing uh, the search mode. We are choosing a watermark if we wanted to. And then we're choosing the item source, which is the binding. And then let's take a look at uh, one more uh, control here, uh, just for kicks. This is a server -like control. Let's do um, a date time picker because every app needs a date time picker. So this one is Silverlight and it just does what it's meant to do. It lets you pick the date and it lets you pick the time. And if you look at the code here again, 
Uh, it has a bunch of like uh, styling things if you wanted to, like storyboards and styles. But at the end of the day, it comes down to just one line of code. And if I can find it uh, somewhere here, am I scrolling past it? Yeah, let's see. No, I did scroll past it. Let's look for a date time. Yeah, right there. So this is a generic rad uh, date time picker. So when you copy this piece of code out of Silverlight and you just drop it in Blazor, it's going to complain that I don't know what generic is. That's fine. That's the namespace. You take it out, and then it's going to say I don't know what the rad date time picker is. So you take it out and you replace it with just a date time picker. And so this one is just called the Telerik date time picker. And notice how like simple and easy these things are. It has a min and a max, so you can choose what date ranges you want to let the user pick. And you choose like a bind value, which is the select time. So all of this adds up being uh, on this one here. So when I uh, it starts out being with the like present date and time, and when I click on it, this is the exact same experience that you expect in a, in a Kendo UI app, in an Angular app. It's just a calendar, and then you can pick the time, right? So what I'm trying to say is it is easy uh, to see the differences. Like if you start with um, a Silverlight UI control, be it your own custom control or be it from somebody else, you bring it over to whichever platform it is and you try to see where it breaks. I, I know it sounds funny, but that's kind of how most migrations go. You see what breaks and then you try to fix it, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, so this is I feel like that's how all things yeah, go for pretty me. Much. Like even if I'm creating something completely new, you like throw something on, did it break? Okay, we're going to yeah, keep going yeah. then. <laughs> so this is like very very easy. Like even like coming from a XAML background that I have, this looks very familiar even though it's web. Like I have my list of things uh, which could come from a data source. I have properties that I can bind to. So this is Blazor and this is how if you are careful in how you want to structure your app and if you absolutely have to be on the web uh, in a browser and you want to be cutting edge then this is your way out to bring controls over um, most controls uh, you would find a one-on-one -on -one correspondence whichever platform that you're on and you have to clean up the namespaces clean up the properties and make sure you can build and yeah, off you go so i didn't want to fail um ed by uh, not showing a blazer demo so here it is uh, <laughs> it's simple it's a little bit of manual work, but it, it's very doable. All right, that so looks awesome. Yeah, let's switch over to our uh, faces, or maybe, uh, maybe Alyssa, do you want to uh, uh, stay with this uh, uh, with the flow one more time? Oh yeah. Yeah. So let's the uh, flow chart. The flow. The flow. So let's recap where we started. So I think in the morning you had uh, Laurent. Uh, Laurent. Uh, we should say his name right. Is, uh, I don't know actually his descent. Like he, he lives in Switzerland, but I think he is like part uh, German maybe. Mm. Uh, but uh, he has so much experience in, in, in Silverlight back in the and, days. He's written, and a killer hat. Yes. You should all listen to him. <laughs> yes. Oh, and, uh, if you really want to get, um, uh, if you want to get that feeling of completely missing out and not being geeky enough, you should <laughs> see what uh, Laura puts out. Like he has uh, drones that kind of fly with him while he is <laughs> on a bike, on a motorbike. What? Uh, yes, and he posts some amazing footage uh, on his like YouTube and other channels. So uh, yeah, definitely look that up. So Laurent kind of explained where things had started. Um, one of the keys with, uh, one of the traditions with Microsoft is if you have a really crappy internal code name for a project, it ends up being something cool that uh, we name it, like Silverlight. It used to be called something different. Uh, so uh, that's where we started. And uh, yeah, we are at a point where plugins just uh, are not scalable on the web, even though our browsers do a lot. It's just not scalable, not something you want to do. The security issues were real. Uh, so we want to get away from all of that and do pure, clean mm -hmm. HTML like the web. Can you was, like bump up your cool. chart a little bit? I think they zoom and enhance. Yeah. There you go. I can go <laughs> like this. Yeah, there you go. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> no, no, maybe I zoom in too much. But anyways, you get the point. Um, so we started with Xamarin Forms, uh, and that is a very all of these things like all of the yellows and the pinks that you see here these are very easy to bring over your xaml this is these are all platforms that talk xaml 
as their primary markup language uh, to, do, to build a visual tree. So you will have a very easy time just bringing over your Silverlight XAML and then just making it work on every other platform that you care about. Um, that includes desktop, mobile, and lots of web. If you are doing uh, some of this uh, web stuff, then like you said in your in your Angular demo and, and you see in the Blazor demo, it's a little bit of a rewrite, uh, but it's not much. It's, it's just choose where you want to be uh, with the framework, with the platform that you want to support. And uh, yeah, that's how we move forward. So uh, let, let's switch to our, uh, our cameras, uh, Alyssa. And cool, let's, cool. let's talk. Oh, yes. And we also, let us not forget, have a prize to give away at the end of the show. Um, I think we're giving away some Bose headphones. So if you have not yet filled out the survey, make sure that you do. I uh, will make sure it shows up in the chat right now. So, yes, please fill it out. <laughs> so, John, uh, let me ask you, like, you've been in this space. Um, are you, like, as Silverlight ends, um, like, end of support, like, are you dreading these days or are you looking forward to the opportunities? Well, you know, for us, the good news is, is that, um, you know, we are the dumpster dumpers of the technology world. So when Microsoft gets ready to dump the tech, not dump a technology in the dumpster, we're ready to sit there and clean up all the goodies. Um, it's interesting that I I never paid that much to Silverlight as a development tool when it came out. It was it was after my time at Microsoft, and so you know I really wasn't focused on like following everything that was going on. Um, but apparently, a number of people adopted for for fairly complicated application problems, right? Um, and so, you know, what what we've kind of seen when one of the things I love about working here is I get to talk to real customers about real, you know, what it, what they actually do in the real world, right? So it's as opposed to theoretical. Um, and so we kind of see there's a group of people that always want to be on the latest and greatest. Okay, so you know, whatever the JavaScript framework of the week is, suddenly that's our new standard, right? And then next week, oh, that one's over. Now we're going to go to this new thing. And you know, the same thing with Microsoft stuff. It's like whatever Microsoft comes out with, they're like, oh yeah, we're going to jump over. And then of course, what does Microsoft do? Over and over and over again, they drop it. Okay. Um, in, in, and, I mean, in and, fairness, it's not just Microsoft. They're like, I mean, all other yeah, big yeah, tech jobs like Google. I mean, we all have a history of moving on from tech because it just do, doesn't. Do scale. we have time for a very short story? Sure. Um, oh yes. Okay. So when I was in the tools, <laughs> when I worked in the C plus plus group. We had this big meeting of the entire systems division. They brought us all in this huge room at Microsoft, and these people put on this presentation. They go like, "Look, we are um, we we conducted a survey for Microsoft to talk to all their customers and find out how happy they were with Microsoft, right?" And so, we, you know, we're presenting to the applications people. But today, we're presenting all the results. Of, so it was network, it was OS, it was Dev Tools, it was all the system stuff, right? And they basically said, uh, when it came to developers they hated us more than they could say. And these consultants said like, we've been doing this for 30 years. We've never seen customers hate a vendor as much as they hate you, okay? And so we all went, oh! So we had a big meeting and Balmer beat us up. And it's like, oh, we're gonna fix this and next year we're gonna do great. So next year we get in the same room and the same consultants come up for the repeat survey and they go like, it got worse. <laughs> they hate you even more. And the only reason they use you is because they can't find anything that they consider a reasonable alternative. <laughs> or they would jump ship in a second. And part of the reason was because um, we had, what was it, application template library, we had MFC, we had Windows Forms, we had Visual Basic. I mean, you think of all the technologies that we had that we went out and said, oh, this is it, baby, jump on this ship. And then we like pulled the scuttle out of the ship and go blah, blah, down. It goes to the bottom of the ocean. And everybody's swimming around looking for the next ship. And then we roll it out and go like, oh, get on this one. This one, this is really the one you want right here, right? Um, so I, I kind of see Silverlight in the same, in the same you know, world. It's like we had customers that were leading edge that jumped on it. And then we've got a whole lot of customers that like, you know, we're still using stuff from 20 years ago because it works. And we can't really see any reason to like redo it. And, and what happens is the developers that know that technology, they are all in nursing homes. I mean, they're, they're, they're older than I am, right? And so <laughs> suddenly they're like, 
where are we going to find people to work on this stuff? I guess we have to bring it into the modern era. And so they're like dragging, kicking and screaming into the next thing. And there's probably a middle ground that makes a lot more sense, right? So, yeah, and I think that's like, kind of how I look at Silver Lake. Yeah, I think that's the reality, I think, for lots of enterprises. Like when we go to Microsoft forward facing events or even like community driven like tech conferences, and we look at all this like cool stuff that's coming out, and then you talk to developers who are actually building full sized enterprise solutions, they're like, we can't do this stuff. It's too far ahead. We need the reliability, we need the tools and the ecosystem to be mature before an enterprise can jump on. So yes, you're right. I mean, uh, a lot of what we are seeing Silverlight that's still around is just because the ROI has been hard to show for folks to migrate and now is the time. So yes, it might be a little painful and yes, uh, I mean, tools might help, but at some point uh, you, you have to cross the bridge. Yep, yep, you absolutely do. It's weird to think of all the code that's out there running on 360 Assembler today, right, or COBOL. Right. And of course, in the PC world, we still see very large Visual Basic 6 applications. God help us. We see stuff written in Access. Right. You know, it started out some dude, and it's always a dude, some dude wrote it, you know, 20 years ago. And it's like, oh, this will be fun. I'll do this and it'll save me some time. And then somebody saw it and go, like, oh, can you add this? And then they go, you add this. And pretty soon it's running a whole department. Right. And it's just a steaming pile of horse patooey, but, but it works and people need it. It isn't super valuable but it has value okay and then at some point somebody goes like oh my god this is a huge security vulnerability this thing's running on an xp box on that dude's desk right it's connected to our corp net and you know pull the, pull the cable quick you know uh, one of these days we can like sit down with a, a few drinks and just like share stories of all the horror right. things that we see yeah. Oh, yeah. I won't name uh, the city, but like a major, major city in, in Ohio uh, has their entire, uh, like the transportation department uh, has their entire payroll running off an access and an Excel <laughs> solution. And I mean, th this is not a like a one-off thing. This is the reality. Uh, so we just need to be patient with, uh, with enterprises. We just need to be taking our time to move things forward. And eventually, like for lots of enterprises who don't want to touch apps that are not causing them pain, they're just running in a box in a server. For a lot of them, it's the, the wake up call is when you cannot find folks who want to work on that, right? And uh, that's when you need to migrate. And like for, uh, we, we saw this with Windows 7, like end of support, there are still lots of enterprises running that, but uh, everybody is aware that there are no security fixes coming. So this is gonna happen with, uh, with, uh, with Silverlight as well. Once um, you have end of support, you have literally nothing you're on your own. So this is the time to think about it. You got 13 months to go. Uh, this is the time, time to kind of uh, restructure and architect your apps right if you haven't already done so. Have that separation of concern. This is not just for Silverlight. This is true for any mobile, any desktop, any web app you build. You have to have things nicely uh, uh, kind of split out so you can test things uh, on their own. And then the UI layer is not so hard to swap out. Yeah, I, I, one of the things that I think about is the fact that if you think about a factory that has old machinery, you know, the CEO is walking through the factory, they can see this really, really old, maybe it's painted green, you know, with, you know, pebbly paint and stuff like that. And they know it's old, right? Or they see their trucks and they know, you know, the truck's old and it's smoky and it's filthy and it's broken down all the time. Software is just hidden. I mean, the developers see it, maybe the IT people see it. But management, you know, to them, it's just like, it's this thing. And it's so hard to convince them, no, this is like an old broken down piece of machinery. And set aside the fact that it's old and creaky, if we replace this with something new, regardless of how we get there, we can get all these things like DevOps and CICD and, and app monitoring and like real-time data collection with customers. I mean, you can get all these advantages that you cannot get with some of these older patterns, some of these older architectures, right? Like a Windows desktop app is a beautiful thing for one user on one computer, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's, right? <laughs> that, that's the reality, yes. And uh, speaking of uh, things that are not always the shiniest, um, yeah, we, we got a question about uh, reporting. And, and this is uh, interesting because like you 
you don't always see like the shiniest thing being reporting, but that's what enterprises need uh, to keep the clog, like the cogs going. Like that's what your C-level folks need. That's what your users need. Um, so um, um, you take that back. It's perfectly shiny. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, uh, it, it can be based on what you're using. Um, so yes, um, to answer your question, be uh, we will have a, a dedicated webinar, actually. We are planning, I think it's the end of August. Um, so we'll talk about reporting a lot more. And I think we, we're going to skimp over it because it's uh, we want to show the latest and greatest with like web, desktop, and mobile. But this is so such a core part of businesses. So we will dedicate more time to talk about reporting and like Tiller reporting in particular. So thank you for that. All right, so we had a whole day. Alyssa, what were your thoughts? Like, I think I completely pulled you into a rabbit hole uh, spiral with You Zamo. mean amazed me with how many <laughs> you were like, hey, you're going to do one migration? I'm going to do 12. So. Well, I mean, <laughs> that was pretty impressive, Sam. I got to admit that you pulled yeah, all those off. Yeah, I mean, essentially, what, what I like is just just the portability. I mean, we essentially just took one like Hello World app uh, with one list view that pulled down data from a web source, and the same code runs on iOS, Android, Mac, uh, WPF, web, as Wasm. And I like that because, like, as a developer, I mean, yes, I mean, this is like a shiny demo. The reality, maybe you have to make sure you go over a bunch of roadblocks to make sure things are working fine in every environment. But the possibility is there. It, the tech is there uh, to start using. Yes, like cross-platform is finally real after all these years. You know? <laughs> right. we've, been, we've been promised and promised, but now it's like it's actually it's, it's working. Yeah. Like you know, when um, like again, folks who are jaded, like uh, maybe you and me, John here, uh, Alyssa thinks like Angular JS is legacy. So we'll give her. Uh, I, know, I know. I know. I know. I know. You joke, but for real, whenever, <laughs> whenever you say legacy, like that's as far back as legacy goes for me. So <laughs> I, it's it's great that you can explain a little bit and give some context because. I didn't know those kind of applications existed. <laughs> You've heard about them, right? You've heard of them. Uh, yes, from uh, today on the stream. <laughs> <laughs> so folks who are jaded, uh, whenever we look at something that uh, somebody brings out a shiny box and says, write once and run it everywhere, mm. we hear that and we're like, oh, write once and you kind of suck everywhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? But yeah. It, it doesn't need to be so bad. Like it, it is, may not be so painless, but if you do your due diligence and if you know exactly the strengths mm -hmm. of each platform that your code runs on, maybe slowly, it's going to take time, but bite-sized pieces and you can start having your applications light up in more and more platforms. And I think that's kind of what we're looking for in 2020. Although like this is the year we all want to forget. But we are looking for cross-platform reach. Did you see how fast he recalled the year just there? I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, we, we want to skip over this year in history but <laughs> as quickly as we can. Well, what, what, what do you think is different, Sam? Because I would guess that part of it is open source.net. Okay, I, not just .net, but definitely open source.net's been a big difference. Just in time. So just in time compile, right? So you're not having a runtime layer because when you think about how slow those things were. And then basically all the hardware is like extra fast now. It's unnecessarily powerful unless you're doing something super cutting edge like, you know, high end gaming or Sims or modeling or stuff. Right. So you're old enough and I'm old enough. Well, this is not. But you remember when the hardware was always trying to catch up to the software. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. and you always had, the reason you bought a new laptop or a new PC was because it wasn't that you got tired of it. It's that you couldn't run the current software. That was actually news to me earlier today when they were talking about Flash and yeah. plugins wouldn't actually run on the first iPhone because like it couldn't handle it. Right. And I was like, oh, wait, what? Like, exactly. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's amazing. Exactly. So, yeah, and, we've come and, a long me, way. me dissing on the original Mac, the problem was it was just too limited. It was this great idea, but the hardware just couldn't, you, you couldn't do anything on it. You had an eight inch screen. And you had this tiny little bit of memory, you know, and you had a floppy disk with your only storage. And so, you know, people did things on it, but they suffered mightily mm -hmm. to, to do things on it. We have, we have come a long, long yeah. way. We, okay, we have to do our prize giveaway before yes, yes, our that. time wraps yeah, up. Yes. Um, so are you all, are you all ready? We're going to... Drum roll! And the winner is at Larry 
I think it's Liu. Liu. Larry Liu. Larry Liu. Not, not Mr. Smoothie. Sorry, Mr. Smoothie. I'm sorry, Smoothie. I picked yeah, a random it number. Happen. It was I actually had Google pick a random number, and the number was 27. Well, what kind and of headphones is, are they? Are they like these? Are they the Quiet Comfort? These are really yeah, sweet. Yeah, oh yeah, they those are. are those are a nice ride right there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, and we, we all have our tech toys, but I cannot live without my Bose headphones. The, the noise cancellation is really, really good. Yeah. So Love congratulations, Leo. Yeah. Well, so gentlemen, closing remarks. I mean, definitely reach out to Mobilize if you are in need of a silver light migration, no matter which path you're going to take. Any um, migration. We'll do anything. Even my colleague who keeps trying to do COBOL, which we do not do, but it won't stop <laughs> who's telling it. Oh, boy. COBOL. Yes, I did some COBOL. It was, it was fun while it lasted. I mean, you, you'd be surprised, like, how many healthcare systems, um, some core systems still run on mainframes. Oh, yeah. yeah. And banking. Definitely banking. Yeah, yeah banking as well. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I mean, what I will say is like this year has been like we, we tend to joke about it, but it, this these are really hard times for everybody, like especially kids, uh, families with kids or um, elders that you're taking care of. So be kind to yourself, be gentle. Uh, let's take our, take our time. So I think most employers are trying to be as sensitive as they can. So, uh, yeah, let's uh, be easy on ourselves. And when it comes to Silverlight migration, like, this is the first time we actually took this on um, head first, right? But this is not going to be the last. We will, uh, throughout this year, and I'm sure going into next year, we will do many more streams. We'll do many more uh, migrations of like individual apps that we do kind of do end to end. So yeah, keep an eye out. And if you are one of those people who is maintaining those apps, and again, keep in mind, this is not like end of support does not mean end of life. Your several apps are going to be fine, but you should really think about migration. So if you are uh, using Silverlight, I mean, there, there are still uh, controls that can light up and make your apps better. And I mean, we will keep on shipping Silverlight and maintaining Silverlight, but you really should think about migration. So you have, as we have talked throughout the day, you have lots and lots of choice. And that's not a bad thing because you get to choose what stack you want and you can mix and match. Uh, and depending on what platforms you want to run on, desktop, web, mobile, IoT, uh, uh, wearables, you get to mix and match and choose what works for you and your team. Yeah. Well, I'll just wrap up by saying I agree with what Sam said, which is, you know, be kind to yourself and be kind to other people. Everybody's on edge. It's a hard time we're going through. I know no one's gone, no one alive has gone through anything really like this, almost no one. And so it's, we'll, but we'll all get through it. Okay. Yeah. We'll get through it and we'll be a better people and a better human race for it at the end. And in terms of Silverlight, yeah, um, you do have a lot of choices. I really appreciate Sam literally demonstrating, you know, how to get this thing to this and to that and to the other thing, really breaking it down, you know. And, and we have some help for some some people on a particular scenario, and we're glad to talk to you about it. Melissa and Sam, thanks so much for including us and for inviting us. Yeah, really appreciate yeah. it. And thank you to our viewers for sticking with us for the day long stream of quarantine coding. We love you all. And we hope you all have a fantastic day, night, wherever you are. And a um, huge shout out to the folks uh, who are behind the scenes and helping us throughout the day. So that's yes. uh, Didi Walsh, our beloved Didi Walsh, and mm. Sarah Pats and Ivana. These are all uh, folks we work with and we and love Ms. them. Rose is on there too for a birthday. So mwah. Yes. <laughs> happy birthday. And uh, yeah, all of you take care and we shall see you on the next stream. All right, cool. Bye. Bye. Bye.